Good afternoon, members of Parliament. Good afternoon to the Honorable Minister with us today, the Minister of ECYS, Minister Samuel. Good afternoon to the viewing public. We are back for the Central Committee handling of the National Budget 2023. We've uh, started today with the presentations, or the answers rather, from the Minister of ECYS from questions posed earlier in the Central Committee meeting, which the Minister was approximately halfway through. We will allow the Minister to continue with the answering of the questions, after which we will once again open the floor to the Central Committee for any further clarifications and questions. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome again to the honorable members of parliament and all who are following this meeting today. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think I was at the, quest the following question, and that had to do with capital expenditure, the digital fleet tracking system, how far is the implementation of this project? I believe the answer here today, the tender process for the digital fleet tracking system began in January 2022. The bidding was completed in September 2022 and the contractor was selected based on the results of the evaluation by the evaluation committee. Currently, the agreement is being negotiated between government and the contractor, and once the decision-making is concluded, the preparation phase will continue, which involves the delivery and installation of the fleet tracking system and equipment, including training on how to use the software. The fleet tracking system is expected to be implemented and fully operational, as I stated before, in August 2023, prior to the commencement of the 2023 scholastic year. Capacity crisis in government, brain drain always within our small islands, also issue for persons coming back home. Work in government, then leave to go to private sector. Major decreases in personnel costs across multiple ministries. According to multi-year forecasts, there is an expectation of a 3% growth in personnel costs to meet demands of country packages. Question is assuming that forecast in, uh, in increased costs relates to revenue coming in. What is the plan of approach to attracting personnel? How will the cost increase per the elucidation in the budget? This should be asked to all ministries, so that's why it is asked here. Why is the forecast an increase over the next three years? Mr. Chairman? Capacity challenges, capacity challenges are also a reality for our ministry, which is visible in the 30% that represents a total of 121 functions that were unfilled, and also about 10% of the 30% that is budgeted for, especially in the field, capacity challenges are also uh, a reality for our ministry. This is visible in the 30% that represent a total of 121 functions that were unfilled and only about 10% of the 30% that is budgeted for. Especially in the field of legal capacity and the occupancy of the division inspection and the division 
education innovation, besides some relief from the funding of capacity through the trust fund and pending capacity requests for the implementation of the country packages, the ministry foresees the need for restructuring and more efficiency in education of task, execution of tasks. Also, the implementation of an ICT-based ministry management and information system is expected to enhance efficiency as opposed to the current manual inputs by various departments and divisions. Then, Mr. Chairman, I come to the questions of Member of Parliament, Akim Arendel. There is a decrease for school materials for various public schools. Why only for Mary Genevieve the Weaver in Hope Estate on increase? Most teachers complaining that they have lack of materials. They have barely certain stuff in school. Mr. Chairman, the Mary Genevieve the Weaver School is the only public school with a Dutch and English stream. The Dutch stream continues to grow every year and now has a group six class. As this stream continues to grow, more material is required and DPE has to purchase new methods for the Dutch stream. And that is why you would see an increase at that school compared to the others. Then, Mr. Chairman, I come to the question of Member of Parliament Brown Bill. Subsidy for the library for one million NAF for each year of the years 2022 and 2023. Why no budget cut, even though the library downsized since Irma and COVID? What is the update on the demolition of the library? The St. Martin Library falls under the Foster Resilience Learning Program under the NRPB. As such, there is a specific timeline for the execution set to the World Bank safeguarding itinerary that includes timeline for demolition and rebuilding that goes through an extensive vetting process. This work is ongoing. Additionally, I can mention to the MP, maybe the reason you have not seen a reduction in the amount is because besides the, the facility, which is the head facility or the main facility in Phillipsburg, there are other satellites, I think one in Belvedere and one in the Cahill area that is extra. So those need to be funded also. Large amounts of subsidies to companies or foundations such as Youth Program, Belvedere Community Center, No Kidding With Our Kids, St. Martin Youth Council, St. Martin Early Childhood Development Association, The Voice of the Youth. Do these entities submit their financial statements and a list of proven activities per year to receive funding? These entities submit their financial report and social report per year according to the general subsidy ordinance. In 2022, SOA Bay provided the youth department of the Department of Youth with support in the further implementation of the subsidy framework specific to the needs and policy objectives of the department. This is based on the continuation from 2018, whereby SOA Bay supported the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports with the introduction of a subsidy framework to further promulgate the use of subsidy as a tool to achieve the policy goals of the ministry in a more transparent and accurate manner, accountable manner. Sports, NSI received 500,000. What activities are carried out for this amount of funding? The activities carried out for this amount are operational costs, salaries, office expenses, marketing, community programs, summer camps, credit core foundation community programs, senior program, district court maintenance, and investment in vehicle usage. M Mr. Chairman, I now come to the question of Member of Parliament, Heilaga Martin. What is the status of the national anthem? Parliament sent a report to the Minister of ECYS, reference the national anthem. Can we get feedback on that report? The status of on that report 
uh, what is the status on that report? Is there a deadline? Is it ongoing um, to be planned this year? What is the status? I would like to mention here, Mr. Chairman, that the answer to this question will be sent to Parliament. Okay, that is with the indulgence. What is the status of having English as a first language in schools? English is the language of instruction in the vast majority of St. Martin schools. Of the 16 primary schools, English is the language of instruction in 12 of the seven secondary schools, of, in 12. Of the secondary school, English is the language of instruction in all, except MPC, VSBO, Teka El Havo, and VBO. How many of the projects and activities have been completed or are ongoing that was funded under the NRPB Trust Fund? And can a list of all projects be provided to Parliament with a source of funding per project. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I have given, I have an overview of all the projects that are under the NRPB. They do not have the source, well, the source of funding is NRPB that remains the same. So all projects funded under the NRPB Trust Fund for the Ministry are ongoing. The trust fund is the single source of funding for all the ministry's trust fund projects. Under the emergency recovery project, which is the ERP-1, under public buildings, we have for all 19 schools, an assessment of damages and technical drawings for repairs have been finalized. For all five sports facilities and 14 school gyms, an assessment of damages and technical drawings for repairs have been finalized. A total of six of the 19 schools have been repaired. The school repair, repairs completed are the St. Joseph School, the Sister Regina School, Lionel O'Connor School, Milton Peters College, St. Dominic High, and Mac Comprehensive Secondary School. What the members of parliament should know is that the approach of the minister in regards to the repairs of the schools was that I chose those schools who were more damaged than the others. So the most damaged schools were now prepared, repaired, and while all of the, the repairs are important, I look at the school of Milton Peters College where the whole roof have been looked after and have been able to be delivered under this program. I can continue to say that I do find the, the process and the time of World Bank Trust Fund NRPB in having repairs done um, too lengthy. I will continue to say that. I said that from the beginning and I continue to say that this process is very lengthy. I don't know if this is a good process for us here in St. Martin. However, we are grateful for every repair that is done. Um, I think up to last week, or two weeks ago, the sewage system at the Lionel Connor School in Cool Bay was delivered up as completed. So you have the Mac Briler Millard campus, the Helmi Schneiders, uh, Christian Hillside, St. Martin Academy, PSVE, University of St. Martin, Sister Borgia Primary, Sundial High School, St. Martin Academy Ac Academic, Sister Magda Primary, Mac John A. Gums Campus, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, the St. Dominic Primary, National Institute for Professional Advancement, and Asha Stephen um, Christian Hillside, are estimated for March 2023 until February 2024. So these 13 remaining schools are planned uh, for repairs. For all 14 gyms, an assessment of damages and technical drawings for repairs have been finalized. The five main sports facilities and six district sports courts, 
on assessment of damage and technical drawings for repairs have been finalized. The ministry now awaits the allocation of funds from the NRPB for sports facilities and sport gyms to be repaired because those gyms on the inside of the schools are also very necessary. Under the Foster Resilience Learning Project, which is the FRLP, the following is included. One, the rebuilding, rebuilding inclusive schools. You have reconstruction of two schools, which is the Sister Mary Lawrence School and the Charles Leopold Bell School. Restoring the library services, we have the rebuilding of the St. Martin Library, and three, strengthening the management information system of the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, the development of the Ministry Management Information System, and support for the design and implementation of standardized learning outcome data, which I spoke about earlier today. As mentioned, all projects are ongoing, for the reconstruction of the schools and the library, the criteria for designs have been finalized and for the ministry management and information system, an outline of the anticipated system is in its finalization stage. For the four learning assessment, a pilot was executed and for the preparation of the early grade reading an early grade math assessment in all public and government subsidized schools for group three. The training was done and I have seen some of our well experienced um, educators, many of them, um, uh, I say on pension, taking part in this program. Under the project child development and protection and Child Development and Protection Project, the following is included. A SWOT analysis report with recommendations for St. Martin Early Childhood Association, St. Martin Youth Council Association, No Kidding With Our Kids After School Program, Belvedere Community Center, the voice of our youth foundation and the Department of Youth. Specifically, worth highlighting is the voice of our youth foundation who have indicated that after nine years of trying, they now can enjoy subsidy um, made available to them by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports to be able to carry out their work. Development of national child protection platforms in Martin the Youth Roundtable Conference, the Youth Parliament Panel Discussion, Theme, Finding Mental Balance in Active Youth Empowerment, Youth Leaders Exhibition. Um, concept Note, St. Martin Youth Participation Initiative. And then we had 58 professionals working with parents are uh, positive parenting facilitators. We have the outline of the National Positive Parenting Vision for St. Martin 2021-2025. We have Positive Parent Support Program Situational Analysis Report outlining a sustainable framework for positive parenting program. We have St. Martin Positive Parenting Support Program Action Plan inclusive of a training facilitator's manual handbook and a monitoring and evaluation framework and a meaningful youth participation combi plan. We have data management training workshop, policy brief violence prevention program, situation and casual analysis and report the development of a sustainable and equitable funding model for daycares and after school programs. Following question, how far are the ministries with the implementation of the country package and where and how is this reflected in the budget. The Ministry of ECYS is on track with the country package according to the agreements made with Terio and BZK. The Ministry is currently reviewing the final report of the education review 
on which the plan of action for the implementation agenda will be based. The comparative analysis of the interim report determined that nearly all recommendations are already on the agenda of the ministry and therefore have been included in the budget 2023 through the ongoing projects. After an initial review, we have found that the recommendation in the final report are mostly similar. The following question, how are the country packages SDGs, the individual mission and vision of each ministry combined and reflected in the budget and monitored? Are they all in line? Mr. Chairman, the policy-based budgeting system of the ministry is a dynamic instrument that supports the planning, budgeting, and monitoring of the long, mid, and short-term objectives of the ministry. All strategic objectives have been included in the development of this system and is being updated annually. Currently, the system is being upgraded with the support of SORB that includes the option to also monitor the performances of the ministry per topic, such as a national develop, development vision that includes sustainable development goals or the country packages or on the achieved agreements of the four kingdom countries platform and the progress of the various projects that are being implemented within the ministry. The alignment of the various national strategic objectives for the ministry has recently been confirmed in a comparative analysis of the interim report of the education review. The outcome of the comparison analysis made clear that the country package, the Ministry of ECYS budget, the National Development Vision 2020-2030 and beyond, the objectives for education program 2021-2024, the strategic plan of the Ministry of ECYS from 2016-2026 and the current work in progress are all in line. How are the policies linked to the expenditures and where is it reflected accurately? accurately? In the explanatory notes to the budget of 2023, Appendix 2, Beilach 3, each ministry policy plan for 2023 is detailed. Specifically, the section entitled Belates at Axis Policy Actions is an overview of the policy actions for the ministry and in this overview, the link with the budget is mentioned as well as the budgeted amount per policy action. In the case of the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, this overview can be found on the pages 55 and 56. How much were spent on court cases per ministry since 2022 to now? What did they entail? And please categorize them. Also list how many were lost, won, or ongoing. Mr. Chairman, I believe in the answers provided, we will see that in the division of or department of staff bureau, there was one court case. The amount spent was 1,664 guilders. It is ongoing. In the Department of Education, there was one court case, 15,566 guilders, 10 cent, that was one. In the Department of Culture, one court case, the amount of 400, 704 guilders, 88 cents, that is still ongoing. And in the Division Study Financing, there were two court cases. Um, the amount spent was 8,326, of which one case was won, and one case was reduced by the minister. Since 2014, the government has been in court with the Stichting Fortress at Onderwey, St. Martin, Bovenwense Eilander, SVOBE. In 2022, SVOBE's case filed before the court regarding the subsidy claims for the years 2014-2015, 2015-2016, 
2016-2017 and 2018-2019 was declared unfounded. The Ministry of ECYS paid 15,566 guilders and 10 cents for legal advice in 2022 regarding this case. The following question, how much was actually spent on travel per ministry for 2022 and 2023 and projected for 2023? I would like each ministry to provide a breakdown of travel and what they yield from every time they travel and what was justified for the travel. Mr. Chairman, um, the amount and the travels are here. I believe the total overview of the reports are not here. They can be sent, right? So I can indicate that in the department or division uh, regarding the minister, the amount spent of 40,405.72. Um, in 2022 and in 2023, 6,666. For staff bureau, 14,402 in 2022 and in 2023, 8,343. In the Department of Education, 8,912. And for 2023, 9,135. For the Department of Culture, we had for 2022, 11,395, and for 2023, 7,862, and for the Department of Sport, 4,170, and no travel in 2023. For the division exams, we had no travel in 2022, and in 2023, 9,341. For student support services division, we only have travel in 2023 for 6,009 gillers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the following question. How many consultants are working in each cabinet? I would like to know the total budget per cabinet allocated for consultants. I want to know how much was spent in 2022 and now in the year upcoming. There were no consultants working in the, budget, in the cabinet of ECYS and there are none. How many ministries are missing SGs and how long have they been vacant? The Ministry of Education, Culture and Transport has one acting Secretary General for three and a half years. Then we come to the questions of Member of Parliament, Melissa Gomes. Mr. Chairman, the question, how much has already been spent on the rebuilding of Prince William Alexander School, Prince Poise Campus? Approximately 2,400,000 has being spent, does the 1.550, 1,550,000 include the cost of relocating students and equipment? I don't believe so. The cost is only for the completion of phase one of the project, which is the delivery of eight classrooms. How is this going to affect the progress towards establishing official special needs schools, seeing that the Dr. Alma Fleming Center will be vacated by POAS. The ministry, even though we have been discussing this over and over, is yet to finalize the discussions regarding the specific use of the Dr. Alma Fleming Care Center as we are still finalizing the special needs policy which will give a clear vision of the way forward. There is 500,000 guilders budgeted um, for development of athletes. This could be better fleshed out. Please note that the figures mentioned in Bailaga Trade to Lichting Book as it pertains to the Ministry of Education, Culture and Sports are not in line with the data concept begrotings the book 2023, I think. The budgeted amounts in the Getalem book are correct and the amounts in the Tulichting book have to be adjusted to reflect the correct amount. Consequently, this amount mentioned by MP Gums could be incorrect. The amount budgeted for the development of national teams is 200,000 MP. Um, following question, for example, what is the focus of this 
development trajectory. The funds are used to subsidize organizations with their development of their national teams. The following question, what sports will these athletes be developed in? For example, will the focus be on basketball, baseball, netball, or those three mixed martial arts or others? No. There is no restriction on which sports can benefit from these funds, netball, basketball, football, track and field, swimming, baseball, softball, cricket, etc., have all benefited in the past. What role does NSI play in the revival of our national sport program? The role of NSI, as is the role of government, is to facilitate, and I repeat, is to facilitate the development of sports. The sports organizations are responsible for the development and execution of national sports program. Many sports, as previously mentioned, have benefited from government subsidies. One, one of the things, Mr. Chairman, that is good to mention here is that we, and I say we, St. Martin, our sports men and women, we love to play the sport. But next to the sport, which is so crucial to the sport, is the administration that has to go next to the sport. So I would like all sporting organization teams and everyone to understand that besides getting together and playing the sport, you have to make sure that your sporting club, your team, your association is well, well structured and that it is also that the statutes are in place, that you have a board, and that whenever something happens, you know that you are registered at the Chamber of Commerce. So that, and besides being registered at the Chamber of Commerce, it is also very important for all teams and sporting organizations to check to make sure that besides being registered by the Chamber of Commerce, that your information by the banks are also in order. So when an as association or club asks for subsidy and you have to bring the information, you would have all of this information ready that will help the process to go fast. So we notice that sports is on the move, and that is very good in St. Martin, but besides playing the sports, we need to strengthen the, the, the administration around the sports and we are then on our way to where we want to go. The, so the recent regional tournaments revealed the need to create a sustainable national team development plan. Does the budget 43489 with 325,000 guilders go towards this plan if there is one? The amount allocated to tournaments sums up to 185,000 guilders, and regional tournaments is currently at 62,500 guilders. As previously mentioned, the role of the government is to facilitate, is to facilitate as such as is financially possible to support organizations in their development to, of their national team development. Where in the budget is there an allocation for assessing educators and school management? There are educational reforms items such as evaluation of FBE, implementation of special needs, curriculum reform, and public education reform. But reforms without knowing a real life status or of educators, um, abilities and development is not realistic. Mr. Chairman, the answer. The responsibility for assessing educators in school management is one that rests with the school boards and the head of division public education. The budget associated with the management of school boards and the division public education is in their respective budget post. The supervision of the quality of education on behalf of the Minister of ECYS is done by the Division of Inspection of ECYS. Therefore, the budget of the Division of Inspection can be taken into account as well. 
Mr. Chairman, the following question. The Olympic Federation and NSI are responsible for facilitation of various associations that are responsible for the execution of sports on St. Martin. Is there any data available for yearly costs associated with providing support to individual association allocating 500,000 for the development of athletes without proper official leagues housed by federations and the relevant financial requirements seems ad hoc and counterproductive. I would like to answer to the Honorable Member of Parliament. The amount allocated to NSI in the amount of 500,000 is for the following purpose, and I think I mentioned this before, operational cost, salaries, office expenses, marketing, community programs, summer camps, credit core foundation, community program, senior program, district court maintenance, vehicle maintenance. So as mentioned in the highlights, the department subsidized individual and organizations in 2020 for the tune of 228,000. These funds spent towards travel, accommodation, transportation are either for the hosting of an event or the participation of our athletes. Regionally, internationally, as per our subsidy program of requirements policy on issuing subsidies. In 2023, 200,000 is allocated, allotted the development of national teams and 185,000 for tournaments and events. The following question, as mentioned in the presentation, one of the one of the 2022 achievements include the finalization of the national decree for study financing. What is the timeline for the implementation of this decree? Mr. Chairman, the draft national decree for study financing has been submitted to the Council of Ministers to be presented to the Council of Advice for review, after which another report would have to be drafted and submitted to legal affairs for review prior to sending it to the governor for ratification. It is expected that the process will be finalized. Mr. Chairman, I just want to, to, to say here, um, will be presented because I, I cannot really recall if it was already on the agenda. So the, it has been submitted to, to be presented to the Council um, of, of the Ministers. I cannot say it, it reached there yet. I know it's on its way. Is there an increase in the amount of funds awarded to recipients? If yes, is that reflected in the budget post in study financing which reflects the same amount as the actual spent in 2022? Mr. Chairman, the national decree containing general measures referenced in question eight contains an increase in the study financing amount. Considering the projected time frame for completion, it is anticipated that this change will impact the 2024 budget and not the 2023. Notwithstanding this change, notwithstanding this change is projected to be budget neutral as the new legislation will only be applicable to the new recipients. Following question, Minister in the budget post with digitalization of education projects and the investment in ICT in education, is there funding that would be provide support to the ministry to achieve these tasks? Are there adequate standing structures such as ethernet cable infrastructure, um, stable broadband and Wi-Fi access to handle the influx of this new technology. Mr. Chairman, the answer here given is that, um, you know, that we would like to give to the members of parliament is that the wired network infrastructure of the public schools is busy undergoing upgrades and that some of the schools already have fiber and there are one or two schools where there is no fiber cable. However, we have been informed that there is a new technology that can bring 
the level of the bandwidth up to date that we would need. Um, so the contact with Telem is there, and we are making sure that the rollout of this project goes as smooth as possible. To my understanding, PDP would be a program used to give supplemental training to teachers who already meet the qualifications. Are we hiring teachers who do not meet the minimum qualification, and if so, why? Does this put an extra financial strain on the country to continue to supplement the education of teachers who do not have these qualifications? Mr. Chairman, the following. The professional development program is an in-service training program for education professionals to be empowered through continued education to effectively deliver and facilitate the delivery of education. Through the vast majority of St. Martin's teachers, although the vast majority of St. Martin teachers are fully qualified, in order to ensure that all teachers are fully qualified, the program was launched with a focus on ensuring that teachers who are not fully qualified are provided with an opportunity to obtain the required certification. The PDP, however, also provides in-service training opportunities for qualified education professionals to upgrade themselves and maintain current in their fields. Following question, is there an initiative or budget post allocated to address the worldwide teacher shortage by encouraging more people to go into education and ensuring that teachers are making livable wages. Mr. Chairman, the teaching profession has been and continues to be a priority study for which study financing is granted. The teaching profession is a noble profession and we recognize that there is a need to further improve the position of teachers and education professionals. In connection with this, the ministry will be embarking on several initiatives over the next few years aimed at improving the attractiveness and the teaching of the teaching profession. In 2023, the Department of Education will be conducting research into improving the career line of education professionals through its operational budget. The research is to inform a review of the function book for education and the compensation of education professionals in 2024. The following question. Sports tourism is a market that St. Martin doesn't effectively benefit from due to the lack of proper facilities. The L.B. Scott Sport Auditorium is long overdue for an upgrade. What are the plans for modernization of the auditorium, seeing that this is the only viable location to host sporting events where a large audience can be presented? There have been discussions specifically pertaining to the sport auditorium regarding replacement of the flooring and so on. So once funds are available, this will be done as the auditorium is a shelter, the facility received a new roof, shutters, renovation of electrical wiring, as well as the plumbing. The location does not allow for expansion on that spot. So we will continue to maintain that facility for usage. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would also provide Parliament in later on at the beginning maybe of the public debate with a vision in regards to sports. Then I come to the questions of the Member of Parliament, Peterson. In light of some, in light of some clarity, not only for ourselves, but for the kids, I want to ask the Minister through you, Mr. Chairman, what is really going on at the pool at Rawal Village Complex? Is there something wrong with the water? Has the water been tested to see if it's actually safe for our children to swim? And if the answer is yes, 
there is indeed something wrong with the water. I want to know through you, Mr. Chairman, since when this has been the case, and if so, how long kids have been swimming in possible contaminated water before swimming cases worse. Classes were stopped as per the local report. Mr. Chairman, the swim program caters to over 500 kids on a weekly basis. That does not include the private organization, and that does not include the private organization that utilize the pool. On Monday, March 6th, one student complained to their teacher about challenges they were experiencing related to their attendance at the swim program at March 2nd. This was not brought to the attention of the facility management and government until March 8th, when a family member of the student was seen at the facility trying to get samples of the water without permission. Once it became clear that the situation was, um, was taking place, the program was postponed pending the results of a lab test. So the pool was closed. This was done immediately once it was brought to our attention as the precautionary measure, as a precautionary measure. The pool is regularly cleaned and tested, and we have not received any complaints from anyone else who has used the pool. We received the lab results on March 13, and we are in the process of analyzing them to determine the next course of action. What we can mention is that the results showed that no bacteria but high levels of chlorination, which is common in a public pool to prevent bacteria. The current pool maintenance practices are in line with recommendations and the facility managers will include in the maintenance plan moving forward the drainage of the pool more often and lab testing on a monthly basis um, as the testing previously done utilized personal tests on a weekly basis. So we will do more lab testing there. Moving forward, the pool will remain closed until March 20th as we will be draining the pool, I think that is maybe already done, to clean and refill it to start from scratch with the treatment of the water. We are looking forward to reopening the pool and personally as minister, I would like to, to say if any inconvenience or uncomfortableness was brought, I would like to say I am sorry about that because I do care about all the students and everything that is happening there at the pool. Um, so as soon as we heard that there might be an issue, we instead of doing the regular testing, we went over to doing the lab testing and in order to really make do a precautionary, we have drained the pool and will refill it with extra water. And in regards to the pool, I also know that there are plans on the table for a full Olympic swimming pool right next to that pool. I hope um, I will ask, I don't know if it's possible, that the pictures of those of the plan of the full Olympic pool can be shown here later on in Parliament during the debate. Then, Mr. Chairman, I have the questions of Member of Parliament Lutmila De Weaver. Largest investment in ICT for public schools, 766,000 in budget, no change from 2022 and 2023, yet reflects an achievement by a ministry ECYS. This means this has to be actually delivered, indeed an achievement, yet I cannot see which school received these TVs in real life. Please clarify. Um, Minister can clarify that the bidding took place and that the payments were made and that the devices have been ordered. 
I have heard that they were on their way. Um, I, I do not tell um, persons that the devices are at a certain location if I haven't seen it myself. So if the devices are in school, no, they're not yet in school. But as soon as I can see the devices, I will take a picture and indicate that they are here. This, this is not, or let me put it this way, this is a very, very necessary investment um, in public education for St. Martin. One of the members of parliament that I can say that have consistently, for every time we had a que um, questions about education, that have inquired about the, the digitalizing or the digital ability of education has been Minister, uh, Member of Parliament, Melissa Gomes. She has always asked, what are we doing to upgrade digitally in education? And as Minister, I can freely say that um, I will be happy to say to Parliament and to the members of Parliament when the devices are here, that they are here. Important for me is that the devices are delivered, that they are also put into the schools, that the necessary training uh, of teachers is there. And definitely, as I have explained to the team, um, the devices are OK to have. But if the speed and the bandwidth is not there, it is just as good as not having them. So we have also embarked on making sure that we have the necessary bandwidth to go with the devices. And um, some teachers have already indicated to be really happy that at least for public education, we will be moving forward on the digital part. Um, so, but the repairs have been done, so I don't understand why. Um, no, the other question is, on the ECYS, you see a change in new bow, fair bow, growth on the hold, which changed from 1.7 million in 2022 to 350,000 in 2023. But the repairs haven't been done yet, so I don't understand why there is no budget for 2023. MLK has been repaired. Is, has MLK been repaired from two lifting explanatory, explanatory notes? There is 350,000 for roof of play area. What is the status of roof for MLK and why don't I see it there? The roof repair is for the entire lower part of the school, if I am not mistaken, and not to cover the grassy play area. This is why I am confused. There is still tarp covering the roof of the school, and this is not the playground. Please clarify exactly what is 354, what the, this 350,000 is for. If NRPB is paying, why is this budgeted if the government funds are paying? Um, the roof of the Martin Luther King School Mr. Chairman, is different than the gazebo. The roof for the Martin Luther King School is a project that is being in, um, funded by the insurance money of government. And the 350,000 gillers is for the gazebo. So a couple weeks ago, I have been, I have put in the news the signing of the contract with Winward Roads to repair the roof of the school. And because I thought that it was necessary, I also did a separate project, which is not part of that project, and that is covering the playground, which is a 350,000 gillers. On the staff bureau, 41005 for County Tulaha, there is a decrease of 1.1 million 
Please explain why this change. The Minister of Finance, I believe, have clarified this already. However, with the budget amendment of 2022, the total vacant vacation allowance for all ministries was budgeted under staff bureau. And in 2023, draft budget, the vacation allowance is budgeted per entity, department, or division. Subsequently, it looks like there is an in, a decrease in vacation allowance in 2023, but this is not factual since the vacation allowance is budgeted per entity in 2023. Then, Mr. Chairman, uh, the following. Under of dealing on the ways, please explain why the subsidies for the following organizations were reduced in 2023. What policy exists for calculation of subsidy and under what conditions can an increase or a decrease be given? Stichting voorgezet onderwijs, St. Martin, decrease 800,000 foundation, Catholic education, decrease 1 million foundation, Protestant education, 376,000 foundation, Seventh-day Adventist school, churches, school board, decrease with 165K and USM with 393K, NEPA 442, Charlotte Books in 45. Please explain why the subsidies for the following organizations were reduced in 2023 and what policy exists for calculations of subsidy under and under what conditions can the increase be, can an increase or a decrease be given. Foundation for academic and vocation, vocational education increase 460K. Methodist Agnostic Center increase 470,000. This determination of subsidies needs to be clearly motivated, especially when material changes are noted that follows no clear trend. Mr. Chairman, the actual funding of education to the school boards has not been cut. The budgeted amount of all funded educational institution, if need be, will be amended during 2023 via budget amendment. The increase in the funding amount can be attributed to an increase in student numbers as the funding model of the LB Hamburg uses the number of students to calculate the funding amount per school board. And then, Mr. Chairman, I come to the questions of the Member of Parliament, Rolando Bryson. Subsidies from some school boards are down. What is What was approved in the budget? What was requested from the school board? Or were there differences? Or is it that based on their request, this is what was given? I would like an understanding per school board. What did they request and what did they receive? Mr. Chairman, the actual funding to education to the school boards has not been cut. And Mr. Chairman, if you hear me repeat the exact answer, it is because of the request definitely of one member of parliament who indicates I want my answer to be given and don't lump it with the other. So I am trying to give everybody their answer, Mr. Chairman. And it would sound like I repeated the same answer for the questions for every member of parliament. The budgeted amounts of all funded educational institution, if need be, will be amended during 2023 via budget amendment. The increase in the funding amount for some school boards can be attributed to the increase of students as the funding model of the LB Humber cost uses the number of students to calculate the funding amount per school. Then, Mr. Chairman, the amount requested by each school board and their budgets were of where available have been included in the table below in the answers. 
cultural activities is not cut by 50%. I can get, on, can I, was cut, it's cut by 50%. Can I get an explanation on why? Mr. Chairman, the ministry is honoring the demand of a balanced budget. And I know that I have mentioned this before and over and over, but Mr. Chairman, I too understand that a balance need to be made, a compromise need to be made. We have not been able to get capital investments, I think from since 2016, I believe. And we have to try as, as, as a country to see if we get the needed capital investments um, in order to carry out the needed projects. Um, for instance, very much needed is extra money to finish the Prince William Alexander School in, in, in St. Peter's. So as a Minister of Education, Culture, and Sports, while I find it very difficult to, to cut certain things, I cooperate in order to get the capital investment that is needed for other um, needs. So, motion passed reference esports to create a framework in the sports department to recognize esports as we do in terms of common sports. What is the progress on this? Has there been any organizations that have submitted and proposals or requests to be reorganized by the government? If not, can a suggestion be for the minister to announce that to put out a press release and ask local esports organizations to register themselves, corporate, register them themselves, corporate themselves as an association? Have they contacted esports department and are we working with esports on St. Martin? Mr. Chairman, to date, no organizations have submitted any proposal or request regarding esports. We reached out to the individuals previously mentioned by MP who has been successful, but there was no request or follow up for assistance from the individual. We can, as suggested, put out a press release encouraging persons interested in esports to organize themselves. Mr. Chairman, following question. Study financing, every year a list comes out with priority areas, two important parts, law and medical. What level of attention is being placed on trying to really actively recruit students to go to study law? This may need to be done in earlier stages of high school. Mr. Chairman, the division study finances organizes awareness campaigns and information sessions in the various high schools annually. These efforts are yielding results. Currently, we have eight students at AUC Medical School. One is scheduled to start in April 2023, and one recently graduated. The main bottleneck with the study of law remains the Dutch language of instruction. Therefore, most students are pursuing HBO law um, first and then transitioning to the masters in law afterwards. Additionally, government is funding the pre-law and the law program offered by the University of Curaçao together with St. Martin on St. Martin, which allow candidates meeting the enrollment criteria to continue their study also here locally. And I believe that we will, in a very short time, be able to celebrate our first lawyer who went to school here on St. Martin in this program. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed to be able to have that great celebration here on the island. Mr. Chairman, that brings me to the questions of Member of Parliament, Bill Jani. Um, for the Department of Education, the budget for the security was increased. Why so? A, a decision was taken to return to daytime security, um, Mr. Chairman, to all public schools. In addition, our video surveillance system will be upgraded 
and monitoring and rapid response services will be contracted. The following question, when students go abroad for their studies through study financing, what kind of medical insurance do they have? And do they have to pay first, then claim from the insurance? All study financing recipients have a healthcare allowance which enables them to purchase medical and accident insurance in the place of study in compliance with their visa and student study permit requirements. The claims policy guidelines varies per country and per company. The following question, what are the repayment plans for study financing? Exactly what percentage do they pay back? And is there any discount if they pay everything back in one go? Mr. Chairman, the following answer. Depending on the total parental income, study financing recipients are required to repay one, 100% if the income is greater than 200,000 and 60% if the income is 200,000 or less. There is no discount for full payment in one shot. After residing on the island for three years, on the island for three years, recipients are eligible for a 20% discount. Former recipients working for the government uh, of St. Martin are eligible for 10% discount for each year of good working performance to a maximum of 50%. And the final question to the Member of Parliament, Biljani. What is the school breakfast program? With the school breakfast program, how many schools are being helped and how many are being, um, how many children are being helped with it? Previously, I think there were six schools and now we have seven schools. All seven public schools are now in, involved in the breakfast program. I mentioned earlier that the breakfast program has also, will also now include something like a fruit or yogurt, or milk, and the program currently caters to about 200 students, but this number continues to increase. So the students indicate at school the need and they are allowed to go to the program without any restrictions, absolutely. Mr. Chairman, this brings me to the end of the questions and answers um, from the members of parliament. I would like to indicate this and I await any follow-up question. I thank you. Thank you, Minister, for the providing the answers to the questions earlier in, in an earlier session of the Essential Committee meeting in which you were given those questions and you've now answered them. There is still a more opportunity for members of the Central Committee to pose their questions. And I see the first speaker will be MP Emmanuel. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And good afternoon to you. Our Khafi, the Honorable Minister and his support staff, my Honorable colleagues, the people of St. Martin that is watching by whichever means or listening. Mr. Chairman, I am a bit taken aback with the answers from the minister, but I'm also shocked with some of the answers from the minister because I didn't ask any questions to him in the first round. So because of that, some of my questions may come over as already been answered. But in his answering now, it leaves me to add on more questions based on some of the answers that was given. Nonetheless, I would, I would, I would take the approach that this answer was already given based on any question that I asked that is similar, Mr. Chairman. So I'll get right into it when it comes to the role of education and, and, and it seems as if the school of MLK is one of the biggest issues that many of us as members of parliament are concerned about. Minister, you made mention that you sign off 
on the roof repair of MLK. And in your answering, you, you made mention of who is the contractor or the company that will be carrying it out. So I know that as well, but that was one of my questions. But what is the cost of such repairs? And you also make mention in, in the last bit a while ago that, and correct me if I'm wrong on that because I also have it here, where is the funding coming from? Because I thought that the funding was coming from the trust fund, but I heard you made mention that it's coming from the government. So if that is the case, can you point out in which budget line the funding is coming from, where in the budget that is? Also, Minister, the issue that I am facing, you made mention about the repairs, but the repairs in particular is about the roof. But we all know that there's structural damage at MLK. We have seen the pictures with the wall, with the tiles, with the windows. So my question is, Minister, with the repairs of the roof, was a study done? Because in most of your answers, you made mention that technical drawing and damage assessment was done. If that is the case, Minister, that was done by whom? And if you have that study of those technical drawings and that damage assessment, can it be given to members of parliament so we ourselves can review it? Because that's what you said in some of your answering yes, that technical drawings were, are done and damage assessment. Okay, so then, okay, then if that is the case, Mr. Chairman, through you, I am asking the Honorable Minister, in particular to the school of MLK, was any technical drawing or any damage assessment was done based on the structure of the school, given the, 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 the damage that we have seen with the wall, with the tiles, with the windows? And also, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, Minister, are you comfortable with the repair of the roof, having children return to classes in MLK after the repairs are done, given the structural condition of the school, given the number of recent earthquakes that we have been facing with recently throughout the region, do you think it's wise for MLK school structurally to take on students, given that it's just a roof repair you're doing. <laughs> Moving on from there, Mr. Chairman, you also made mention a while ago in the last part of your answering that you're also concerned about the funding about the Prince William Alexander School in the St. Peter's area, derogatively known as, back in the days, as the BBO School. I want to ask you, Mr. Chairman, have you ever given any thought as to why the school is in the condition that it's in today? If yes, what is your thoughts on it? Have you ever met the contractor that won the bid to do that school back in the days? And have you ever had a discussion with him, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask you this question because like I said, in some of your answering now, I, I, I sort of got a little bit more up to date in the things you were saying. Mr. Chairman, through you, I'd like to ask the Honorable Minister, can he detail the level of the vocational school? Meaning, is it a secondary school? And if not, what level is it at? Because you made mention that a study is being done. But here's the problem that I have with that, Mr. Chairman. As the longest serving Minister of Education, now a study is being done? How long, how long is it going to take for that study to be complete? The minister said possibly by the end of the year. That's what the minister said. For a study to determine the level that the St. Martin Vocational Training School is on? Possibly by the end of the year? I would like to know at what level is the Vocational Training School is at. So because of that, I'm asking the minister these questions, Mr. Chairman, through you. What level are the teachers at Oranio School at? What level are the teachers of Sundial schools are at? What level are the academy PSV and vocational schools at? Meaning, are they high school teachers or primary school teachers? 
The reason why I'm asking those questions, Mr. Chairman, what is the official status of the St. Martin Vocational Training School? Is it a high school? Yes or no? Is it? And like I made mention, as the longest serving minister in education, how many teachers have you recruited, if any? How many are special needs teachers? How many special need teachers are there at the St. Martin Vocational Training Schools that you know of, Minister? If none, why not? And the reason why I'm saying why not, because as it is today, Mr. Chairman, do the teachers at the St. Martin Vocational School get any type of compensation for taking on the teaching of special needs and catering for the lower IQ level of such students. Because most of the children that go to that school, or some of them, is because they have left PSVE, they have left um, Sundial School because of an IQ level, because of special needs level. And here we have the St. Martin Vocational Training School teachers that are not special needs teachers, but taking on that role for special need students. So is there any compensation for them? Mr. Chairman, through you, the Honorable Minister made mention, and this is the part that made me shake my head, that robots have been implemented in Prince William Alexander School. He said that yesterday, that robots have been implemented in the Prince William Alexander School. Now, I know what he's talking about, but I would like to ask the minister if he knows what he's talking about. What type of robots are you talking about that was implemented in Prince William Alexander School? I would also like to ask the minister through you, Mr. Chairman, do you know what STEM means? It's abbreviated for what, Mr. Chairman? I would like to ask the Honorable Minister if he knows what it is abbreviated for. S-T-E-M is abbreviated for what in terms of learning? Because if the, Mr. Chairman, if the minister can come here and say that he's proud or he feels good, that robots have been implemented, you know, as a matter of fact, let me just say, these robots that the Honorable Minister is talking about was bought from since 2017, Mr. Chairman. Today, at the Prince William Alexander School, the STEM program, the STEM program, Mr. Chairman, that room is turned into right now as a temporary management class. There is no STEM robots in that school doing no work. But the minister comes here yesterday and says he's proud that the robots have been implemented from since 2017. He's proud. That's why I'm asking those questions. Where has those robots been implemented? And Minister, have you seen them in work? I would like to know. And if you have seen them in work, when have you seen them operational? What exactly do they do? What exactly do they do, Mr. Chairman? I would also like to ask the Honorable Minister, through you, did the teachers receive their full vacation pay for the year of 2020? The reason why I'm asking this question, because it's a question I'm bringing back when I asked the minister that question in a meeting I believe we had, and the minister said yes. The minister said yes. They received their full vacation pay for 2020. If that is the case, I would like to know when they received it and how much was it through you, Honorable Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this is something that my colleague M.B. Westcott have been talking about for some time, and it relates to vaping. I would like to ask the Honorable Minister if he's aware or if he know what is vaping. I would like to know through you, Mr. Chairman, I would like to know it now 
Is there any public notice or awareness when it comes to schools, children? Is the ministry aware of such that, that there is no public awareness similar to alcohol and cigarettes when it comes to the grocery stores and children not being able to purchase vaping apparatus? If that is the case, Mr. Chairman, I would like to know through you to the Honorable Minister, what does the ministry intend to do in relation to that? At present, vaping are sold in all grocery stores. But there's no awareness similar to what it is when it comes to alcohol. So I would like to know right now, Mr. Chairman, what's the penalty? What's the penalty at present? for vaping apparatuses to be sold to students in uniform, or regardless whether they're under the age of 18. Are there any criminal penalties as such when it comes to cigarettes and alcohol? And again, Mr. Chairman, it comes back to what our priorities are as the longest serving minister. I would like to ask him through you, Honorable Chair, don't you think it's necessary don't you think it's necessary that children should be made aware of the damaging effects in their young age engaging in vaping? The reason why I'm asking the question is because I, I see it almost every day. Running down children and telling them, don't, but you can't do this. Where you get this from? Who sold this to you? Behind the school bus behind the GEBE wall, down in the corners. And you're like, but how do you get to purchase this? But there's no public awareness, Mr. Chairman. There is none. So many of our students think it's a lesser of the evils when it comes to similar like cigarettes and alcohol. And because there's no criminality or penalizing for it in the grocery stores, they sell it. They sell it. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask the Honorable Minister through you, do you have any plans or is there any plans within the Ministry of Education to deal with this as a serious situation, Mr. Chairman? And at, it is right now, I would leave my questions to that. I thank you very much. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. Next, we have MP Melissa Gums. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to you, my colleagues, we fear the minister, his support staff, and those joining us by whatever means. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have two points of clarification, really, um, for the minister. Minister, in response to the question regarding the um, ICT infrastructure, then, uh, of the schools, I asked, about the wired um, infrastructure of the public schools, and the answer was that they will undergo upgrades um, to accommodate the new technology. So I'd just like some clarity as to uh, how um, this will happen. Is there capacity to do this upgrade within the ministry itself, or will it have to be tendered out to an external company? And um, when would this be starting? Because as the minister stated repeatedly through his answers, the devices um, are on the island, or some of them are on the island already. So just some clarity for that. And then, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to the minister. Um, I had a question, well, the answers I received with regards to sports. Um, the 500,000 guilders to NSI, which I admittedly incorrectly stated was only for the development of athletes. I should have said, um, how is that supposed to also cover the development of athletes if it also covers everything else in the, um, the answer that I got regarding what NSI does, because at the end of the day, in the Tulichtinger book, um, the statement is included for NSI that it helps with the Ontwickling von Hensporters, so the development of athletes. So that's why I asked the question in the way I did. Um, the way that the answer was written was uh, almost like a bit of a chastisement, but I have to question that as well, because in the Two lifting a book, it says one thing in terms of amounts, and in the Khatala book, it says another. But if we're talking, as has been said repeatedly by many ministers, it is a policy-based budget, 
for me, the policy part of it should be accurate. Um, what is reflected here is what I assume would be, you know, the actual amounts, um, but that apparently is not. Uh, similarly, it's a little confusing to see in the policy part, 325,000 guilders for the promotion of local, regional, and international events, and then to kind of receive a bit of a snarky answer, and I know that the minister doesn't write these, um, regarding the fact that it's actually not 325,000 guilders. So if that discrepancy, I think, should have been corrected before this budget came to Parliament, um, because I, since it has been touted for the last budget and a half that we are focusing on a policy-based budget, I tend to kind of focus on that actual aspect of it. Um, and just a comment, Mr. Chairman, regarding sports in general. Um, it's disheartening to me to hear that it seems the associations have to kind of be facilitated to execute a plan that does not exist, that they themselves also have to set. And I really want to stress this because it's the reason why myself and MP Duncan especially keep harping on about sports. Um, government has to set a, a, a sports plan. Uh, when we look at Curacao, when we look at Antigua, Jamaica, etc., those athletes that they produce in track and field and baseball, it's a plan that has been basically established by government, and then government facilitates their plan because, of course, government is not going to start the team. But you need to have some rules and guidelines in place because there has to be some kind of direction. Otherwise, everybody is, is, is rowing the boat, and if everybody does that, we're actually not going anywhere because we are rowing in a different direction. So I just wanted to make that um, comment, Mr. Chairman, and if I could just receive some clarity on the public school infrastructure side of it. Um, that would be much appreciated in terms of ICT. Thank you. Thank you, MP Melissa Gums. Members of Parliament, we've going, been going for approximately an hour and a half, so I do want to take a five-minute break, and then we'll continue with the next speaker, which is MP Westcott-Williams. Meeting adjourned until, let's go, 3.35.
Good afternoon once again, honorable members of parliament and the viewing public. We are back with this central committee handling of the national budget 2023. After that brief adjournment, we will continue with the members of parliament. I will give the floor to MP Gums for an additional question that she missed, and then we go on to MP Westcott Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, MP Westcott, for letting me just make one quick clarification. In my seventh question um, related to the Olympic Federation and NSA, I also asked, is there any data available for yearly costs associated with providing support to individual associations? The answer that the minister was given kind of goes on to list everything that the money allo allocated to NSA covers, but it didn't actually answer my question, um, which is, is there data to say what are the yearly costs? If associations, um, are they providing, like what does it cost to actually support them since the belief is then that they have to then carry out the sporting events. So if that um, clarification could be given on is there any data collected available uh, at the Department of Sports or so for those yearly costs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and next we go to MP Westcott Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a very good afternoon. And my thanks to the minister for the answers that he could have provided. And I say could have provided because the minister made it very clear, and I thank him for his honesty to say that the cuts that have been identified in the budget or the reductions in the budget compared to the budget 2022 needed to be done because we needed to balance the budget. The minister said this on several occasions. So the, the image that is being portrayed for this budget being a realistic budget is a wrong image. There is absolutely no growth at all in this budget. And how some of the ministers can come to parliament and tell us that even for the posts, the different items, where they have reduced the budget because we are anticipating a budget amendment is a falsehood, is a falsehood. So we have a budget here with absolutely no growth Necessary, necessary expenses have been cut to balance the budget. And maybe, just maybe, Minister of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sport, what I'm telling you is not really your issue per se, because you have been told to cut your budgets because we have to balance the budget, and then we just might, might with a capital M, receive capital loans for some investments. I want to ask, so there's absolutely no growth. We have contractual agreements on a yearly basis, and these contract amounts have been slashed to balance the budget. I want to know, Mr. Chairman, from the minister, and why do I say there is no growth, and this is a dangerous slope that we are on? I want to ask the minister, if he's aware of the following verdict by the court of first instance regarding financing of education. And the court in first instance decided in the case of a school board on Curacao the following. And I'll read the press release as issued by the court. Het land handelt onrechtmatig jegens WPCO, Vereniging Protestant Christelijk Onderwijs. This is of the 6th of February of this year. Het gerecht in eerste aanleg van Curaçao heeft vandaag bij vonnis geoordeeld dat het land onrechtmatig handelt jegens WPCO door het door WPCO verzorgde onderwijs ontoereikend te financieren. Het land is bevolen de tarieven en normen gebruikt in de bekostigingsmethodiek aan te passen 
tot deugdelijke bedragen die een einde maken aan de onrechtmatigheid. Het land is voorts veroordeeld om bij voorschot en met ingang van het schooljaar 2023-2024 een bedrag van ruim 2 miljoen gulden per schooljaar aan VPCO te betalen en elk schooljaar te blijven betalen totdat de aanpassing van de tarieven en normen zal hebben plaatsgevonden. End of the press release by the court in first instance. In other words, what the court has decided in a case for the Protestant school board in Curaçao that took the government to court because the government refused or could not or did not want to finance the amount required by that foundation to provide education and decided that the government of Curaçao has to, has to subsidize the school board sufficiently for it to carry out its educational programs. And that's one foundation. So again, through you, Mr. Chairman, to the minister. Minister, I understand this is not your fight per se, but I think it is totally, totally irrealistic. And there is really no need to even debate this budget because everything that we ask, but why is it this amount? Is this amount sufficient to do X, Y, Z? The answer is not really, but we have to balance the budget. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I mentioned the verdict, the funnies in the case of the Protestant school board on Curaçao, because this thing about balancing the budget, I asked regarding the cut in the budget of the NIPA and the University of St. Martin. The reduction in the budget of NIPA and the USM. The minister says, no, there is, there is no cut in the subsidy or there's no cut in the budget. Mr. Chairman, the budget that we received from the government for the University of St. Martin gives the following picture. One, it is estimated, because of course we don't have the annual account for 2021 yet, so it is estimated that the the Payments to the university for 2021 amounted to 1.8 million guilders. 2022, mind you, which was an amended budget, the budget 2022 for the University of St. Martin was 2.095035, so 2 million plus guilders. The budget for 2023, the one we are handling now for the University of St. Martin, is for 1.7 million guilders, a reduction compared to the budget of 2022 for nearly 400,000 guilders. So how can it be explained that the budget hasn't been cut? What is the contractual arrangement with the University of St. Martin. One, is my question to be clarified. Two, what was the budget that a university submitted to government? What, what, and I want to see it per item. The similar story goes for NIPA. NIPA, according to the interim figures for 2021, receive 3.9 million guilders. The budget 2022 for NEPA, according to the budget we have before us, is for 3.7 million guilders. The budget 2023 is for 3.3 million guilders, with a reduction in the budgets 2022 and 2023 of over 4 100,000 guilders. Again, my question, what has the NIPA submitted for its budget? How much was that? And when these cuts to balance the budget are taking place, and in the case of the Ministry of, 
of education, culture, youth, and sport. Have you looked at these budgets? Have you looked at a university budget and NEPA budget and other budgets that have been reduced and figured out what the, re what the reduction would mean for the operation of these institutions, teachers, students, operational costs? Has that been looked at is my question. Monument fund, it has been reduced because the budget has to be balanced. But the minister did assure in the case of the monument fund that the project will continue. I don't know whether it was the projects or the project. Whether it's project or projects, my question is, which are these? And how will they continue on the basis of the reduced budget? I ask about the privatization of the Department of Public Education, and the minister indicated that this is on the table since 2017 to make a public body for the management of public education, and that in the minister's view, this is primarily about financial independence. So concretely, are there any steps towards this research, review, consultancy to be undertaken in 2023? So is there an end goal in sight, the public authority, public body, public entity for public education? Is it going to be a sort of in-between? Are we only looking at financial independence? etc., so that our public schools do not have to go through the bureaucracy of the ministry and the department to get things done. So what is, what is anticipated to be done? Any steps at all where that is concerned? Mr. Chairman, the minister, in response to my question regarding the language, explained that we are in the budget under his ministry. It is mentioned language policy. It's about language policy in education and what ties into that or not. Then I have a follow-up question to that, and it is whether the national language policy is under the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sport. Whether that, the, question, the answer to that question is yes or no, I would ask the minister to provide me with his thoughts on the motions to which I referred and with which the minister say he's acquainted. So what are your thoughts to elevate the English language, which currently is on the same level with the Dutch language, to elevate it and establish English as the first and mother tongue language for St. Martin? This is what is mentioned in the motion, and gradual introduction of the use of the mother tongue as the first official language and a plan for the civil service. I quote this from the motions that were passed by parliament regarding the English language. So a couple of questions result from the minister's answer. Under which ministry does a national language policy fall? One, two, what is the minister, this ministry, especially on the culture, what are your thoughts regarding the position taken by the parliament in the motions regarding the English language? Mr. Chairman, the since last year, I have been asking also when we were dealing with the budget, Regarding the, regarding the community schools. And at the time, the minister had made a very worrisome revelation where that is concerned. And I quote from the minister's answers in 20, or regarding the 2022 budget. And he said, the proposed cut, because I had asked about the cut to afternoon school programs and the community school concept, and the minister responded, the proposed cut of 
5% has a major impact on the program initiatives. The expansion of the community schools per the new school year for the public schools cannot be executed. The current budget of 1.7 million is not sufficient for a full expansion, for a full expansion. So in that context, I want to ask the minister, minister, can you give me an overview of the status overall, island-wide, of the afternoon school programs? So I want to know overall, not only public schools, how much, where, by whom are we offering the community school concept, the broad school concept, if you want to call it that, which include afternoon school programs. Give me an island-wide indication of that. Mr. Chairman, the, the minister indicated that he, that the study financing has been reduced. And it has been reduced because the trend seems to indicate a reduction in requests for study financing. And I would like to ask the minister if he can provide some more insight into this trend. So for example, are there less students coming out of secondary, of secondary education? Because again, when I see when I see what the minister responded to this same question in 2022, and I want to quote from those answers, immigration issues on St. Martin. We see a, no, let me start. We see a slight decrease in the number of applicants for study financing because of immigration issues on St. Martin an increasing number of secondary school graduates don't have the Dutch nationality, making them ineligible for the Dutch, okay, I guess this is a mistake, for the Dutch nationality, but I guess it meant ineligible for study financing. Most of the students in secondary schools are in the vocational streams, SMVTS, PSVE, et cetera, et cetera. The number of students in the academic streams, such as half away the OCXC academic, is not projected to increase. Does this, does this statement here, does this conclusion here not warrant a further research review of study financing in general? Is my question to the minister in connection therewith. The minister referred to medical schools, and minister, I had asked your colleague, minister of VSA, yesterday about the agreements with medical schools and whether there was a policy. I now want to ask you, minister, is your department working on a policy regarding medical schools? Is it, is it taken up? Is it, would it be covered by the law on tertiary education is my question. I get from the answer by the minister indicating that I believe he said eight students being currently enrolled at the AUC, that the agreement with the AUC to provide scholarships, which was made several years ago, is still ongoing, and can that be confirmed? So to provide scholarships, is that still ongoing? And if the minister can tell us from when this has been the case. The, I spoke about the community school program, asked questions there. I spoke about the matter of the study financing, and then, Minister, I, your colleague, Minister of VSA, yesterday indicated that his department and yours, his ministry and yours, are working on the issue of the period poverty. And if that is the case, Minister, because you might recall where we started with this discussion, 
And when it was asked, your response was that school boards had indicated at the time to you that they really didn't see an issue that warranted picking up the matter of the period poverty. I'm understanding that that stance has changed and that the two ministries, along with, amongst others, Teen Times, are working on this matter. And if that is the case, and to be confirmed by you, Minister, then all I would want to say at this juncture is thank you, and I look forward to being apprised of whatever steps are, um, concrete steps are taken in this regard. The, by the way, Minister, um, a proposal to this effect was sent to you some time ago about collaboration with, amongst others, Teen Times, in order to get sort of to the bottom of this and understand what we, what we have before us. Is it an issue? And if it is an issue, how can we address it? And then, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank my colleague who spoke before me for highlighting the issue of vaping. And Minister, you would recall our initial discuss discussions on this matter some time ago. And when I first asked you for your thoughts on the matter, your initial response was that you would have researched into it, you would have made a research into it because you were unfamiliar with the issue at the time. Subsequently, asking you about it once again, and you indicated, Minister, that you had contacted Turning Point on the matter. So I would like to know what has those, what have those contacts yielded? Where are we currently with that matter? And Minister, have you received and looked at the proposal that I sent to both your ministry and the ministry of VSA in terms of the different options that we have to address the matter of vaping, which include possible changes to legislation, but also changes to regulations on the level of an LBHAM. I have indicated which LBHAM, so which general decrees can be amended, which legislations can be amended, and I have asked the ministry to provide me a feedback on these proposals, and I would like to know if the minister is already ready or so far to provide me a feedback on these proposals that I have submitted. Mr. Chairman, I want to believe and conclude that I have addressed the matters that I wanted to address with the Minister of ECYS at this time, and I thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Next, we have MP Rayon Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A good afternoon to the Honorable Minister and the support staff. To my honorable colleagues, to the Khrifir Secretariat, and everybody else tuned in. Mr. Chairman, I just had one question. That was in regards to the pool by the Raul Illich Sports Complex. And um, thank you, Minister, for the answer. But, Minister, before I continue to you, Mr. Chairman, I want to ask the Minister if you read the front page of the Daily Herald today. Um, because I'm getting the feeling that the Minister's answer on the question would have been a valid answer two days ago, but certainly not today, given the recent developments. Um, now, the minister might not be personally privy to the information I'm asking, but I can tell you, minister, that whoever wrote that answer for you either did not do their research or is trying to set you up for failure, or maybe even both. But minister, through you, Mr. Chairman, you said that the program caters to more than 500 kids for various programs, and that is exactly the issue. You see, minister, this is not your fault. Let's be frank about that. Um, the minister cannot be personally held responsible for something like this, but he is ultimately responsible. And, but what I am not going to do is sit here and do as if it was okay what the recommendations were in regards to the lab result tests that the minister spoke of. Because there is an article right now in the Daily Herald today on the front page where a concerned parent took, took it to the media. And although the minister said that there were no bacteria in the water, that was never the issue. What he failed to mention though was that those same results that he spoke about showed a specific amount of 41 mil milligrams per liter, parts per million, ppm, of chlorine in the water by the pool. The minister said that this was normal for high levels of chlorine for public pools. 
Minister, the allowed amount of chlorine in the pool is 5 ppm. Not 41, not 31, not 20, but 5. So what we had here was more than eight times the allowed amount that is actually safe to swim. And this is as per the, the Daily Herald article. So after 10 ppm, your swimsuit can actually start to fade. And the lab results that were made clear in uh, the, the Daily Herald article were 41. So a pool does not reach the level as high as 41 ppm overnight. No, it actually means that the chlorine levels have been rising throughout the last couple of weeks while the kids have been swimming. That is a fact. The minister also said that on March 8 is when the facilities manager was made aware, but in the Daily Herald, it says that actually the sample was t taken to the lab a day before. So that means that at the moment when the manager supposedly found out, according to the minister, the chlorine level in the water at that time was actually already at its highest, 41 ppm, according to the article in, in the Daily Herald. So my question uh, to the minister, to you, Mr. Chairman, in, is since when exactly was the facility manager aware of this possible situation? Because the parents do want to know that. The minister also said that the pool is regularly cleaned and tested. Minister, to you, Mr. Chairman, how regularly, and can I have an exact time estimate as to every two days, every week, every two weeks? Because apparently this was not done enough in order to prevent this. Can we also, to you, Mr. Chairman, see the full lab test results that the minister just spoke about that the facility um, um, asked the lab to do? Because I would like to know if the results also said that it was common for the public pools to have that high of a level of chlorine. Another fact is, Minister, that to you, Mr. Chairman, is that if that concerned parent did not take that sample from the pool, that this situation would not have been fixed, and those 500 kids would have still been swimming in contaminated water at the moment. But since the answer that I received was a runaround, I'm going to ask the answer in, in a very clear manner so that it cannot be misconstrued. Minister, to you, Mr. Chairman, how exactly did the chlorine levels in the pool reach so high, and whose fault was it? Was it a lack of supervision on the facility side? Was it a lack of enforcement on government side? Was it faulty machinery that is not working? And is there additional budget needed? That's, uh, that would be my last question on the topic. And I think I'll leave it there for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, MP Peterson. Next, we have MP Angelique Rameau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A pleasant good afternoon to you, to my colleagues, to the Honorable Minister, his support staff, the viewing and listening public. I have a few clarification questions based on the answers given by the minister. Minister, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, can you clarify that as far as it relates to the training of the teachers to incorporate technology in education, that the only training plan for 2023 is training of the digital boards? So am I to understand that there are no pedagogical trainings planned for 2023 as it relates to skills needed for the integration of technology in education? Through you, Mr. Chairman, Minister, although not mentioned in your response, can the minister clarify if any 360 evaluations or any sort of evaluation systems are done in the public schools. Minister, it was supposed to be one of my questions in the round when we asked questions, but I missed it. In 2014, there was to be an evaluation also on the FBE. And up to date, I believe, that evaluation has not taken place. Can the minister please explain why? And my final clarification, through you, Mr. Chair, can the minister clarify that in 2022, the ministry was busy researching a curriculum for the school type for St. Martin Vocational Training School? As I think in my question, it was very clear that I believe since 2020, when I came into Parliament, this has been a concern and a constant question, and we have gotten so many different answers. And I just want to know, does this mean if the ministry has narrowed down the school type, that will be assigned to the St. Martin, St. Martin Vocational Training School at this point? I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Rumo. Next, we have MP Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to my colleagues here in Parliament. Good afternoon to the Minister. 
and his support team and a good afternoon to the people of St. Martin tuned in. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the minister mentioned very early on that the creation of a board, a school board for public schools, discussions are ongoing. That minister is a bit disturbing for me because the public schools are not only neglected, but to me, we're further in the process. So I'm trying to understand through you, Mr. Chairman, whether there is absolutely no proposal on the table, no advice written, no nothing as it pertains to the creation of a school board for public schools. What, 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 what stage are we in actually? Because I believe that we were further along. So it's a little for me confusing and I'd like the minister to give some more information um, where it concerns that. Uh, my colleague MP Romu just mentioned the FBE evaluation. The minister mentioned new standardized tests on literacy and numeracy. But Mr. Chairman, the most important standardized test in this country, the FBE exam, which needs to be evaluated, revitalized, reformed, anywhere that you can find, I don't feel like it has a priority. Um, and so I would like to know the same about the FBE evaluation, a standardized test that needs to be looked at and actually um, adapted for now. I would like to understand what's happening with, um, with the FBE um, exams. Uh, Mr. Chairman, while we were at IPCO, we had a discussion on study financing and students uh, throughout the Dutch Caribbean repaying duo, repaying the Netherlands for their study loans. I am receiving more and more complaints about the way in which the Department of Study Financing handles the repayment of local study loans. Now, the minister and I actually dealt with a personal case last year in which the minister um, went after... Um, not went after, but dealt with the case personally as it regards some confusion about repayment with a student who was almost close to finishing and so forth. But now I am hearing more complaints. There is the law, yes, on study financing, which needs to be updated in my opinion. However, I would like to see a policy, procedures, something, because the law is there but what exactly is the policy? How do the departments, first of all, let the students know that, hey, you've graduated and this is how you have to repay? Because Article 21 talks about the minister's authority to ask students when they graduate to revoke study loans. 20 years ago, maybe people were pressured to come back home and work, but now they are being pressured, which is, which is what should happen. However, I'm hearing a number of complaints on the way in which the Department of Study Financing is handling repayment of student loans. And so I would like some more information on that. And that is it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, MP Duncan. Next, MP Ludmila De Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I actually just want to reiterate what she said. And I look to my left at MP Sarah Westcott Williams, because when you heard her talking about um, the subsidies and you know whether or not the, the subsidies for the schools, and then whether or not the it was what MP Emmanuel said about the insurance for MLK, the the frustrating part about this is the fact that you are getting answers that make you question the budget more. So. It's very, it's very, it's very frustrating to come to get, you know, to come here now again, get answers, and then you have more questions again, and that's normal. It's part of the process. But for me, when I asked the questions on the subsidies, and I listed off every subsidy, both increases and decreases, and then from the answers, you get an understanding that it is based on um, the number of students. By the end of the year, you're, you're you're learning more of how the subsidy is granted. But since I've asked those questions, and I'm in transparency of how I do my research, I also inquire directly from the boards if they were made aware of it. And so my main issue here is about communication. If you are going to be, and this is a two-way street, so not just from the ministry to the schools, but from the schools to the ministry, you people need to know what they're working with for the upcoming year. We already one quarter into 2023. So the, the, 
I don't really have a question. It's more of, I knew that there wasn't communication there and this is where we need to improve on. We're working to clean up a budget, but then what is in the budget is not communicated to the recipients of it and I have a problem there. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. I, I really don't know what more to add now. I will wait for the answers that I get because the answers were pretty much um, reiterated by the by MP Westcott Williams and also by MP Manuel and I will see where we go after that. Thank you very much. Thank you, MP uh, De Weaver. I do not see any other members of parliament who have some additional questions, um, but before uh, let, allowing the minister time to answer the questions, I did have two points or observations or questions I want to add. Uh, minister, I think it is, it is a theme of this debate that we obviously have a balanced budget and that has been sort of the mission of the government to say we will present a balanced budget and as you and others have illu uh, as illustrated is that on the one hand one of the goals was to indeed make it balanced and on the other hand the other goal was to get more out of capital expenditures which i believe you mentioned minister has we've not had investment since 2017 or, or something like that which is why in analyzing, understanding, that's the sort of assignment you had, my first look was how have you built up and, and justified and, and put the plans in place for all of these capital investments because that's what the CFT has been telling us over the last year in our various meetings with them. So Minister, would you say if the capital expenditures are executable as planned, uh, throughout the 2023 period, despite the budget cuts that you face on the operational side, would education in this country be better served by this budget or worse served by this budget? Because I am not happy with many of the operational cuts that I see throughout this, this budget. Absolutely not. Tourism, justice, ECYS. But what I really take pay a keen eye on is those capital expenditures, those schools, those tourism projects, the uh, fixing and improvement of infrastructure, Dutch Quarter, et cetera. The key to this budget, in my opinion, is that aspect. And that's why from every minister, I want to get the sort of reassurances that those projects are executable because that will make the difference and kind of put to rest the question of if there's no growth in this budget. I think it's a bit interesting that in the last budget, there was a lot of statements and vigor about the fact that the last budget was not balanced and we did not present it and it was illegal. And there were complaints, even the, uh, calls to the ombudsman that she needs to step in and all kinds of things. Now this budget is presented balanced. The same individual is now saying, oh, wow, it's, oh why you present a balanced budget? It's not realistic, it's not possible. So perhaps maybe it's understood why last time we had to present a balanced, uh, unbalanced budget considering the times, and maybe this time we understand that the effort has been made to really create a balanced budget, but stress on the capital investments that are needed. But indeed, Minister, I do share the concern about it being realistic, whether that can be achieved and whether they will be executed in 2023, and I think it would be good for me to hear um, that you intend to achieve them and how you intend to achieve them and when you intend to achieve them. Um, I see no other speakers at this time. Therefore, Minister, uh, what we will do is adjourn to allow the next minister to return. Um, I can imagine you'll need some additional time for that. So we'll be in communication with the members of parliament of how, as to how much time the minister needs. I believe he's Next, we will invite the Minister of Justice to join us, so we'll adjourn for five minutes to allow for that switch. Meeting adjourned.
Good afternoon and welcome back. I give the floor to the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, Ms. Silveria Jacobs, to answer the questions posed by the members of Parliament. Prime Minister, Minister of General Affairs, Ms. Jacobs, you have the floor. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the members of Parliament, my support staff here with me, and all of those following via the various media. Of course, to the people of St. Martin, a hearty good afternoon. I had hoped to be in here a lot earlier today, but be that as it may, I am here to respond to the questions as has been posed by the members of Parliament. I'd like to take the time to extend my condolences to the family of Mr. Edwin, Edwin Dizon, who was laid to rest today. And so that also, I think, put a bit of a glitch in some of our plans. Um, but we do wish the family sincere condolences as they deal with this loss. I'd like to just delve right into the questions without further ado, starting with the questions as were posed by Member of Parliament Sarah Westcott-Williams. Is there a plan to replace the vehicles of the ministers? In accordance with the vehicle policy, the ministers' vehicles are eligible for replacement every five years. These were purchased in 2016, I believe, so they are beyond that, except for one. The ministers' vehicles are constantly in need of repairs, and to curtail the maintenance cost, new vehicles would need to be purchased. Currently, three ministers are making use of vehicles that were received via the trust fund for the organization because of this constant challenge with their vehicles. Once this situation has been rectified, then those vehicles will return to the organization. So that's why, yes, there is a budget for the renewal of the vehicles that need renewing. The next question was referencing the language policy. I believe one of the other ministers may have responded to that. However, I remain open to the discussion regarding um, language and usage of English as it has received also resounding support here in Parliament and we should indeed be exploring this process, which involves multiple ministries, advisory councils, as well as our kingdom partners on the way forward. Noteworthy to mention is that this conversation is deeply rooted in our national development vision and will definitely get the attention it deserves. I'll ensure that Parliament is updated on the envisioned trajectory with regard to this very important topic. The next question regarded a decrease of a million guilders at the staff bureau of the Ministry of General Affairs, which could be seen on page seven. The staff bureau, this was also asked by MP De Weaver. The staff bureau was decreased by one million guilders due to a decrease in vacation pay. Um, the total cost, actually in 2022, it was increased to cover the vacation pay for the ministry during 2022, so therefore, it won't be reflected at staff bureau level for 2023, so it's not an actual cut. In 2023, the vacation pay is budgeted as normal under the various departments under their personnel costs. The next question is, what are the results of the survey on re electoral reform and whether we have those results. Indeed, yes, we do have those results, which we presented in a meeting that was held with the committee in Parliament. The continued public engagement is scheduled to restart with a meeting with the community for information exchange. And there's also a review of pending changes as well as the proposals of member of members of Parliament, which are to be discussed and decided on moving forward. As it regards a letter that was sent to me from the Member of Parliament, the response should be received during the course of this week. 
and um, are ready to go out as a matter of fact. So those will be sent. The next question relates to the budget for legal affairs, which has been cut on the Rex and on the Deskundig Advies. How is this critically understaffed department expected to function? For the budget year 2022, this budget post was used to allocate funds in anticipation of payments that were due to third parties. During the budget amendment process, the ministry made an amendment in order to cover charges, to cover those charges. Therefore, it appears that the budget was a million in 2022 and then decreased in to 160 in 23. It is evident that the same amount budgeted in 23 is the same amount from 2021. So that increase in 22 was to cover some charges that um, I believe were related to court fees. And this budget post is not utilized for the funding um, of personnel. The next question relates to cabinet staffing policy and the budget per ministry. The staffing of the cabinets is expect executed based on the Hunt Lighting Platzing Politica Assistenten. Based on that policy, each minister can determine the staff that they would like to place within their cabinets. There's a predetermined list of seven functions that have a specific scale and allowance attached to them. The minister then determines which functions the staff members that they hire will receive as well as what the salary and allowance would be according to the handbook. The next question related to the integrity chamber budget that was cut and how they will be able to internally remain functioning, how does it affect the working? Um, this was indeed supposed to be rectified in this draft budget. I will discuss further how this can be rectified. There was not enough time to do so before returning to Parliament today. A solution will indeed have to be found in discussion with the organization and the Minister of Finance to ensure that the funds which were transferred last year to the Integrity Chamber is made available to them as well this year and reflected in the budget. The content of the mutual agreement the member asked whether, what is the content of the mutual agreement that is to be signed? She took note that I briefly alluded to this, but did not, um, made note that a letter that she had sent did not receive a response. On January 30th, 2023, a letter was sent by me to parliament updating Parliament on the four country ministerial consultations held on January 12th and 13th, 2023. And looking back, it appears that the letter that was sent crossed back just a day or two after that. This letter indicated the one that I sent, the most important points to discuss in order to come to a final agreement for mutual regulation and also addressed uh, the questions or statements made by the member of parliament. <coughs> The most important points were one, the working method of the implementation organization in each of the respective CAS countries and the working organization in Netherlands. Two, the manner of reporting between the organizations. Three, the support of the Netherlands. And four, the duration of the mutual regulation. And most importantly, five, the inclusion of an independent third party mediation involved in case of potential discord regarding the mutual agreement, thereby giving context to the content. Sorry, thereby giving context to the equitable relations within the kingdom. The other concerns not addressed will be answered in a subsequent letter which I hope also to be able to furnish before the end of this week. In a question related to the St. Martin Development Fund, which has the same budget from when they started, um, an overview, can an overview be provided of what part is being financed by the budget of the three and a half million from government, and also questions about what can the foundation do with the money received from government. <clears throat> government provides a three and a half million, as was mentioned, to the St. Martin Development Fund. 
Based on the list provided, SMDF disbursed 2.8 million to the non-governmental organizations and CSOs, which have requested. Indeed, it is known that there are more requests than they can service at this time, similar to what government recruit receives, definitely more requests than we can service with the given budget. The SMDF can, though, also source other funding as an organization, which they do, and we have enlisted their assistance as well to execute other projects aimed at assisting the most vulnerable in our community. Even though increasing the funding for SMDF is a high priority for me, financial constraints do not allow a budget increase for the foundation at this time. However, we will continue to monitor our revenue as well as assess how government via different ministries also subsidize the NGOs and CSOs that assist the most vulnerable to ensure that we are making the greatest impact with said funds. So that explanation basically says that some of the foundations and CSOs that are subsidized through government, whether it's VSI, education, called youth and sport, um, and other ministries are also funded in another way via the SMDF. And I think it is good that we assess how this is and whether the impact can be greater in a different way. So this definitely has my attention and we'll be looking forward to, of course, as my Minister of Finance constantly says, we all want to spend more money, but we definitely have to figure out ways to generate that money so that we're able to do that on our own. The next question is, um, is there any thought being given to a program for resources for resilient communities? These funds come from the trust fund. What is a long-term plan after the trust fund? The Trust Funds Grant Facility for Civil Society Organizations, otherwise known as R4CR, is expected to run until the middle of 2024. This facility managed by the VNGI under direct supervision of the World Bank and does not directly affect government's budget for, or has never di directly affected government's budget. So that's a direct funding that has been from the onset to the CSOs. The grant facility has an envelope of approximately $7.2 million and is set up with a dual objective. One, to improve the capacity of civil society organizations, and two, to finance specific recovery and resilience activities by building capacity. This project helps to enable civil society organizations to apply for other sources of funding after the trust fund grant facility closes. So a lot of, let's say, upgrading of the CSOs has also been done via this fund. So ensuring that they're able to um, apply for funding as well. Capacity building, in other words. The World Bank is currently working on a sustainable plan for the entire trust fund. In the context of this plan, discussions on how to maintain the capacity built up through the institutions like R4CR and the NRPB will take place, including discussions on success sorry, on sustainable access to financing for our CSOs and NGOs. There was a question concerning the budget for legal advice for the Department of Legal Affairs, which has been cut with 72%. How is this critically understaffed department expected to function? MP Arundel also asked this question for the budget 2022, the budget post was used to allocate funds. Well, I think I mentioned this already. In anticipation of payments that were due to third parties, during the budget amendment process, the ministry made an amendment in order to cover the charges of the third party. Therefore, it appears as if the budget was cut, but it is the same budget as 2021. And it is not utilized for um, funding for understaffing of the department. MP Westcott Williams also asks for an explanation of the grid market report and its relation to St. Martin's energy plan. What is meant by the statement that investors can look at alternative energy projects and programs? The grid market report is a technical report outlining the transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy for St. Martin. The report relates to the energy policy as it dates back to 2014, which is being updated. 
The roadmap outlines the steps and phases to transition to renewable energy along with the possible costs. This also allows for the energy policy to be updated in accordance with such. In addition to being able to provide technical assistance in developing a roadmap to renewable energy, grid market, island resiliency platform is also able to source or seek investors to support this transition. So that's basically where we are now. The roadmap and the related projects will strengthen our sole electricity company, NVGEBE, thereby creating more jobs, not causing jobs to go lost because everyone is looking towards a more sustainable energy production and making GB more resilient and less reliant on fossil fuels. So the process and the project will allow for training of the current employees as well as bringing them new skills to be able to uh, move forward with the new types of energy that we'll now be using and allow us at St. Martin to move forward in achieving our goals, energy goals related to the sustainable development goals. This is in collaboration. The policy group is working together. So people from Ministry of Romi, Ministry of Teyat, as well as GEBE and BAC to be able to upgrade the policy as well. I go to the question of MP Gums. The National Development Vision was launched in November 2022, and it is mentioned that the Department of Bach is also busy with the implementation of several resembled slash EU funded or semi-funded projects. Focus on the implementation of sustainable development goals. How does the Minister of General Affairs intend to implement these NDV themes with the projected budget? The NDV serves as the umbrella for all our reforms, activities, and initiatives throughout government. Policy departments, along with the SG platform, continue to coordinate and harmonize accordingly. Internal awareness continues to take place through pl policy platform sessions. In addition to this, alignment with the country reform measures continues to take place. Theories of change are to be developed per measure to ensure alignment to the respective NDV team and of course with budget items. So based on how we are, I think a lot of the times, and I remember when I went to the high level political forum last year on sustainable development goals, there was a mad scramble within the organization as to where are we with the different sustainable development goals. So part of what we have to incorporate in our planning <coughs> is to ensure that we, with every project and program and task, identify from now which SDG is being uh, addressed, and then it's easier to then extrapolate over time, whether quarterly or uh, biannually, or when we need to report at these high-level forums, um, how we are doing in the achievement of these goals. So it definitely has our attention and will be one of the things that we're measuring in all of these um, programs, projects, tasks, reform, activities, etc. I have a, that was the only question I had from MP Gums. I go to MP Duncan. What is the plan of approach to increase capacity over 2023? Indeed, as I mentioned during my introductory remarks, we are on an extensive trajectory to assess the human resources and operational system within government apparatus. And I mentioned at least four measures that are underway currently for which recommendations will stem that will offer us tools and further measures that can be implemented to address these capacity issues. Once the assessments are finalized, and from what I'm hearing, I guess I would have gotten them by now, but we're busy with budget meetings, so hopefully before the end of the week, we can start to address some of the reports, and the plans of approach will then have to be made and implemented, so Parliament will be updated as we move forward with those. As a matter of fact, some of these uh, measures, uh, we've seen the need to also look for some low-hanging fruit in that regard and uh, fast-track some of that as well. So I'll be able to update once we are so far. 
MP Duncan also asked about the Department of Interior and Kingdom Relations um, appearing to receive an increase in costs. Can you provide an elucidation since other departments have decreased in personnel costs and salaries as it relates to the implementation or is it related to the implementation of country package? The cost that you see relates to the vacation pay for staff of the department. Mm -hmm. And in 2022, it was reflected under the budget line item of staff bureau, Ministry of General Affairs, as I mentioned a bit earlier. So for 2023, the vacation pay is now placed on the respective departments, and thus it may appear as an increase. Um, why it might not appear by others may be because as we are being more realistic with our budgeting, uh, one of the things that we had is you might have a wish list of hiring X amount of people. So you, over the past few years, we had our actuals in terms of personnel costs never uh, was in line with what you had projected for that year. So um, departments had to be more realistic. And so if maybe they were more realistic this year, then you didn't see the, um, the increase. MP Duncan also asks about a national archive. Is it government's intention to establish such before the end of this term? The establishment of a national archive is a recurring topic that does have the attention of this government. We are still thinking of, along the lines though of setting up a virtual national archive first. This is mainly due to the lack of suitable land and space. A virtual archive would require very little physical space, and this is the current trend most archives are moving towards around the world. It is also less costly and provides users access to the same records online without having to be on location. And they can do so also from any location. The possibility of a virtual archive is being actively researched, especially with the latest techn technical developments and government's plans concerning digitization. The Departments of Records and Information, DIV, and the Civil Registry Department are actively busy in the process of digitalizing their documents. Um, there was also the discussion with the representatives from the National Archive in Aruba in 2022, as well as recent discussions in February of this year with UNESCO representatives regarding possible expertise support as well. For the longer term, once the virtual archive is in place. Government still plans to establish a physical national archive. However, this will be on a smaller scale and possibly in collaboration with the National Museum and other institutions facing similar challenges. So we believe as a small island, we need to collaborate in this regard. MP Emanuel asked a question in relation to Article 3 of the budget for country packages, who's responsible to sign any agreements and or conditions for grants, what is the role of Parliament in this regard? The conditions for grants are determined together with the stakeholder ministry, so regardless to which ministry it is, and the uh, temporary work organization from the Netherlands. As a formality, the Minister of General Affairs, I, am mandated to sign on behalf of the Council of Ministers on the grant agreements in accordance with the Constitution. Once the Department of or the ministry determines that funding is needed for the execution of a measure, be it goods, services, or human resources, an official request is made via the Terio to base it CAR. Should there be an agreement, which has been, um, just on a side note, going pretty well to date, then the process is finalized with an advice to the Council of Ministers, whereby the Minister of General Affairs signs for the grant agreements, and they are done via subsidy, from Bezetka and is usually reflected in our budget as a grant. MP Emanuel also asks about the Department of National Security, mentioning an increase and what does this budget cover, et cetera. Um, is it there a difference between Lance Recherche and the National Detectives? Or the Na Lance Recherche is the National Detectives so is there a difference between them and the VDSM? And if yes, how many persons make up the security? Who or what are they securing? The VDSM, or National Security of St. Martin, um, has three tasks. These are A, the execution of security screenings, B, the promotion of security measures, and C, conducting investigations to protect the country from persons 
or organizations that might threaten its democratic legal order, its integrity, or its vital interests, including those of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The VDSM carries out its duties in compliance with the law, and it is therefore not necessarily a law enforcement agency, so it is not comparative to the Lance Recherche. Primarily, the VDSM focuses on identifying threats and aims to inform stakeholders in a timely manner in order to prevent and or reduce these threats. However, if criminal acts are detected during such an investigation, then these are reported to the relevant authorities. The budget of VDSM was increased in 2023 to allow the VDSM to expand its services that concern mainly A, the execution of security screenings and the promotion of security measures. Further information related to the staffing, etc., cannot be divulged. The policy on cabinet staff was also requested and whether we are following the policies of previous government, I already responded to this in a response to MP Westcott Williams. And uh, when we submit the report, it will be in writing, so. MP Akim Arundel asked about the Department of Legal Affairs where draft legislation is vetted, what ways are we planning to target this? The Caribbean Center for Legislation, CCL, will strengthen, I am missing something there. One minute. Okay, the department has been and is currently busy with the recruitment of key personnel, including the department head. Recruiting of qualified persons with specialities in the legal field has been a challenge. It is the hope that with the trajectory to promote the effectiveness to promote the effectiveness of government that the Department of Legal Affairs and Legislation, with the assistance of the Caribbean Center for Legislation, will strengthen the legislative capacity within government. Consultative research has been recently conducted within government. The consultative research is to identify the legislative needs and the recommendations are yet to be reviewed for consideration. The four main priorities of this project will focus on education, basic and in-depth legal and legislative courses, lectures, and courses that would be provided free of charge, research and advice, assisting with specific topics where a legal expert is needed. So this is uh, based on the research that we have done to be able to target how to assist in getting more legislation finalized. MP Arnell also asked whether he could receive an update about the issues concerning the fire department, have they been resolved, and he noticed a decrease in the budget. The decrease, I'll start with that, being referred to is related to uniforms. These same funds were transferred to another budget item within the fire department on request of the department head based on the uniforms, et cetera, that they'd received in 2022. So they felt better to use that budget elsewhere. Regarding the concerns that the firefighters had, most of the expenditures to execute the repairs of the f &A building were handled via the operational budget, maintenance of facility services, while the orders for the uniforms, which were pending via NRPB, were received in December of 2022. Pertaining to the equipment and materials to fully equip two of the three new trucks uh, that is still awaiting payment and the other repairs that were for the account of SOG and the trust fund 
are still ongoing. We'll be getting an update once that project has been finalized. Communication has improved vastly as well, and I trust that I'll be alerted by management timely should any issues require attention at a higher level. MPs Ramu, Bryson, and Bijlani asked this question related to the parking fees or the parking lot. Um, actually, MP Ramu had a more elaborate question asking for a comparison of the peak amount pre-IRMA and what was generated in 22, considering whether we, uh, is whether it's a low-hanging fruit that can generate more revenue. Indeed, we've been thinking along the same lines, and um, unfortunately, the proposal that was put forth had to go out to be tendered, et cetera. But let me just update on the first part of the question. The records show revenues for 2016 at 461,000. In 2017, it was 300,000, and this was not for the entire year of, three th of 2017, as there was no revenue after the hurricane, so that was up until September. Or, yeah. During 2018 to 2021, there was a minor, there was minor revenue generated, and in 2022, an amount of 314. With the automation of the parking lot, lots, both Clem La Vega and the old post office space, as well as 24-hour operation, we can expect substantial revenue to be generated. Currently, the daily cash and receipts of the parking lot are placed in money bags provided by the receiver's office and dropped off to the receiver for recounting and control. But as I mentioned, the upgrade of the parking lot to be able to do the automation, um, I believe in last February, in February 16th or 18th, the tender was completed, so we expect to have that finalized during the course of this year. MP Brown Bill asks whether regarding a line item for goods and services about an increase of 300% um, as government. I mentioned in the presentation that we, oh yes, this is related to the CRIF insurance for the year of 2023. In the years prior, the NRPB approved the payment or we approved that they would pay it and they actually extended it for a couple of years based on the pandemic. However, this year, 2023, government had agreed to start paying its share, handling their responsibility. MP Brownbill also asks about another increase regarding personnel for civil registry. Um, this was also explained in my introductory remarks, but it relates to the launch of a cleanup project of the PIVA system for the basic administration of civil registry. The budget will aid in hiring third-party personnel to assist with the cleanup of the administration. We also had to account for overtime for the current workers who are assisting as well. So it's a quite an expensive affair, but so much is dependent upon it that it is worth for us to get that properly automated. MP Brown Bill also asks about um, an increase at Department of Records and Information Management, known as DIV. DIV budgeted for the hiring of a third party service to be able to adjust um, and finalize a draft of the Archives National Ordinance and the digitalization of the Archives Project. So it's for third party that's needed for us to actually do what another MP asked about, which was get the archiving done and as well as the ordinance to regulate such. We are in dire need of an archive and this project will help us to preserve the many old documents and pictures that we have. MP Halligan Martin. There was one question from MP Westcott Williams regarding Dutch funding for country package items in 2023. The MP asks, which and what funds did the Dutch government contribute to the country package in 22 actually contribute and what and for what projects? The estimated funds received in 2022 are 8.5 million Corona deans. And for 2023, the current cited amounts are 20 million for capital expenditures and 2.1 million for the Hawona Dienst. 
The challenge is that the financial needs for the measures are adjusted quarterly, and we there wasn't a clear indication as yet, so the 2.1 million is what it is for now, and once the actual measures have identified where the needs are, then budget amendments will have to be made. But for now, the anticipation is only for what is known, which is at 2.1 million for 2023. And the CAPEX for 20 million, I believe the Minister of Finance already mentioned what it was for, mm -hmm. but it was for the digitalization for financial, yeah. Fi yeah. financial management, I believe. Um, the, I can't promise that will be finalized for this week, but we can try to prepare an overview of, at least from 2022, which projects received what amounts besides the, um, what was mentioned. The amount for the Corona deans, the eight and a half million. I wasn't able to get that in time. Yes, now I go to the questions from MP Alaga Martin, uh, who requested an elucidation on some of the policies linked to expenditures. Some of the policies linked to expenditures for the Ministry of General Affairs are the housing policy and the disaster risk financing strategy policy. The housing policy concerns the cost effectiveness of the public sector um, as it regards to the housing of government offices. So in an objective to reduce the cost of government for housing, it's different offices. The disaster risk financing strategy policy concerns a situation and analysis risk profile assessment. The deadline for the finalization of this one is the 1st of April, 2023. MP Heilagam Martin also asked the total amount, or oh, Minister of Finance answered that. Um, can there be a status update to the Van Raak and the, the Graaf motions that are being carried out? These motions were being discussed and a vision document was prepared under the internal committee of legislative lawyers where St. Martin also had um, input called the AWOC. The document was finally elevated to the ministerial level during the four country consultation where it was decided that those motions can no longer be discussed at the level of AWOC because there was no support for the vision paper as is. There was, however, interest in starting the discussions on how we can best address the democratic deficit, but not necessarily in the way proposed in the vision document. There was more support to potentially elevate the discussion about the democratic deficit to the future Kingdom Conference, which is being planned for later this year. I explained in my remarks, opening remarks, the details and timelines are being hashed out by the established work group to determine the scope and power of this conference. So that is being worked out on the technical level as to what will take place. I believe the conference will also include Parliament, so I'm assuming that Parliament also has technical persons involved in it. MP. MP Helga Martin also asked for a list of NRPD projects ongoing and completed, including related budget information to be sent to Parliament. I believe while we were waiting, did um, an email would have been sent. If not, it will be sent during the course of today with an update of the projects um, as has been provided by the NRPB. And it also will give you a link direct to the latest report, which you will be able to peruse and get more in-depth information. The MP also asks for a detailed update on the underling regeling as it relates to the signing. When was it signed and can Parliament receive a copy? Of course, once the underling regeling is signed, we will share that with Parliament in January after the four country consultation, I provided Parliament with an update on the underling regeling. I made, and it was sent in a cover letter on the 30, 30th of January. And once we have finalized the 
aan de vier landen overleg. It was sent, so I don't know where it is, but indeed if it hasn't been sent, please liaise with my staff and we'll ensure that it is. It was sent. Uh -huh. So that was an update on the underlinger regeling. And I highlighted in my answers to MP Westcott Williams the points that were covered therein. Um, once we have finalized the technical discussions on the content of the underlinger regeling. Um, Prime Minister. Yes. I would like to adjourn for two minutes. Meeting adjourn. Welcome back, Prime Minister. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me clarify. Once the Onderlinge Regeling is signed, it will be shared with Parliament. In January, after the Vier London Overleg, I provided Parliament with an update on what was discussed 
between the four countries regarding the underling regeling. This was submitted in a letter on January 30th. And once we have finalized the process of what we are agreeing to in this new mutual arrangement, um, I will submit an update, hopefully by the first week of April, to the Parliament. Regarding the information from the Supervisory Board with regards to TELEM, does it have the attention of the Prime Minister? What am I planning to do? Is there going to be a follow-up forensic audit carried out? The normal course to follow a forensic audit is that the auditors would recommend and advise government to do so if it is deemed necessary. This was not the case in the audit that was carried out by the SOAB, and it was ascertained at the time when we were updated that many of the recommendations were already being carried out. As shareholder, we will request for an update from the supervisory board in terms of the progress regarding those recommendations. Um, at this time, there is no inclination that a forensic audit is needed. Once we have had that update from the supervisory board of directors, we'll be able to further update parliament. There was another question related to the fiber to the home project at Talem and uh, available budget, as well as whether we are planning to sell the Smith Combs building to fund the fiber to the home project. Um, the project is ongoing. Talem does have the e equipment and the expertise in-house by its employees to finalize the last part of the project. I will request a meeting, again, of the Supervisory Board of Directors to get an official update, after which I can come back to further expound in a meeting specific to this point, um, should that be deemed necessary, or it can be provided in writing. The MP also asks what are, how far the ministries are with the implementation of the country package, where and how is this reflected in the budget? The measures are all at different stages of implementation, most are still in the assessment stage, while others are in full swing, as I mentioned, for the Ministry of General Affairs, the exit survey, as well as the employment satisfaction survey and disaster risk management items um, are ongoing. These, there, the progress of these um, measures can be tracked via the quarterly implementation agendas and progress reports which we do provide to Parliament. It is possible that you may not have received the last one, so I have asked my staff to ensure to forward that to you as well. So you should receive the implementation report of quarter four as well as the implementation agenda of quarter one. And we will soon have the report for quarter one and the agenda for quarter two. So once we have those, we will send them, but the ones that we have will be sent as soon as possible if they haven't been sent already. I think I mentioned already that there's a 2.1 million on the Corona Deans at this time to cover projects needed for reforms, whether it's for personnel, goods, third parties, etc. cetera. Um, and they're all under the Ministry of Finance at this time. The challenge is that the implementation agenda is updated per quarter. And so once we are clearer on what budget is needed, then a budget amendment will be needed. So we'll be monitoring that throughout the year. The MP asks also what the financial standing of SOG was based on the 2021 audited profit and loss report. Uh, SOG is considered financially stable. with their expenses superseding their, I'm oh, sorry, their income superseding their expenses, resulting in a profit. The MP also asks if I'm of the opinion that St. Martin should pursue reparations from the Netherlands under the umbrella of the CARICOM 10-point plan. I believe I've made myself quite clear in my initial public statements um, before and after the apology I have emphatically stated that I support the premise of the CARICOM 10-point plan for reparations. In the meantime, we've hosted a town hall discussion on January 21st, 2023, whereby the keynote address was given by Mr. Dobreen Omard, 
a vice president of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. In his keynote address, he submitted three options through which St. Martin could pursue reparations, which also included the CARICOM 10-point plan and a combination of that with others. This has been shared with the AXAR committee, so the a committee that we set up for slavery atonement and reparations, which is currently in the process of drafting its plan of approach as stated previously in my opening statements. Upon receiving this plan, along with the committee's position paper, a formal position will be adopted by the Council of Ministers. The MP also asks whether the current budget allows for the implementation of the SDGs. Indeed, I have stated that the SDGs are integrated into the NDV and therefore form part of the many considerations when we're executing our governmental tasks. It is a goal to ensure that the departments note which SDGs are being addressed in the execution of their tasks, in their outputs, and in their impacts. These are the ta uh, terms that we use within policy-based budgeting, so I have just asked that they add a point where they also indicate which SDG they are dealing with. How much has government spent on court cases? The Ministry of Finance responded to the full number of court cases, hence I will only address the number of verdicts for the General Affairs Ministry for 2022. There are two cases settled out of court, Eichspraken. One case was won, and sorry, one case was won, one case was lost, and five cases are pending as of now in 2023. That is for General Affairs. MP Helga Martin also asked the total budget used to pay consultants working in the cabinet of the minister since 2022. I have one consultant working. The budgeted amount for the year is 96,000 uh, for 23. A total of 67,370 was paid in consultant fees in 2022. And the ministry has also 66,000 on its budget for consultant fees in 2023. How many ministries are lacking SGs? The Ministry of General Affairs, this function has been vacant as of January 2023 and is being currently filled in an acting capacity. The vacancy has been published and we are looking forward to start the selection procedure for a suitable candidate. So yes, suitable candidates are asked to apply. We are now at the questions for MP Bryson. Can a clear, clear picture of any income coming from the country packages be sent? This question seemed to have been quite famous. Financial support is provided on the basis of the plans of approach. These are being drafted throughout the year. Corresponding to the measures, therefore, the total financial picture is not always available until the respective plan of approach is being drafted. However, the items for which it is already clear what funding is available is reflected on the budget. And as I mentioned, as we, um, as we go further through the year, we will be able to identify those and come to you for the amendments. MP Bryson also asked, okay, these two were answered by Minister of Finance, whether consideration for a strategy to increase more legal support for the ministries is taken. Legal capacity is being addressed through the country package. A review, a door lifting, has been completed and a plan is being drafted at the moment to strengthen the capacity of our legal department. And the legal departments or uh, sections within the ministries. The door lifting also focused on the legislative function and capacity within government, including Department of Legal Affairs. The report listed several recommendations for which a plan of approach is being drafted. MP Bryson also asks about a formula for legal support and rechtsendeskundig advice that ministers should receive. There is no formula per se, and rechtsendeskundig advice for the ministers are provided in every area of the legal spectrum, from vetting contracts to grants to changing laws and the like. So far, I must say several ministries have made um, use of assistance via the country packages for some um, 
consultants and recs and discundak at these. So with our limitations in budget, I guess that's an option. MP Bryson also asks if there's a total number that we can give in terms of what's coming into the budget to help cover some of these expenses. As I mentioned, these are based on the plans of approach and we will get those clearer once the plans of approach are completed. Debt cancellation is part of the kingdom discussions. The MP asks whether I can elucidate on the challenges to execute the motion and fight for debt cancellation for the country, whether the kingdom has taken a hard stance on this at a time, a hard position at this time. Have they drawn a line, he questioned, and what are the hard line stances that they have in terms of debt cancellation? Well, I must say the Dutch government is not necessarily open to debt cancellation. I cannot say they have a hard stance, but you know, it's a political issue. Based on the previous discussions at the political level, this remains one of the options in our point of departure because we've had discussions and I'm very keen on keeping my side of the bargain and so I expect that that will happen also. There will be respect for that. Um, in our initial discussions when we talked about these um, COVID loans especially and the need for liquidity support, the discussion was yes, it's a grant now but it can, it's a loan now but it can become a grant. Now you're hearing a different story. So I am very much keen on us uh, remaining at the point of departure of the different options that St. Martin sees possible and debt cancellation is one of them. We've also proposed certain things like debt swap. But while we are in this discussion, it would be inappropriate to go into the heavy details. We're still very much in discussion and um, hoping to get the best possible for St. Martin. The MP also asks in the context of repertory justice whether we looked at this fact that debt cancellation is a prominent part of it. Um, indeed, we have made known to our Dutch counterparts that it could be part of the discussion. Unfortunately, they are not yet swayed by these arguments. Our team will continue to prepare the proposals which include the options that we prefer. So I would like to continue to encourage the members of parliament to continue to forward that argument at your level. MP Bryson asked also whether, um, The question on the integrity chamber was also asked by MP Westcott Williams. I believe I responded to that already. And MP also asked about a building and they did not get a building. They just moved from the rental space to where they were to another space in 2022 due to challenges that they face at that former location. So we have to find a solution for that situation as I mentioned before. MP Bryson also asked for elucidation of the 500,000 budgeted for postal services, St. Martin, which was, oh, for an elucidation to be provided to Parliament on it. The government of St. Martin made an agreement with the postal services to aid with the repayment of their creditors over a five year period. It was agreed that the postal services would receive 1 million in 2022, 1 1.5 in 2023 through 2025 and 0.5, so a half a million in 2026. During this period, during this period, the postal services will provide regular updates on its financial position and would be self-sustainable after the injections to pay its outstanding bills from prior 10, 10, 10. To that effect, the PSS has submitted a business model for viability and have expended their service to be able to carry their day-to-day -day operations. Another question from MP Bryson related to budget posts for the increase in consultants for the basic administration. 
He wanted to understand how that juxtaposes not the investment being done in basic administration in the CAPEX. Do, he questioned whether we needed additional work on the operational side, and on top of that, are we making expenses? Or couldn't we have the CAPEX budget cover the consultants and all of the changes being made to the basic administration? The budget post that is being referred to is used for consultants, but also for payment of external works when necessary. In this case, regarding the Civil Registry Department, this post is used to hire four temporary workers for one year to assist the department with its cleanup project of the basic administration registry. Oh yes, I did answer this already. The purpose of the cleanup project is to ensure that persons register in the basic administration on the correct address that the persons registered are still living on St. Martin and so forth. As a result, this project did not need to be covered under the capital expenditures. Can an update be provided about the current use of the Antelope Schaal and the critical vacancy? As you may recall, there was much complaint about the application of the Antelope Schaal, which is actually legislated for in the Besoldigingsregeling Amtenaren known as the BRA. However, we have found that the regulations are not, sorry, was not in all instances being properly applied. That has since been rectified. The Anlob Schaal is now being applied in accordance with Article 3 of the Besoldigingsregeling, Amtenaren, and persons are promoted to their functional scale once they qualify for such, based on the assessment of their manager in the respective departments. This is aside from the fact that, of course, the council, this Council of Ministers believes that the Anlob Schaal provision no longer fits within the labor market. Therefore, it has been decided to reinstate the legislative process to update the BRA, and we hope to send this file on to the CCSU before the end of the month. Um, initially, we were fast-tracking just one or two articles, but they had already been um, adjusting it, so we took the time to finalize the full revision, and hopefully we can send this on within short, before the end of the month, to the CCSU for their review. MP Bryson also asked about the CRIF insurance for 2023. I responded to this a bit earlier, but uh, basically it's an agreement, the Emergency Recovery Project 1. The trust fund initially allocated funding to cover the payment for three years, which was 2018, 19, 1920, 2021. On the request of government during our difficult time, we asked for an extension and they extended it for 2021, 2022, 22-23. So as of this year, we take up our responsibility to pay CRIF, and that's why it's part of our budget. With regards to the leisures for ordering, can the Ministry of General Affairs identify fees that should be increased to reflect costs more in line with 2023 as opposed to 1960? It is very ironic that we appear to be on the same page because a project group has recently been established to pinpoint exactly said areas where fees can be increased across ministries, as this has been identified as a needed action to increase revenues, which would not have a great impact on the individual. MP Peterson asks whether the Minister of General Affairs, based on the country packages, could tell us what plans are in place to enhance the Arbeid forwarder for civil servants and whether the results of the Medewerker Tevredenheids Toots, so the, what was that called? Wow, I just said it in English and now it's gone. The satisfaction, employee satisfaction survey, which was done, will be shared with Parliament. The results of the employee satisfaction survey are now being finalized. Uh, this is being done by consultancy group Effectory. The project team is currently organizing and scheduling sessions for the reveal of the results. In addition to the aforementioned additional research such as Arbeit's marked forwarding and the exit survey have also taken place related to the Arbeit's forwarding within government. So to be clear, it's um, the labor market survey and an exit survey was also done. Um, the labor market survey also to ensure our comparison between government and the uh, external private sector. The results of these, this research, these two will also be revealed within short. All reports will be published and as such can be shared with parliament once completed. 
The purpose of the aforementioned research, however, is indeed to determine suitable recommendations to enhance the working conditions within government. So it's not for many purposes. And I must say most of our civil servants initially were quite concerned about the survey in terms of will they know who is saying what, but it was made very clear several in info sessions were held and we were able to get the necessary uh, responses to have a viable survey and all of the information is confidential. How is the implementation of the policy-based budgeting? Sorry, this is now MP De Weaver. How is the implementation of the policy-based budgeting reflected in the 2023 mm -hmm. budget? Generally speaking, the method methodology for policy-based budgeting <coughs> was designed in line with the requirements of the Comptabilitites for Ordining regarding the effectiveness and efficiency of the policy underlying the budget. In regard to the budget 23 and 22, costs were allocated to policy objectives, so impacts, desired out results, called outcomes, and outputs and activities. Ideally, the focus is to ensure that the budget is based on policy, so on what impact we expect it to have, expected results, outcome and output, and on the essential activities. This ensures that ministries enable policy-based accountability and a direct link between the output and the input, between effectiveness and efficiency. So the actual document clearly defines what the policy is you're working on, what the activities are, and it must identify also the budget post or how much of a particular budget post is being used for the execution of it. And Peter Weaver also asked <clears throat> whether she took note that trainings were being conducted by the fire department, but had concerns about the tools such as water lines and fire hydrants in regards to infrastructure. The fire department works alongside the electricity and water company for the installation of fire hydrants. Several areas have already been identified to have fire hydrants installed, and we are in the process of acquiring the new hydrants. I believe they've been paid for already, so they're in the process of being manufactured or for, uh, sent. MPD Weaver also asked about the increase in facility services by 528K in relation to budget post 43010, SLA contracts and licenses. What makes up this amount? Where does the policy-based budgeting implementation fit in here? And is it in line with the policy? Indeed, SLA's service level agreements will be made after public tenders for vehicle maintenance, service and maintenance of printers, copy machines, scanners, access control through the entire government, generators, maintenance of generators, cameras, elevators, etc. All of these have to be finalized. In the past, they were just being paid out of the general pot of facility services, and therefore the amounts that we estimated would be needed for the SLAs were put on this budget post. This is a part of the trajectory towards a more transparent and efficient handling of services rendered to government, and of course, ensuring timely payments as well, which is part of our vision for improving efficiency and effectiveness. This should see a decrease in the ad hoc spending and improve financial planning for the ministry, which is key for policy-based budgeting because we will be able to link contracts with specific budget-related costs. This amount allows the Facility Services Department to restructure the management of services received for the organization as we serve the entire organization. MPD Weaver also asked to explain the decrease of one million in staff bureau personnel costs. I believe I explained that a bit earlier. She also asked about why the Wet Havings Department had a decrease in 869 on the Rex and Advice. I also responded to that on the questions to MP Westcott Williams and Bryson. MP Bijlani asked about the 50% decrease in subsidies for PSS increase. I just explained that as well to MP Bryson. And 
on the SLA question as well from MP De Weaver. MP Bijlani also asks whether the vision and mission is shared between all departments or how often is it revisited? Our mission falls in line with our draft ministerial plan, which came about as a result of the policy-based budgeting exercise done in 2022. As such, it is a living document which will be used to finalize department plans and for which continuous assessment should take place to ascertain achievements and make adjustments as necessary. These can take place quarterly, but according to our HR cycle, which as long as you have proper planning in place, then the planning for the individual um, employees is then the responsibility of the department head, and these are done twice per year. So then you're able to monitor whether you're actually executing the tasks set forth by the employees within the organization. So it is our goal to ensure that this is done, MP Bijlani. With that being said, I've come to the end of the questions as I have them recorded, and I turn to the floor back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, Ms. Sylvia Jacobs. I have to my left the members of parliament for their clarification and further questions. And it's MP Sarah Westcott Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a, a good afternoon. A good afternoon to the Prime Minister and her support staff, my colleagues who are still in the room and all tuned in to this meeting. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your responses. And I want to go back to a comment you made with respect to the NRPB the last time around. And I did respond to it before, and I said it was refreshing to hear you make that comment. But in all seriousness now, you did mention that from research or something like that, the workings of the NRPB, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, were ahead of similar programs or something to that effect. And I would just like you to put it in the right context. Um, you know, what, what exactly, so what was the comparison based on which it appeared that the NRPB is, is ahead? I would, I, would like to, I would like to get that. The, the matter of the R4CR and the Prime Minister, after explaining the R4CR, went on to state that the World Bank is working on a sustainable plan for the SEOs, et cetera. And so my question is, this what the World Bank is working on? Is that part of the, the work of the World Bank in the context of the trust fund for St. Martin is, is my question. And is there any more details and information that can be given with respect to this particular project of the World Bank to strengthen the to strengthen the, the civil society organizations and, and, and the like, if there's more that can be given. I also, Mr. Chairman, would like the Prime Minister to be a little more specific where the issue of electoral reform is concerned. In the answer of the Prime Minister, I heard several things. I heard a continue that the results of the survey are in and um, could a synopsis of those results be shared? One, I also understood the Prime Minister to say that town hall settings and that type of fora will be, will be undertaken, will be picked up, etc. And But there's also a review to take place. Now, Mr. Chairman, this is my view. I believe that the government needs to take some kind of leadership where this is concerned. And that whatever the review is, I don't know exactly, maybe the Prime Minister can go a little further into what exactly is being reviewed, but I think the government in taking this to the people should have a direction, should have um, a, a position, should be able to share what the government thinks and how the government thinks electoral reform should be 
should be proceeded with. So I would, yeah, I, that's the way I think because I believe that if we're just going to have town hall meetings and the like, I mean, the truth be told, while how many persons would you really have knowledgeable and interested in electoral reform as a general concept, huh? as a general concept. I think the government, again, needs to take some, needs to give some leads in terms of what they view as feasible and um, as part of, of electoral reform. Electoral reform is a very broad um, item, and as such, I believe government should, should give some priorities where that is concerned. This, uh, so is the survey, has the survey been completed? If not, is it, is it online and where can I find it? The, so that's my question. I understood that a letter in response to my queries that not only touched on electoral reform but on several other issues and that letter is hopefully to reach here um, to reach Parliament still this week. I look forward to receiving that. Can the Prime Minister provide the manual, so the hunt lading that is being used for cabinet staffing, if she can provide a copy, please. Um, same question with respect to the grid market and the road map that has been presented to government. Can the road map be shared with Parliament? The I understand the issue of the TW, uh, um, the TWO financing, and that it's not yet, there's nothing concretely that could have, that can yet be said with respect to 2023. The Prime Minister went into, went into the matter of the English language and indicated government's um, priority this being a priority for government. And uh, I would like the Prime Minister to give her view on the motions regarding the English language, elevating the English language as the primary official language. Those two motions of parliament that the Prime Minister also referred to when she mentioned that it was a matter that has been discussed in parliament. So can I get, can I get the view, can I get the, the government's view on the position as verbalized in the, in the motions of parliament? The, Mr. Chairman, now I am, I am quite interested to hear more concretely with respect to the motions that have been not only referred to now, but on several occasions, the motion, um, the Graaf and Van Raak and a few others that, that speak to the issue of the charter and review of the charter and modernization of the charter. And am I now to understand that firstly on a technical level, these motions were discussed. A position paper resulted from those discussions. And then who decided that these motions are no longer, are no longer, whatever they are no longer. They are no longer important. They are no longer going to be pursued. Who, who made that decision? So these motions that keep coming back, not only in discussions here in Parliament, but also, not only in discussions here in Parliament, but also um, in IPCO, that we're going to pursue the modernization and uh, the revamping of the charter and now these motions. So who have rejected these motions? One, two, um, the, and we're going over to democratic deficit. Again, democratic deficit is a very, very broad term. And we could look at democratic deficits from several angles, even within the Dutch kingdom. 
we can look at it like we can't, we, we, we can't vote in the second chamber, even where it pertains to matters that regard us. We don't have, a, we actually don't have a vote even in the Kingdom Council of Ministers. Is that even a government when we say Kingdom Council of Ministers, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on about a democratic deficit. So when this is going to be the focus of the four governments towards the next Kingdom Conference, what aspect of democratic deficit? What are we zooming in on when we say democratic deficit? And so, so I, and, and the, in IPCO, it was agreed that the governments will be asked to make sure that in the planning for the next kingdom conference, that the parliaments are involved with the preparation and involved within the Kingdom Conference, that we be there. And so what exactly came out from the, what exactly came out from the following discussion that was to take place after the Prime Minister's letter of the 30th of, of, of January. So the, 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 the meeting that should have taken place Subsequently, what, what exactly came out? What exactly came out there? So if I can get a, a good understanding as to one, these motions and the position of these motions and, and that they have been kind of put aside, if I understood correctly, and if not, then please correct me, and that the focus is going to be on the democratic deficit and from what angle will, will that be taken? And then, Mr. Chairman, the... Let me see what else. And it's a pity that I, don't, I have not yet received the responses from the Prime Minister on this issue of the mutual agreement. And in my letter, yeah, the Prime Minister gave, uh, what, what, what were they called? I'll tell you now what they were called. They were called the, the outline. So we receive an outline of the mutual agreement and then some things are mentioned in the letter by the Prime Minister. And, but one of the things that I mentioned in my letter to the Prime Minister regarding this matter is parliamentary oversight. To make sure that we don't fall in the same trap that we basically had fallen into where the COHO is concerned and the involvement of the, of, of the parliament in this. So I had asked the Prime Minister if she could not assure, if the Prime Minister could not assure, along with her colleagues, especially of Aruba and Curaçao, that their parliaments get a view of what this mutual agreement is going to be about before it is signed. That was my question to the Prime Minister. And I would love the Prime Minister, Prime Minister to still go into it, although I was told that I will get the answers to to those questions at some point in the future. I hope before we get to the, to the public meeting of, on the budget, because Mr. Chairman, I believe that the countries, including St. Martin, have a small window of opportunity now with this mutual agreement to try and turn the discussion into the direction of the basis for sustainable development of this country. And rather than maintaining the basis that was created for the country package, the basis for the country package has nothing to do with sustainable development. It's about reform and making sure that we could get more money, we could collect more money, so that we are less rely, have to rely less on the Netherlands. And whether we want to put it under the caption of the UN's right to development. I'm talking decolonization, I ain't talking none of that yet, but whether we want to put it under or towards reparation, whether we want to say it's decolonization, finalization, which the government has in their program, or whether we want to call it um, reparation, I think I mentioned that, or the right to development, I think now is the opportunity to turn the discussion and the agreement in that direction. Because if we allow the mutual agreement to come down again and basically just a cohort type operation but on a lower level, we're going to be doing ourselves a, a disfavor. 
and we are going to be having to deal with what we are dealing right now, um, a budget that we know, that we know is not realistic. So I would like the, I would like the Prime Minister to maybe give her view on, on, on that matter. I think we should turn the discussion regarding whatever type of assistance in the direction of the right to development that every country has. The same, the same discussion on the SDGs. And then that prompts me to ask whether we have a dedicated group or a dedicated set of persons to monitor and measure actions of government by the SDGs. So a dedicated one. I understand that someone is thinking, but do we have like a dedicated group that everything that happens, that's the group that look at the overall and so that when we go to report our SDG compliance or achievements, that it is very clear. Right now, Mr. Chairman, it is where from this from this budget and the elucidation to the budget, we're like all over. All over, um, um, much has been mentioned of a vision, that's the national development vision, which by the way, like I, like I mentioned it, I would like the Prime Minister to go a little bit back into the national development vision and indicate um, if it is still the intention that out of that, a plan with measurable targets will come. So, but I mentioned, I think um, in the budget, references made to that, references made to the governing program, references made to the country package, and uh, the, the connection is still hard to be made if you're looking at it from overall sustainable development. Mr. Chairman, I think those were the issues I would like the Prime Minister maybe to go into. Thank you. Thank you, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. The next person I have is MP Grisha Halliger Martin. MP Grisha Mart Halliger yes. Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A pleasant good afternoon to you. A good afternoon to the Prime Minister and her support staff, my fellow colleagues, and those listening and viewing online and on the radio. Mr. Chairman, I have a few clarifications, and I feel I though I because of the, the the way the answering was done it was all um, it was not in alignment with how the questions were posed I may have missed a few questions so maybe the Prime Minister could um, clarify that for me so um, mr. chairman I'd like to ask through you the question to the Prime Minister regarding is 169 letter that was sent on behalf um, on behalf of MP Duncan, MP Gums, and myself regarding an urgent meeting of Telem regarding the status of Telem. This was sent on the 7th of November. It was an urgent request. Should have been done in four days, but we are now still waiting three months later to call this meeting. Why do I make mention of that? Because I decided during the CC to ask general questions pertaining to that meeting. And unfortunately, my answers were not my questions were not answered clearly. We need to still discuss the SOAB report, the financial status of the fiber to the home, that was not clear, and the union letter. Mr. Chairman, I would like to pose to you, again propose to you, and kindly ask you when we can have this meeting on the agenda, because clearly there's an issue at LM and clearly we want to get to the matter of this situation at Talem. Uh, as for some questions that I may have missed, May 2020, St. Martin received the third report, the third recommendations. The recommendations in a nutshell stated that Holland would have to dialogue with the Dutch countries and work together more on the autonomy and the elimination of racism and inequality. That's, in a nutshell, is what the, um, the, the summary of the report stated. Uh, Holland is up for a periodic review every five years. It's three years in. And one of the questions I posed to the Prime Minister through you, Mr. Chairman, was, what is the status of the follow-up 
to the third recommendation, is the government working with the Dutch government on addressing the concerns of the third? And if so, can the government provide Parliament with a progress report? It is three years. 2025 will be another periodic review. How far are we with that? Another question that I may have missed is what is the financial standing of SOG? Please provide audited reports. Another question I have was, are, is the Prime Minister of the opinion that St. Martin should pursue re receiving reparations from the Netherlands via CARICOM based on its 10-point plan for reparatory justice or in any shape or form? If that was responded, replied, no problem. Then we'll get it in the report. And then my last question, which I don't think I, I may have missed as well, how are the country packages, the SDGs, and the individual vision and mission of the, minister, the Prime Minister's ministry combined and reflected in the budget and monitored? Are they all linked? And that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Grisha Halliger martin The next person I see is MP Orlando Bryce. Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, good evening to one and all once again. Mr. Chairman, I would like to receive, um, regarding my question on the PSS and the increase in subsidy, I do understand what the Prime Minister has elucidated in terms of, okay, there was some sort of agreement in terms of ensuring that we have, in terms of ensuring that they have enough funds to be able to keep up with their financial commitments. Um, but I think I, I really require some more details. It's not um, normal for an institution to get, is this your You don't have quorum, so. I, two, four, six, eight. Yes, eight. You may continue, MP Bryson. Thank you very much. Let me repeat the question. Uh, my question was regarding the, um, the post office. And as a result of the fact that there is an increase of 50% in the subsidy, um, I would like at least some more details. These can be sent in writing. Um, from the 1.5 million, can I get a breakdown on what the intention is that to be spent? Because if it's supposed to be towards a debt, is it that this debt is increasing over the three years that they have, uh, that there was some agreement to give more subsidy, I would like to understand that. Uh, are there any, uh, at least some consolidated financial statements from the PSS that can be sent to Parliament, whatever the last consolidated financial statements would be, so that sh at, at least uh, the basic, the PNL balance sheet, um, <clears throat> and a breakdown of how their subsidy is spent, which would have to be submitted in accordance with the subsidy ordinance anyway. So I would like to see um, what what exactly is is being done, and is it a subsidy or is it a beidrage? How is it really defined? Um, just so I can understand the intention behind this increase from one million to one point five million. The other question I had, and and it has to do with the situation with the underling regeling, and I, I appreciate the the prime minister stating that yes, once those have been established. Um, and approved by the Council of Ministers, we are to be informed. And I agree. You know, it's like sometimes we pick and choose when we are supposed to be uh, trias politicas or not. Uh, we've debated this extensively within the IPCO, where these underlinger regelingen are agreements between the, con the government countries. However, the one caveat that I do stand by is that they should not bind the Parliament of St. Martin. So, for example, one thing I would say is um, we should avoid a situation where it says, pass this law by May 1st. It should say, this law will be with the parliament by May 1st, for example. I think if there's an agreement in that sense between the countries to be able to present such reforms to the parliament, I don't believe it is my competency for, to, to get per, or to give permission to the government to be able to say, we are going to present this law to you by May 1st. Our competency is to decide whether we will pass said law or not. And I, I went through the decision list again. It was a discussion point. It wasn't necessarily to say this is, was the definitive agreement that from now on all country packages must come to the parliament first for approval. Actually, it was heavily debated because I can remember the reason that 
um, suggestion came from the IPCO, from Ms. Oman, was because she was making the comparison to how they do it in the EU compared to maybe that system working for us. And as myself, I remember the president of um, Aruba Parliament, Mr. Vrolok, showed the key difference. And what the key difference is, when the prime minister would, be to, would come to parliament and say, you know what, parliament, I need your permission to sign this on the Lingerekling because if I don't, this will be the consequence. What position does that now put me in? I don't want to be in that position. I want to maintain my autonomy when it comes to voting my conscience. But making a statement and say, yeah, prime minister, go ahead, I think is a little too far. Look at what worked for us. When we told the prime minister, basically in simple words, you do what you need to do, and we will do what we need to do. The coho was, was worked on, negotiated to the best of the ability. When the parliament's role stepped in, our role became very clear and it became very powerful because to this date, we have not received a reply to our report. So I think that method we have to keep as much as possible because that is a check and balance that allows the prime minister and the government to negotiate to the best of their ability, but the buck stops with the parliament once it entails budgetary consequences or legislation on a national ordinance level. So that would be my remarks to the Prime Minister in terms of that, and I do look forward to hearing from her once the government has established these country packages to understand where it is, where we can then review to make sure that they don't, um, let's say, go over what the Parliament of St. Martin's competencies are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Bryson. I don't see any more MPs for any questions or clarification. Prime Minister, would you go directly into answering? Prime Minister? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think most of the questions can be answered shortly. I just would require 10 to 15 minutes to ensure that I can, um, that we have them all, first of all, and then that I can respond to them. And whatever that can be sent uh, in writing will be done. But I can seek to clarify some of the things that were asked. Okay, as it is at 6 p.m. and we have a supper break now, so let's return back at 6.30. Okay. Let me adjourn for five minutes to discuss with uh, Krifi and then get back to you.
has got to change. Good afternoon and welcome back. We had a brief adjournment to allow the Prime Minister to prepare some answers to some clarifications and some additional questions that she had received. I understand some of them will probably be sent in writing, but Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will do my best to give the clarifications as requested. Um, MP Westcott Williams wanted a little more clarification as to what was meant in my opening statements regarding the NRPB and the World Bank's uh, review of their workings. Um, what I can state is that the NRPB is a project implementation unit. They have various project implementation units within the Caribbean region and based on the manner in which the NRPB is working in execution of our projects, um, they are doing well. Their reviews are, um, I believe in my report I mentioned, the majority satisfactory to good, and so therefore they received a great review from the World Bank in terms of how they're executing the projects. There's been a lot of growth in terms of capacity, in, in terms of project management, et cetera, within the organization. Um, and so that's in relation to the rest of the Caribbean. <coughs> As it relates to the World Bank, looking at a sustainable sustainability model for the R4CR and other um, entities that they are seeing that are carrying out good works for the projects currently, um, it is a matter of part of the greater vision of um, the government of St. Martin to maintain the sustainability where we need it. So we recognizing that CSOs and others need continued, continuous um, funding, that we are looking at different models as to how to do that. In fact, we're also looking at, and whether it's within the trajectory of the current fund or not, I will be able to clarify that at a later date, but it is indeed upon our request to gain some sustainability after the fund is over. So ways in which and places in which we can continue to receive funding for the types of projects that we believe are needed. So this is a government directed initiative. Um, more specific to electoral reform, I hear the stance of the member of parliament, um, the government at this time, or I could say I at this time, felt the need to hear from the people in terms of there's been a lot said, there have been reports written by professionals, but it is the people who are the ones who are voting and uh, most of the time, even in, in um, what do you call those things when you do, in 2000 we did it, the, referendum. referendum, thank you. You have to also build awareness before you ask people to make a decision, so, um, it is a matter of the MP saying not enough people may be interested in electoral reform. We feel based on the responses to the survey that many are, um, and we need to bring awareness to all levels. So it is a par partial awareness program mm -hmm. slash hearing from them, and thereafter we'll be able to make a decision. Yes, we can do more leading, and I'll bring this up in the Council of Ministers to get their feedback as well. As it relates to the letter um, yes, you will be receiving the response to your queries this week, and the manual for the cabinet staffing can be sent, and will be sent um, the grid market roadmap 
um, can be shared and uh, they will be willing to come in and also give elucidation if the parliament would like as to what they were contracted to do by government, what they have done and what they can do for the future moving forward to assist us in our trajectory for sustainable energy. As it relates to the language on priority, I gave my view. I did not bring this to the Council of Ministers, so permit me the opportunity to bring this to the discussion of the Council of Ministers to get government's purview on it, and um, I will get back to the members of parliament with that um, possibly in writing. As for the Varak motion and the De Graaf motion, sorry, I don't know if my response was misunderstood. Um, it is not that anything is taken off of the table. The AWOC were legislative lawyers from the various countries um, having a discussion on these matters. And for most of them, while they were able to put forward a discussion paper, a vision paper, they felt that the real discussion is at a political level. And so it's not that the discussion will stop but it has to be elevated to the political level. And so therefore, the motions will still be part of it. In fact, the Dutch, when they tabled it on the agenda, they did talk about the motion for Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, but like you mentioned, the democratic deficit, as well as our status within the kingdom and the kingdom charter are broader discussions, which we felt needed to be taken to the kingdom conference level. And what that will roll out to be is yet to be seen. So there is no stagnation of the discussion. The decision, decision was just remove that decision or discussion from the AWOC level to take it to the political level. And not all of the countries, um, let's say, were supportive of the, the, the vision paper that had been presented from the legislative level. Did I say it correct? Ish. Right, so the vision document gave an explanation or a proposed manner in which to execute the motions which wasn't carried by all the countries. So that needs to be reassessed on a political level. The next point was the mutual agreements and I think MP Bryson basically clarified that. Um, there is no legal obligation for government to come to parliament for approvals of such. We do realize the great window. Um, in fact, and that's what I mentioned in my opening statements that a lot of the heavy discussions we've had at United Nations level bringing awareness, and in fact, what MP uh, Helga Martin um, brought forward as well in terms of the third report has put a lot of international um, attention on the Netherlands in the manner in which uh, we are dealing as a kingdom. And we have seen an improvement to some extent in um, discussions and agreements and the like. And the main part that we removed from the underlinge regeling is any obligation to parliament. That I had mentioned was removed. Um, and so Anything that has to come to Parliament, at the end of the day, Parliament has its right to carry out its, um, its mandate to the power to debate, question, and in fact, amend whatever laws that we may bring. Um, nowhere within the, the country package can Parliament be bound to anything. I have, throughout this process, kept uh, very open and transparent um, updates to the parliament. And um, you will be updated again once we have the finalized version. If there is a need for a closed door discussion to throw ideas into the ring to ensure that St. Martin gets the best way forward, maybe that can be done. Um, but we're aiming to finalize this process in, in early April. So. Seeing the time left, I don't know uh, where that would be um, in, in the trajectory of things. The question was also asked whether we have a dedicated group to monitor SDGs. Again, that's something I think I mentioned 
in the answering of my questions before that is something we are focusing on more to highlight where we are with the SDGs in all our planning moving forward as the NDV is now the, let's call it the, the basis upon which all our actions, whether they be part of the country package or not. So it's not just country package monitoring of SDGs, it's across the board, all the actions of government, all of the activities of government will be monitored, whether they are internal or whether they are being carried out by NGOs and CSOs on our behalf. We just have to do a better job of taking note of when um, we are actually actively working on our SDGs. As I mentioned, when I had to go to the high level political forum, there was a, you know, and, and pulling information from within the organization from various uh, levels is always difficult. So if we have a monitoring tool that already and with um, a lot of the activities we have, there's a dashboard, we can just add a point where the SDG is mentioned and where we are with it. So that definitely has our attention. MP Helga Martin uh, mentioned a public meeting request from November. Um, I will have to go back and see and send a response as to how soon we can meet on that to further clarify any concerns the Parliament may have regarding TELEM. The third recommendations, um, the Ministry of Bezetka, um, I haven't had a recent update, but they have forwarded on to another ministry to give the, to who's responsible to provide the response. So in our next meeting, I will bring this up as a point of discussion. The financial reports that were requested were then an oversight from the SOG. Um, we will provide those that we have. And I was going to go back. I don't recall what the question was on CARICOM. Was there a question on CARICOM? And the last part was whether the NDVs and the SDGs are linked in the budget. Um, the NDV is definitely the basis upon which um, our activities are linked. And as I mentioned before, the SDGs will have to be highlighted still. So the, the SDGs form part of the NDVs. So the National Development Vision encompasses the SDGs already. So within that, we'll be able to link where they are in the budget. Were you able to find out the question on CARICOM? That would be then the last one. And MP Bryson, um, the PSS, as I mentioned, I gave an elucidation as to an agreement within the Council of Ministers at a time when their forward movement was in jeopardy. The injection was agreed upon over time. And so an agreement was made with them with their um, do you call that the creditors, um, which are also within the kingdom and kingdom partners whom we have a relationship with and the understanding was there that via government assistance they would be able to um, erase that debt and this was a priority for them to be able to move forward or else they would be using operational budget which they need to sustain themselves. So the arrears were from Irma yes, up until 2021, the built up of arrears that they had. And the interest that government had in injecting assistance for them, so you had asked whether it was a subsidy or a, it was a beidrach, a contribution, based on the fact that a country must maintain postal services. And they cannot qualify for subsidy. And they cannot qualify for a subsidy. So in that respect, So hopefully that clarifies for Member of Parliament Bryson, and I can confirm that nothing within the underling regeling will be binding Parliament. It is um, an agreement between governments and how we will then get assistance for the execution of our 
of our measures that we agree to take. And I believe the CARICOM question was already responded to in my initial response. With that, Mr. Chairman, I believe I've completed the clarifications requested by the members of parliament, and I yield the floor back to you. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Prime Minister. Thank you for those answers, and we have a request from MP Westcott Williams. She has additional questions or information. MP Westcott Williams, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a, a brief follow-up question, and if the Prime Minister has or can provide any more information regarding the Kingdom Conference, is there, you mentioned later down in the year, is there, so has anything been decided and or proposed for the Kingdom Conference more specifically? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams, Prime Minister. You have the floor when ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I believe I responded earlier that the technical teams from the four countries met to discuss possible topics, et cetera, but um, nothing has been presented to the, um, the ministers as yet. So just some topics, et cetera, have been presented. Um, I can... Right, so they didn't go too much into the content, but more so how it would be structured and how they would work within the Kingdom, Con Kingdom Conference. So that information that I have, um, I would be able to summarize it and on paper and send it to you. But I would like to, um, I completely forget I was going to say something. Yeah. I had something I wanted to say, but in the meantime, in responding to you, I lost my train of thought. Um, but if there are no further elucidations, um, oh yes, I got confirmation from my staff that uh, the NRPB overview has been sent, as well as the response to the letter that the MP, Sarah Westcott Williams, was awaiting. So those two have been sent in the meantime, and I believe the Earth Rulings Agendas will be sent shortly as well. Yeah, just to confirm. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister. We have reached to the end of this session with the Prime Minister. We still have the Minister of Justice spending, but before we do that, we will have, for some, a much needed supper break, for others, a break from the air call. We adjourn until 7.02. Meeting adjourned.
Good evening and <clears throat> welcome back after that short uh, supper break. We have ended with the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs and we now have the Minister of Justice, Minister Anna Richardson. Welcome to you and your delegation and uh, we go immediately over to the minister who will be answering questions posed to her in the central committee meeting. This will be her first round of answering questions, which will be followed by clarifications if necessary, and probably one or two more questions. And uh, then we're done with you. The floor is yours. Pleasant good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pleasant good evening to you and to the members of parliament. Uh, a special welcome and thank you to um, the chief of police, Cal John, who's with us, the head of our judicial affairs, Ms. Ismail, uh, Ramona Ismail, and the director of the prison, Mr. Uh, Stephen Carty, as well as to my support staff from within the cabinet, as well as judicial affairs and staff bureau of the Ministry of Justice. Without further ado, I'd like to begin with question one that was presented um, uh, by MP Westcott Williams. The electronic monitor program and the victim support service has been put on nil. Why is that? Please explain. In previous budgets, electronic monitoring was on budget line 43489-5007 and victim support services was 43489-5008. Uh, were placed in the budget under the projects and activities in the Staff Bureau of 2022 budget. However, it has since been adjusted in the budget as follows. In 2023, 2023 electronic monitoring is under budget line 43489-5007, and it's under Harvey Bay, and budgeted, budgeted for an amount of 118882 In 2023, victim support services under budget line 4430 44301-5008 is now listed as a subsidy as this is a foundation and it now has a subsidy budget a budgeted amount of 300,000. The minister mentioned an amendment on a general police ordinance in connection with a single use plastic ban. Please explain. The approved amendment to the general police ordinance will be sent to the cabinet of the governor for ratification. After the ratification of the legislation, the Ministry of Teat will be mandated to execute the legislation. An important note and observation, a ban on import of plastic has not yet been regulated. In, in the ordinance relation, uh, related to the Customs Division, this was one of the comments of the Council of Advice on the legislation to ban single-use plastic. As such, it is imperative that the amendment to the customs legislation is necessary to ban the import of the same plastic products. Question three, the police salaries in the budget have been reduced to 16% and over time to 70%. How does this jive? Does not, does not the police over time need to be reinstated um, as it was before the 12 and a half percent cuts? What is the basis for overtime paid to police officers at this time? The decision and actions of cutting the budget did not originate within the Ministry of Justice. As a matter of fact, the ministries whose core task is to serve and protect, is the, it is important that the ministry maintains a realistic budget such as overtime. That said, in consultation with the Ministry of Finance, we have been advised that the plan is to track income and expenses for every ministry on a quarterly basis and preparations will be made to make budget amendments in areas where heavier increase in spending versus low spending are seen in other ministries, giving an opportunity to meet the needs of particular ministries and or departments. In 2023, a retroactive uh, of 2.5 million guilders is estimated still under the judge justice budget up for from 2.3 million in 2022. Where are these numbers derived from? 
why was no payment made in 2022? And when in 2023 will they all be made? And what is the holdup? Is this the payout that is being referred to according to the news releases that should be made before the 31st or by the 31st of March? In 2020, the advance payment released to the officers was to the tune of 2.2 million guilders. Considering that the calculations are still not yet finalized, the decision was taken to maintain this ballpark figure. As part of the covenant agreement, the payments will be will be done within three to five years. As such, when the total sum is identified, the figure will be divided for the annual amounts that will be needed to pay the installments and reserves as per the budget year in which they will be dispersed. In the event too little was paid before, the difference will be shifted to the payments to come. Beginning, beginning or as per today, March 15, the placement committee began sending out offer letters to personnel. Once the placement committee receives an acceptance letter from the employees accepting the offered positions, the relevant national decrees will be made. As per Kingdom Law Article 20 and 14, Reichswerk Finanziell Zusicht, once the Elbeham is signed by the governor, the national decree per employees will be sent for signature and the governor will then sign. I will also sign these. And then finally, it will be sent to Lohn and Salaris so that as per the payroll, the employees will receive the payments to their accounts. The overtime of the prison staff has been reduced. How will service be guaranteed at the prison with the current personnel challenges if this, cut, if this is cut? Please explain. Like all ministries, the Ministry of Justice has been heavily impacted by the sacrifices made to, have, to ensure for a balanced budget. The decision and actions of cutting the budget did not originate within the Ministry of Justice. As a matter of fact, it is imperative that this ministry maintains its budget with realistic figures to be able to adhere to its overtime and other costs. That said, in consultation with the Ministry of Finance, we have been advised that the plan is to track income and expenses for every ministry on a quarterly basis and preparations will be made uh, for budget amendments. What is the current agreement if change is made on, of the inmates currently housed in the Netherlands? Currently, there are six inmates from St. Martin that are detained in the Netherlands who were transferred to the Netherlands after Hurricane uh, Irma on the basis of a political agreement between the ministers of justice. Once one of those is now, one of those inmates is now formally an inmate of the Netherlands and no longer that of St. Martin. The other five inmates have, um, release dates in 2024, 2025, 29, and 31. Taking into consideration the structural need for cell capacity, the, requested, the request to extend the stay of these inmates have been renewed based on the ORD2, underlinger regeling detensi capaciteit. There are inmates who need a higher level of detention security. For this group, the ORD, Inmates, the paquet or PG, is the lead for the extension of their stay in the Netherlands. As projected in the budget, the salaries of the customs has been cut with approximately 500,000 guilders. Can this be explained? The ministry has been heavily impacted by the sacrifices made to ensure the balanced budget. We have had to limit the vacancy allotment at the, at the sacrifice of our material cost. Question eight. Can the Coast Guard budget for St. Martin and St. Martin shares therein also be explained? The Dutch Caribbean Coast Guard is in partnership between the four countries of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Aruba, Curaçao, St. Martin, and the Netherlands. The partnership serves the interests of the individual countries as well as interests of the kingdom as a whole. In addition to services, such as search and rescue, the Coast Guard performs investigative and supervisory tasks within the Caribbean. These include the fight against drugs, general police tasks, counter-terrorism, and border control. In addition, the Coast Guard focuses on combating human smuggling, human trafficking, and illegal immigration because countries in the Caribbean part of the Caribbean of the Netherlands can be intermediate uh, stations or endpoints in the chain of such practices. The Kingdom Law Coast Guard forms the framework of, the part of this partnership and contains the legal foundation 
for the deployment of the Coast Guard. To this end, the Kingdom Law describes the area of responsibility as well as the task and powers of the Coast Guard. In addition, the Kingdom Law contains provisions on the management of the organization. The countries of the Kingdom jointly bear the financing of operating expenses of the Coast Guard. This is in accordance with the Kingdom Law Coast Guard in which following the distribution keys is described as follows. Aruba, 11%, Curaçao, 16%, St. Martin, 4%, and the Netherlands, 69%. St. Martin's contribution to the Coast Guard in 2023 is budgeted at 3 million guilders. The budget for the Executive Protection Service, or EPU, EPS, has been reduced. Please explain. The EPS has been a planned unit to be developed for a number of years with a budget that has rolled over annually, with no actual steps that have been taken since recent <clears throat> Considering the pre present activity to officially establish same or on the way, having a reduced budget until the legal establishment is finalized is deemed feasible. The um, EPU is in operation as a pilot project, pilot service. Is the minister aware of St. Martin's need assess assessment on migration governance and have there been any steps taken based on this assessment? In the second quarter of 2021, by the request of my person as Minister of Justice, through the assistance of Dewey Bay or Foreign Affairs, the International Organization of Migration was contacted and, a, and the invitation was extended to execute an, an assessment for St. Martin. This was executed and a copy of this report can be provided upon request. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to um, questions from MP Gums. Number 11, to the Minister of Justice. Minister, looking at the ongoing discussions around the legal position of the police force to which I know that you are working diligently to address, under which budget post is there a reservations made in the budget regarding the payment owed to the police officers? On budget post 5201-41039, retroactive payments in an amount of 2.5 million has been reserved. Noting that in 2022, a similar reservations has been made not yet utilized due to the delay resulting from the need for financial calculations to be presented to His Excellency. Question 12, Minister, can you indicate if the payment of 2.2 million guilders to the justice workers from the, sale of the UT, from the sale of the UTS made by your predecessor and the current Minister of Rummy has been factored into your calculations regarding what must be paid out to the justice workers? Yes. All payments received by the employees of justice, of justice personnel are considered, including the payment that had been made subsequent to the sale of the UTS shares. The placement process and the calculations of possible retroactive, the placement process and the calculation of retroactive corrections of an employee's salary is to be diligently compared to the, to the already received income over the time periods. These calculations will be further audited by SOR Bay to ensure of accuracy. 13, can you also give insight as to how the payment, how this payment that was issued to the police officers was calculated at the time? Because it was a known, because it was known back then as 50% of the total amount owed to the justice workers. So is this the remaining 50% not yet paid? The method of calculation that was, uh, was used was conducted by the Ministry of Finance. Further clarification will be provided in writing as this inquiry has been forwarded to the Ministry of Finance for further elucidation. Through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from Member of Parliament Duncan. To the Minister of Justice, there are systems being proposed for a broader, sorry, border management system. That is extremely important in order to manage the flow of people and in and out of the country. How far is RADEX if it's implemented? The purchase and implementation of RADEX and RegTech applications are capital investments, which is contingent on the approval of the loan. What is the real expected progress uh, in 2023 as it relates to the planned initiative for IBPS? The ORVK Action Plan is a seven-year program. Annually, we will be making investments into objectives of strengthening border supervision. This plan approaches 
This plan approaches this matter with investments on the strategic objective of improving intelligence, enforcement, and investigation, as well as improvements to Friends Hospicium or our immigration holding facility. This plan was financed directly via the Netherlands in 2022. The ministry has also received funding for training of IBP personnel to the tune of 1.5 million guilders. This initiative also slated for 2023. The ministry in its capital budget reserve financing via capital loan for the needed investment into improving ICT systems to support the strategic objective mentioned. As explained, the implementation phase of these systems is contingent on the approved CapEx loan. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Arendelle. Can we get a tax break on payment to be received? This matter will be discussed with the Minister of Finance in light of the governing tax legislation and therein the possible special tax rates for such lump sum payments once the full financial calculation process has completed and the finan financial picture is known. Question 17. I see the meal cut and overtime for CARPSM. Carnival coming up. How will the police officers get their meals and the needed overtime? Due to the budget um, parameters set by finance or the Ministry of Finance, various cuts were made. However, um, in consultation with the Ministry of Finance, we know that we will be monitoring how various ministries are operating in terms of heavy increase in spending versus low spending. And the Ministry of Finance have given um, indication that they will receive requests for budget amendments so that all these expenses can be covered. I move on to questions from MP Rumu through you, Mr. Chairman. How many youngsters are currently at the Miss Lally Center? How many youngsters were detained at the center in 2022? By ministerial decree of November 2019, MLC was appointed as the detention facility for male inmates up to the age of 21. Minors are, are when necessary, minors and adults are separated and housed in separate wings. There are currently eight inmates detained at MLC, all over the age of 18. In 2022, the MLC had nine inmates. Six of them were minors, or juveniles, rather. What is the budgeted amount dedicated to the running of Miss Lally Center and improvements thereof, if any? Where is it reflected in the budget? The budget for the MLC is incorporated in the budget of Harvey Bay. What improvements are planned for the Ms. Lally Center and how is the Ministry of ECYS supporting these improvements as it relates to the education of these youngsters detained at the center? The discussion regarding the Ministry of ECYS supporting the MLC with education programs remains an ongoing discussion. In the meantime, the Ministry of Justice uh, currently has a tender process on the way regarding the GED program, of which it is in the interest to be able to extend same to the MLC. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Heiliger Martin. Justice on the personnel, slatten or personnel cost, cut the most by 3.6 million. Citing a reduction in overtime and vacancies, the cut vacancy cuts the most. The decision, as I indicated previously, to have these cuts is not that of the Ministry of Justice, but in alignment with our, what has been requested for a balanced budget, we will continue to maintain consultation and discussions with the Ministry of Finance, and when necessary, we will request the budget amendment to be able to suffice the costs associated with overtime and the likes. When the Rexposizi comes into play, won't there be shifts in positions? Aren't new positions created within the function book? Yes, there are uh, shifts in positions and um, there are new positions created in the function book. Once they receive their placement letters, three, four, three to five annual installments, two different things. Placement is where one is placed in connection with the new function book the three to five year installment payment has to do with the retroactive payment. When will the first installment be made and how much was budgeted for this first installment? On budget post 5201-41039, retroactive payments, an amount of 2.5 million guilders has been reserved, noting that also in the, two point, in the 2022 budget, a similar reservations had been made 
not utilized due to the delay resulting from the needed financial calculations of which we are busy with. It will be paid once the El Beham is signed by His Excellency the Governor. What is the total budget for prison guards on the payroll? The total budget for prison guards is uh, 240,130 on a monthly basis, Gilders. Annually, it is 2.8 million, including respective social security and pension premiums. How many of the guards are currently working? According to prison director, Mr. Stephen Carty, even after guards call in sick, and on average, there is three to five guards per shift. Seeing that 56, five to six sorry, guards are required per shift, how will this be covered in the budget? I will make two points here. It is important to be reminded that within government, the filling of positions is dependent on the availability of FTAs um, and budget, which is the acronym for full-time employees. Javi Bay currently has a maximum opportunity of 83 prison officers. 55 of these are currently filled but based on budget restrictions, the remaining 28 FTAs are unable to be filled at this time. Uh, secondly, the work schedule with mi minimum of six guards per shift is prepared on a monthly basis. As such, all guards are aware of the expectation by the prison for them to report to work. On a weekly basis, management is forced to adjust to try to manage the fact that the guards have been for many years using the sick leave option on a constant basis. As such, it is not that Harvey Bay has vacancies and simply refuses to hire. Again, it comes back to budget availability. The problem is also the abuse of the sick leave. Nevertheless, on Friday, March 10, 2023, a joint meeting between my person as Minister of Justice, Harvey Bay, Esset Bay, and MedWorks, we all came together to identify the steps that will be taken within the labor laws to address the abuse. At least 12 staff members have, have received written letters regarding their history of absenteeism and the steps that will be taken within short. All recipients signed for receipt of receiving these letters. Question 28. How will the strengthening of the probation function be covered in the budget? The handling of probation service is mandated to the SCI Bay Within their subsidy amount received, they are responsible for the hire and management of personnel according to their workload needs. Are there sufficient budgetary provisions to ensure proper health care for the inmates? Budget post 5202-43,000 accounts for the on-call doctor for the inmates. Under budget post 5202.43468 accounts for the... Uh, other medical costs and under budget post 5202 uh, 43 accounts for the other medications for inmates cost based on realized actuals in 2021 versus budget expenses in 2023 there is sufficient amount um, budget available for this expense how many of the projects and activities that have been completed over completed or are currently ongoing were funded by the NRP Bay or the Trust Fund? Can a list of all projects be provided to Parliament? Answer. The first project authorized by the St. Martin Trust Fund was the Emergency Recovery Project, or ERP-1, which was created to respond to the country's immediate and long-term recovery needs. There were a wide range of activities and components implemented through ERP-1 which was geared towards repairing public and private infrastructure and increasing the capacity of St. Martin's emergency services to respond to future natural disasters. The projects which were funded through ERP-1 for the, for the Ministry of Justice were repairs to the police station in Phillipsburg and the purchase of first responders' emergency equipment and priority vehicles also for the police. 31. How far are ministries with the implementation of the country packages and where and, and where and how is this reflected in the budget? The country package with the assigned theme H and B14 for the Ministry of Justice is an extremely large and extensive project underway. As such, these details of progress can be and will be, if requested, be emailed um, for review by Parliament. How are the country packages, SDGs, uh, and the individual vision and mission of your ministry combined and reflected in the budget and monitored? Are they all in line? 
Yes, they are, and I believe we're placing on the screen that in my, all oh, right. So they are all in line and they are spread within various divisions within our budget. Provide a breakdown per country package with an amount funded by the Netherlands and the amount funded by St. Martin and a breakdown justifying the amount for St. Martin. On screen, as I had provided in my presentation on Monday, you will also see where I provided these details. So I'm asking if the MPs through you, Mr. Minister, Mr. Chairman, can please refer to the presentation of Monday. Those details are there. How are the policies linked to the expenditure? Through you, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask if the MP could please give a clarification as to this question. And also for question 35, the same. Where is it reflected accurately? I'd appreciate it if the if MP um, Heiler can, can please explain or give clarification as to the question. How much was spent on court cases in 2022 to 2023? In 2022, booking for court cases tallied some 905,883 guilders. 2023, court cases registered in the shadow administration tallies to an amount of 321,846,075 guilders, 46% of our 2023 budget, of which only 53,650 or 17% was booked by finance thus far. What did they entail? Please categorize them. Also list how many were lost, one and ongoing. A breakdown of the requested categories will be sent via email as that is an extensive research that is requested. How much was actually spent on travel per ministry? In 2022, expenses on travel tallies to 407,934,000 guilders of which are mainly due to mandatory travel, such as trading obligations of CAPSM and Coast Guard. In 2023, travel expenses tallied thus far to 46,874 guilders, um, which was mandatory travel in connection with the YVO. Provide Parliament with a list of all the travels per ministry, per minister, for the year of 2022 and justification why and what did the country yield from the travel. A travel report will be sent via email. How many consultations are consultants sorry, are working in each cabinet and what, what's the total amount allotted per consultant per ministry in 2022 to date? There are two legal consultants cu currently working in the cabinet of the Minister of Justice. How many ministries are missing SGs? How long have they been vacant? The Ministry of Justice last official SG tenure ended in February 2020. Since then, we have had interim SGs and currently the vacancy uh, is being discussed for republication, though it had been published at least three times since 2020. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Bryson. With regards to immigration, increase in income of 10%. People feel that there is difficulty in applying and has become cumbersome or difficult. In order to realize a 10% increase, what are we actually doing to increase the service and speed by which the process, to process that? Would it be about more applications or the speed and processing is better? The Immigration Department by law has four months to process applications. Within the last year, the time frame for processing has significantly reduced. What applicants must also be transparent about is the time it takes for them to submit all the required documents. Not submitting timely or making necessary payments delays the processing period. Section immigration gone up. Was that cut taken out of CAPSM and moved to the immigration? Can we get an explanation as to what the budgetary effects might have been? To separate the two departments as it is in the Liol, has, been there, has there been a budgetary implication on that? Yes, the change to immigration budget has indeed been partially related to the move of personnel from CAPSM to IBP budget. The reconciliation process with the payroll related uh, to actual expenditures of both current and on 
current on hand staff and the budgeted critical vacancies is now adequately captured in the budget of IBP, resulting in this recorded increase. Further, the budget expenditure for the operational expenses of this department is now more reflect reflective of actuals in the budget allocation of 2023. Question 44. Subsidy BZK Overdrag aan het land. I would like an explanation as to what that is. Is this something we are receiving from Dutch government? Or is it something going back to because I think it is a negative number? Overdrag aan het land is indeed funds received outside the national budget. In the case of the Ministry of Justice, this relates to funds received from the Netherlands. In the budget, it is deducted from the operational budget to reflect the contribution towards our operational budget expenses in connection with the ORVK project, the prison and several others. We can note these investments are to be made towards the strengthening of the border supervision, improvements of the detention facility, and the strengthening and the strengthen the financial intelligence unit of St. Martin in tackling financial and economic crime. 45, we are paying 2.8 million for prisoners we have <coughs> within the kingdom. Has the minister had any discussions with the YVO setting the consideration or considering our precarious financial situation where we are paying the house to house our prisoners in all other areas within the kingdom? Is there not a better way to manage this, not something coming as a taxpayer's cost? On the basis of the mutual agreement detention capacity or ORD, inmates can be transferred within the kingdom. However, based on these regulations, the costs are for the sending country. That is due to the fact that detaining inmates is considered a responsibility of the country itself. Therefore, Curacao and the Netherlands are of the opinion that St. Martin will have to pay for the stay of inmates in their countries. However, I met with Minister Weerwind in the Netherlands in November 2022 to address the matter of the lack of cell capacity in St. Martin. Discussions have been held on a technical level to come to a structural solution for the period until the opening of our new prison. 46, support efforts in cracking own counterfeit products. I don't want to solve one problem and create another. Is Customs Department equipped to handle many invoices that will be coming in from people bringing in clothing, shoes, jewelry, liquor, tobacco, etc.? What is the turnaround time for this? What is the administrative side of the customs? Are they really able to handle it? In the harbor, Customs has been requiring importers to provide invoices and other cargo related paperwork for every container that is imported since June 2022. Invoices and cargo-related paperwork are dealt with immediately when received. Thus far, this is handled well. We will continue to monitor the work workload as this develops. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Peterson. Considering the tour that members of parliament receive and the further deterioration, deterior, deteriorating state of the prison, why was the budget post 43430 wiped clean? And what does this mean for the Phillipsburg cells and the prison, especially given the ongoing strikes at the prison regarding detention conditions, amongst other things? Budget post 5202 maintenance building and grounds were partially reclassed to budget post 5202 maintenance repairs in the amount of 20,000 guilders. The remaining budget was utilized to meet the obligations such as third party labor, which was under budgeted. Please note that with the subsidy, subsidy received from BZK on November 2022, the respective expenses were incorpor incorporated in this request. What is projected and projecting and active, yeah. 43,489 of 1.2 million for both 2022 and 2023. The figure is based on subsidy requested from BZK to execute the following activities, namely the security system, fire alarm, and lighting project projection system, 350,000, and restoration of Harvey Bay workshop and chapel, 900,000. What is the breakdown of the subsidy based at CAR in the budget post 43489, which is now decreased by uh, 1.2 million? Improvement detention facilities in Martin have 
10 major areas in which improvements to the current detention facility are planned. In the table below outlines the budgeted amount earmarked. These expenses are over 90% covered by the subsidy supported re support received by the Netherlands. On screen, you can see this breakdown. <coughs> what is the reason for the increase of 1.9 million in 41001? <coughs> Sorry, for immigration and friends for walking means. The personnel budget was no longer in line with the actuals in the payroll system. Therefore, an exercise was performed in order to update the 2023 budget. This reconciliation process reflects the current on-hand staff and the budgeted critical vacancies, which are now adequately captured in the budget of IBP, resulting in the recorded increase. 51, why the decrease in customs budget for 41001 of 20%? Eight budgeted vacancies that tallied some 456,356 were cut. My question through you, Mr. Chairman, is where exactly is the process of publicly tendering the contract to provide the prison with food? And what legal basis is being used to currently continue con to currently continuing to do business with the same Margarita Grocery Envy, a company that is locally known to be linked to the member of the Council of Ministers. I am aware of the responsibilities set regarding the required tender procedure. I have instructed the director of the prison to ensure this tender is completed by the end of quarter two of 2023. Noting that the matter of food supply is one that sustains the basic needs for the inmate population. A simple stop in procurement of goods cannot occur. I have taken steps to ensure that the procurement of goods are no longer limited to the historical vendor, ensuring that more vendors such as wholesalers are engaged in the interim of this tendering process. The ministry has further requested the head of planning and control to ensure that the tender documents and the execution of this tender is correctly approached and successfully completed within this time frame. As explained, there is a challenge with the availability of vendors willing to do business with government for various reasons um, uh, related to prop, tax problems and the vendors and or their acceptance of the delay in payments. Mr. Chairman, through you, I move on to questions from uh, MP De Weaver. Why is there a decrease in the Staff Bureau 41001? Uh, Vacanti Tulaha of 1.1 million. Please explain why this decrease for only staff bureau but increases elsewhere for other departments. Why this amount is larger than the changes noted in other departments in opposite direction. Taking into consideration the cost cutting measures that were imposed during the preparations of the budget. In the 2022 budget, the calculations for the vacation allowance was not initially budgeted. When the decision was taken to take the vacation pay into consideration, finance quickly included the total sum per ministry on the staff bureau's budget. In 2023, the budget in, in the 2023 budget, this was adjusted accordingly per department. KPSM, how realistic is the overtime for police officers if last two years it was 1.6 million and now cut to 500,000? Did we get more police officers? What has changed or expected to change in 2023 that makes it less than half? Where does the police base budget fit in here? As I have men mentioned several times through you, Mr. Chairman, um, the parameters of our budget has been set by the Ministry of Finance. Um, with these cuts, we are in discussions with the, and will maintain that close relationship in discussions with the Ministry of Finance for the necessary amendments and adjusted adjustments to be taken up, especially where we see that our accounts are arriving to a point where the addition or increase is necessary. Immigrazi and Friends of Work in Dienst, 41001, salary increase of 1.9 million, what is the reason for the increase? More ports, more staff. What is reason for approximately 2.2 million increase, which is a significant amount? Are there longer hours worked at ports or entry? 
Is this increase based on policy given shifts to the policy based budgeting? IBP personnel budget overview was updated based on the current salary pay payroll adjustment. Through you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> One minute, please. Uh, Minister, we will adjourn briefly for five minutes and uh, we will continue. Sorry for the sudden interruption. Meeting adjourned.
Good evening and welcome back. We will continue after that brief adjournment with the minister who was busy answering questions posed by members of parliament. Minister of Justice, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I continue with uh, questions from the Member of Parliament, um, Pantaflet. What steps is the Ministry taking to combat crime on the island and ensure the safety and security of St. Martin residents and visitors? Every single day, our law enforcement agencies are taking both public and hidden actions to prevent crime on the island and ensure of safe and of a safe environment for both locals and visitors alike. One of the steps that have been taken over the years, which I continue to support, is the collaboration within the Ministry of Justice of the different law enforcement agencies, such as Customs, Immigration, Police, and Coast Guard. This joint effort not only boosts up the number of law enforcement personnel during operation, but also helps to make these operations more successful. We also see that by intensifying cooperation between the law enforcement agencies, there is an increase of the information that they share with each other. This sharing of information contributes to the information-driven action. Information-driven action ensures that it is possible to deploy personnel and equipment optimally. Question 57, can you provide information on the ministry's plan to improve the recruitment and training of law enforcement officers to ensure that they have the necessary skills and resources to effectively combat crime. The Ministry of Justice was outfitted with a course coordinator since January 2022. Ms. Martina has been doing evaluations per agency to identify what refresher courses and certification courses are needed to ensure both frontline and administrative staff are supported to execute their task optimally. Currently in the pipeline is a language training program in both English and Dutch slated for the Admissions Department of Immigration. In addition, she is led to host, uh, slated to host a certification course for all persons who need to have the BOA or BAFPOL certification throughout government. KPSM, KPSM officers continue to receive their certification via the Police Academy based in the Netherlands. How is the ministry addressing the issue of police brutality and ensuring that law enforcement officers operate within the bounds of the law and respect the human rights of all citizens? Though this is not a frequent occurrence on St. Martin, it, it allegedly does happen from time to time. To address this matter, the Ministry of Justice established an independent complaint committee that is tasked with carrying out formal inquiries into incidents of allegations um, of professional misconduct by law enforcement officers, such as police brutality. This committee has an advisory role to the Minister of Justice and can recommend that appropriate disciplinary action is taken when complaints are proven to be well-founded. What steps is the ministry taking to provide support and resources to law enforcement officers who may be experiencing mental health or emotional issues as a result of their work. Each department provides support in various ways, and I'll share a few examples. At the Customs Department, although there haven't been many reports of these types of issues to the extent um, that the department has to provide assistance and resources to deal with them, a good relationship with the Mental Health Foundation ensures that the opportunity is there to provide the necessary assistance when and if required. The uh, same applies for the national detective whose management first approach is to engage with the employee and depending on the outcome decides on the best path forward. Within KPSM, operationally, um, there is a team formed that after serious incidents such as a fatal accident or a deceased person, they are available to have a conversation with the employee to provide support to them in the processing of these incidents. If the employee experiences long-term mental problems, a referral to, to a psychologist through the general practitioner is an option, or in the worst case scenario, to mental health foundation in case of immediate emergencies. In the event of absenteeism, a referral to MedWorks is a possibility. 
which can give advice regarding the imp employability of the employee and possibly give advice to the employee with regards to medical assistance. The Coast Guard makes use of incidents reports that allows persons to report incidents, accidents, and identify dangerous situations. These are personal as well as work-oriented situations. The reports go directly to the director and redistributed for solutions as a direct approach and, a par and parallel to, the, to be studied for structural changes. There is also a section, Corporate Social Work, which is a section in the Navy that exists to aid personnel to work through challenges on either work or a personal level. There is also a network that was re recently formed consisting of three persons from within the ranks of the Coast Guard that will serve as a team to support officers following traumatic experiences. 60. Can you provide details on plans to implement a new crime prevention program or initiatives that focus on addressing the root causes of criminal behavior? The National Ordnance Crime Fund was created to finance crime prevention projects. It is my view that this fund should play an enhanced role in the fighting against crime. This is also the reason why I continue to fight for more effective collection of fines so that we can see revenues increase that can finance crime prevention programs or initiatives focused on addressing the root causes of criminal behavior. What measures is the ministry taking to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the island's criminal justice system, including the courts and prosecution services? The separation of powers is key in maintaining the independence of each entity in the criminal justice system, such as courts, prosecutor's office, the police, and prison. This ensures they are all able to fulfill their respective roles without any interference from each other. The Minister of Justice has a significant role in this regard, particularly when it comes to financing these operations. The minister must approve year plans and that detail intended personnel and resources to be used to achieve objectives for each specific year. At the end of every year, an annual report must be provided that accounts for how annual plans was implemented. The ministry's financial controllers analyze these reports, which include closely monitoring how resources were spent, as this helps guarantee that resources are being distributed where they are most needed. In, in the criminal justice system. How is the ministry addressing the issues of corruption in law enforcement and what measures are being taken to promote transparency and, count and count accountability? Integrity is an important value of the Ministry of Justice. Any form of corruption in law enforcement is considered unacceptable. It is the task of the national detectives to investigate any possible signs of corruption by civil servants that includes law enforcement officers this solicited or unsolicited. Integrity sessions are being organized by the Ministry of Justice to promote a high level of integrity within the ministry. Can you provide information on any plans to implement new incentives or benefits to help recruit and retain talented individuals in the field? Recruiting new personnel and retaining those currently employed in the organization is the principal way to ensure that we continue to have the right people in place to add value to our operations. During my presentation, I mentioned the financial limitations that the Ministry of Justice is confronted with. These limitations mean that the incentives or benefits that can be offered to recruit and retain talented individuals in the ministry are bounded, at least as it relates to monetary compensation. As a ministry, we will seek to be creative in dealing with these restrictions, and we will explore what other incentives besides financial compensation are available. For example, education and training opportunities can be afforded to individuals. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I move on to questions from MP Bijlani. In the budget post for police overtime, it was 1.68 million guilders in 2022 and now down to 500,000 guilders in 2023. What is the reason for this? As previously indicated, um, these come in connection with the parameters that were set by the Ministry of Finance and the necessary amendments will be taken when necessary. The personnel costs were reduced to 21 million in 2023 budget. With the issues with unions and ministry and the prison lately, how can we justify the decrease? Can this be explained? 
the total personnel budget was not reduced by 21 million. In fact, the amended 2022 personnel budget tally to 37 million plus, and respectfully in 2023, 35 million plus. There is a decrease of only 2 million, which is a result of having to cut much needed budget vacancies due to various challenges. The recruitment process was deemed very challenging despite our various attempts. Regarding salaries for the prison and the house of detention, salaries were reduced by about 500,000. Please explain. Approximately 19 budgeted vacancies were cut in the 2022 budget. Initially, the initial budget for these vacancies was 1 million in 2022 and now has been cut by half, which tallies to approximately 500,000. In order to meet the budget parameters set by finance, the ministry was advised to cut all budget budgeted vacancies for which the advice for the recruitment was not in the pipeline. Regarding salaries for immigration and nationalization services, there was an increase in the budget. What is the reason? IBP personnel budget overview was updated based on the current salary payroll, as I explained. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, for um, budget line 5201, well, 41001 regarding salaries, they were reduced by 20%, 1.4 million to 1.2 million. Why? There was a decrease of 376,000, which was mainly due to the cutting of the budget vacancies per parameters set by the Ministry of Finance. Same for customs under 5204 slash 4100, which were reduced. Why? Eight budgeted vacancies totaling 456,356 400, were cut as per the parameters of the Ministry of Finance. What improvements will be done for the increase to turning point foundation subsidy? Is that enough? The Ministry of Justice has budgeted 1.8 million as they have requested for 2023, which is reflected in the increased allotted amount. Question 71, 300,000 for victim support services. What support will be provided? The victim support service is a foundation that will be providing emotional and practical support to victims of crimes and other traumatic events. This support will, among others, consist of providing information about the rights, referring to professionals such as lawyers and or counselors, and even uh, supporting providing support during court proceedings. Question 72, what do you feel is the best method to stop or slow immigration? Through you, Mr. Chairman, I'm asking MP Pijilani to please clarify this particular question. With that, through you, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you for your attention and the opportunity to provide these answers. And I'd also like to just wish um, all women happy International Women's Month as well. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Anna Richardson. I now turn to the members of Parliament for any clarifications and additional questions, if there are any. And the first speaker on the list, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. MP, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a good evening. A good evening to the minister and her entourage. A good evening to all who are following this meeting. Mr. Chairman, for the following, I would like the minister to indicate whether I have it correct, and if not, if the minister can correct it. I really want to wrap my head around where we are currently. The, so we have approved function books and salary scales. Can I put a check mark by that? We have the approved function book and salary scales, approved. So my question is yes, yes or no. Then there was this, uh, no, before I go ahead, and the approval of the FINCSI book, function book, and salary scales are by general decree by El Ham. That's a question. So the approval of them are, is that by general dec decree, El Ham. Then we had a, 
a rechtspositieregeling, so the legal position, um, going back to 2010, that was never ratified. And that has been sent to, that has been sent to the governor now, since we have the function book and the salary skills to be signed. Is that what has been sent to the governor to be signed? If it's not that, what was sent to His Excellency, the governor to be signed, that was returned? On one of the slides, it is stated that when the El Bayham is signed, then payments can be made. Did I understand that correctly? We are now, or supposed to be, at the part where placement can take place. Placement, as the minister indicated in the previous meeting, placement will take place on the basis of the social charter which was used for the civil service in terms of offering a position and then there will be a deliberation with the individual regarding the acceptance. Is that correct? Are we now at that stage where individual proposals for placement will be offered? If that is the case, then what are the employees expecting that they have given the ministry until the 31st of this month to respond to? So what, what are they expecting? I assume that payment can only take place on the basis of the individual lungs to slighten, correct or not? Is the ministry going to give another advance on retroactive payment, or will we have to await every individual lance besluit to determine what that person will be entitled to financially? When the court decided sometime last year that 15 lance besluiten national decrees needed to be signed, and they were eventually signed by, minister, by governor and minister on the basis of what were those individual Landsbesleuten signed. So on the basis of what? What did those persons, what, what were the Landsbesleuten of those persons saying based on what? The, so having stated that and then looking at the answer to my question, question number four, I read the following. In 2020, the advance payment released to the officers was to the tune of 2.2 million. And the minister indicated that in order to find out what and how, so what was that based on, we need to check with the Ministry of <coughs> Finance. But does the minister know off the top of her head what kind of payment took place? So did everybody get 500 guilders, 700, 1,000 guilders? How, how did that payment take place in the first place? Did it look at categories? Did it look at ranges? So if you were making between this and that, then you get this. How, what, what was paid out? In fact, I don't know if the minister is aware of the so-called financial uitvoerings rapportage 2022, quarter four of the implementation, the, yeah, the execution report, which you receive every quarter. And in that execution report, under retroactives, achterstanden, it says that there is a retroactive a achterstand of four million guilders to be paid to police officers. Does the minister have any indication on the basis of what this has been put in quarter four report of 2022? The, the police salaries in 
2022 were budgeted for 14.5 million guilders, and in 2023, for 12.1 million guilders. And my question is, if the minister can provide parliament with what the 2022 budget for salaries for the police officers were based on. Did that include vacancies? So the 14.5 million, did it include vacancies? Yes or no? Because then the question would continue in 2023, when it's budgeted for 12.1 million guilders, does that include vacancies? Or is it just the regular salaries? The, in 2021, the overtime, uh, 2021, mind you, at which time the tariffs for overtime should have been cut based on the law for the reduction in salaries. And then, provisionally, the year total for 2021 is 1.6 million guilders. 2022 budget for overtime is 1.6 million guilders. And 2023, it's 500,000 guilders, a half a million guilders for overtime. And so my question is, in 2022, yes, 2022, when the overtime for police officers were budgeted at 1.6 million, was that on the basis of the cut tariffs? Was that on the basis of the cut tariffs according to the law that has only been canceled in January of this year. And since the 1st of January of this year, are police officers back at their regular overtime tariffs? And if not, why not? So that's the overtime. That's the Rechtspositie and what exactly happened in January, to be exact, of the year 2020. The, the retroactive amount in 2023 for 2.5 million guilders, the total amount of retroactive across the ministry, so the total amount is 2.6 plus million guilders. That would mean, from what we have before us, that only for the police, only for the police, it's already 2.5 million retroactive. So does that mean that the new function book, et cetera, that basically no other department, no other service actually would be entitled to retroactive, yes or no? It's a, it's a question, not a, not a statement. The, the other questions, Mr. Chairman, has been answered. And I want to say to the Minister of, to the Minister of Justice, like I said to the Minister of Education, who in slightly different words basically said the same thing, where the cuts to some essential services and operations were also part of the budget. In fact, are part of nearly all budgets. The Minister of Education used the term to explain every cut, whether on priority areas or not, to say the budget had to be balanced. Your statement in that context, Minister, is that it's um, the parameters were set by the finance ministry. This thing about approving a budget where we know, where we know that the, the most of the areas that have been cut just can't, just can't fly, just can't fly the way they are. 
and hoping, hoping that during the course of the year, um, things are going to change and then we're going to come with an amended budget. budget. But as far as we have been able to see, these cuts have not been done on any kind of priority basis or anything of the sort. And so minister, when you say you have done it according to the parameters set by the minister of finance, how did you, how did you, how did you do that? Did the minister of finance say for the ministry of justice, your complete, your total would be I'm going to tell you now, your total will be minister, whatever it is at the end of the day, the complete ministry, and then you had to then cut what you had before you to meet that total amount, or did the Ministry of Finance go through your budget and say, well, you know, um, let's cut a Coast Guard here, let's cut this, let's cut the other, et cetera. So if you can explain how exactly you, you managed the parameters set by the by the finance by the finance minister, so uh, minister, I look forward and especially getting a clarification on where we are right now with the retroactive payment and what persons are expecting and what is to happen by because minister in in I think it was late last year, and this is probably taken from. This is probably taken from the local media, but it was in the Antil the, the, the Dutch media. Um, when I say Dutch, I mean Dutch Antillian. And you said, Minister, and you are quoted as saying, because there was no official function book and salary scale, it was impossible to execute the resolution, Rechtspositie Korps Politie St. Martin, van 10 October 2010 uit That's a, a quote from you, Minister, in this, in this article. And then you said that the concept regeling Rechtspositie was in the pipeline, was in the pipeline, and that the, the approval of the function book would have happened in, um, had happened, in December 2021, oh no, that was with the 15 persons who received their, their besluiten. And then you said that you could not continue signing decrees because there was no functie book and salaries halen. So all of that to say, um, again, what was given, what was sent to His Excellency the Governor to be signed, that was returned for a calculation. What, 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 what was it? What was the package sent to him? The, 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 the Rechtspositie regeling, proposals for Landsbesluiten, what exactly did the Governor say? Go and calculate it and come back to me. Was the Governor looking for a budget? Was the Governor wondering whether there was financial space? For these, for, the, for these payments. So if the minister can explain that, please, uh, Mr. Chairman, and some of the other matters regarding the cuts in overtime and the overtime tariff, then I would be most appreciative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, <clears throat> MP Westcott Williams. The next speaker, MP Grisha Heiliger Martin. MP, you have the floor. Pleasant good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening to the minister and her support staff and her delegation. Thank you for your answers, ministers. I'll be very brief. Uh, regarding the clarification you wanted on the um, policies and expenditures, you can disregard that. It was actually clarified earlier in, um, because I asked it across the board. Seemingly the English um, policy, the the the... the line items there are off, and um, but in the, in the Dutch version it's clear, so for now just um, disregard that. And actually the pertaining to some of the reports and documents that you are, are requesting, if I would like to have them sent to me, yes indeed I would like to for the record have all the documents uh, as soon as you possibly can sent to the Parliament. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, MP Heiliger Martin. The next MP to have the floor, MP Melissa Gums. MP, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, good night uh, to everyone, the Justice Minister and her support staff. Minister, thank you for the, um, for the answers to 
the questions. I just had one clarification regarding the calculation of the 2.5 million that has been reserved. Does that amount take into consideration um, justice workers that are on pension, justice workers that may have left over the last 13 years? In my original question, I had kind of said um, plus or minus people who have come and gone, um, have they been taken into account? And as well, any, uh, you know, in the past you've had personnel court cases against government related to salaries, et cetera. Does it take into account any that may have won been won or have been won already? Just to make sure that um, the amount is accurate and that we're not kind of selling ourselves short because there's been so much back and forth concern concerning this retroactive payment. So if the minister could just clarify um, that for me, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Melissa Gums. And the next MP to take the floor, MP Lutmila De Weaver. You have the floor. MP, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, good evening to you, Minister, and your team, support staff, those in the Tribune, my colleagues, everyone else still tuned in today after a couple long days. Um, but just as a recap, Mr. Chairman, I want to go over a couple things that um, stayed with me since yesterday. So yesterday, um, the, the takeaway for me from the Ministry of Finance or the Minister of Finance was that this budget is a more accurate budget. It's a balanced budget. And the reason it's more accurate is because it's, it's um, built up on the five-year actuals, right? So I get that. So I actually went in to paying attention to the other speakers or the other ministers when they came back with their answers, thinking, OK, this budget is more accurate based on the last five years actuals. So that explains a lot of the stuff. But then when you go further in listening to people, you're expecting that, you know, with the five-year actuals, you're expecting that capital expenditures hadn't been properly substantiated, which we've been hearing a lot in the years before, which is why it wasn't granted. But now we're having capital expenditures being granted. But then I move on to the next minister after that, which is the minister of VSA. When I asked why aren't there capital expenditures, the minister of VSA says that there's no guarantee that we're going to get it, get capital expenditures, get it approved. So we didn't include any. And then the other thing that the minister said was, there was a project that I questioned as an example. Normally, when you have an investment into a new system, like a registration system, it'll be capitalized, right? Because it's something that you can have, um, you know, for it's, it's like furniture and fixtures. You know, this is part of your everyday. It's depreciated. That was put into projects and activities in the expense account, and it's a big red flag in the accounting world or audit world that if you don't properly capitalize something and you end up expensing it, you can't basically get an unqualified opinion because they can't differentiate anymore what should actually be capitalized with depreciation or what should be expensed. So all in one shot in one year. And then I move on to another minister, ECYS, today, where I ask about the subsidies for the schools, and the explanation for it was we had to make cuts according to um, finance. So they didn't explain it to me based on the subsidy, like how the subsidy is granted. We had to make cuts. And now today I asked a question about the 1.6 million because I wanted to make, basically find a trend in the explanation. The, I, my answer today to my question of the 1.6 million cut in overtime from 2021, 2022 to a half a million in 2023, again, I have now a consistent reply that we were told by per the parameters of the Ministry of Finance. So here I am today with four different explanations that now causes me to be very confused and I want to now see from all of the ministers when we come back here to discuss the budget, consistency in explanations. So if is it that we have to have a nice backup plan and, and uh, a plan and the whole costing for capital expenditures, or is it that we had to make cuts in accordance with the parameters of finance? That's what I want to hear. Or is it that this budget is lean, mean, you know, we didn't have a balanced budget in forever, because we're basing it on five years actual. So that's the only message 
that I want to get across today to the Council of Ministers is to please find consistency in your explanations across the board because I'm not finding it now and I, and I actually leave more confused which makes me come back further on later with more questions to understand the reasons for certain things. So it's not about, oh, something was illegal in the past. It's not about that. I just want consistency in answers. Don't pass the buck on to someone else. Just just defend the budget and, get, and give the true situation because when I see an explanation like we were told to cut, what it tells me is that overtime is still expected to be 1.6 million and we're depending on a budget amendment to come in later on in the year. So we know what's gonna happen, but we're not budgeting for it. That's my problem. That's it, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, MP Lutmila de Weaver. And we move on immediately to MP Rolando Bryson. MP, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening once again. A um, few questions to the Minister of Justice. The yeah. ORD that was referred to the, the agreement with regards to the handling of prisoners within the kingdom, uh, is that a document that can be shared with the parliament, please? I would like to review that. Um, I understand in the explanation from the minister where, generally speaking, um, the housing of prisoners is a national uh, issue. That's something that the countries have to deal with. However, when we're sending, if, if I understand correctly, whenever we are housing prisoners outside of the Netherlands, uh, outside of St. Martin, it is because of a capacity issue. And if I understand correctly, the reason why we may have capacity issue is because if we were, I believe in a previous presentation, there's a certain number of a maximum of prisoners we can have at Point Blanche that we're supposed to keep under because that would be a human rights violation. Am I correct on that? Okay. So if we exceed the number of prisoners at Point Blanche, we would be making a human rights violation. There is jurisprudence that the kingdom is held responsible for any situation where we are not able to uphold human rights, uh, the, the, the standards of human rights specifically with our prisoners. And everybody knows of the Corallo ruling and how that happened in the human rights court. So. My question to the Minister of Justice is perhaps to wonder if this is another approach. If it is that St. Martin is having such difficulty with our capacity until a new prison is built, and if it is that the minister housing more prisoners would be a direct violation of human rights, is that now not a kingdom discussion to be held between the minister and the kingdom representatives to say, look, we have a responsibility to house at, at, you know, at this level of standard, we unfortunately cannot. We can show for the record how many times in this parliament budgets have been proposed to build a prison from capital expenditures and it was rejected by the CFT. We have tried, but we have reached our limit. But then when we house our prisoners within the kingdom, we are being charged for it. I understand in a regular situation if, for example, you need to move a prisoner to another uh, prison within the kingdom because it's a safety concern. You know, there, there's this, you know, sort of gang relations and so on, and you need to separate them in another country. I would understand that. But if we're trying our best to stick to certain human rights standards, and the kingdom loves to step in when we are not able to handle human rights, like what they're doing in Curacao with Venezuela and so on, well, why not step in here and say, you know what? We will handle the excess prisoners at our cost because it's our responsibility. Just a question. Maybe legally it's, I'm, I'm interpreting this wrong. Maybe I, I'm definitely not an expert of the statute. But I would like to understand that aspect of the human rights and especially looking at what happened in the past in terms of what was the result of a human rights violation and who the European Commission charged, not St. Martin, but the kingdom with the violation. Um, <clears throat> I noted the question regarding the situation from customs with invoicing and um, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I think the minister may need to take a closer look at this because everything is not fine. Um, in a regular situation where someone, uh, an importer, brings in some stuff and he sends his invoice 
And in most situations, that's it, it probably goes okay. Where the problem comes in is when customs feels they need to take time to investigate something. For example, there was an individual from the French side that had has a shoe store on the French side, not even on the Dutch side, and wanted to get these shoes. Customs informed him that they suspect that the shoes might be counterfeit, so they need some time to review. This individual is, of course, certain and sending all the documents to prove that they are legitimate, but is not getting any response as to what the time frame is. We need 48 hours, we need a week, we need anything. And what's happening to them right now is that everyone is saying, you know what, I'm just gonna order my stuff on Amazon instead. So I'm just trying to caution that I totally support the need for trying to you know, deal with counterfeit, deal with, with, with parallel and all these different things, but I don't want, that's why I said in the question, I don't want to solve one problem and create another that if we're not administratively equipped to quickly handle these sort of questions or bring in the individual and quickly solve those things, that we might find ourselves in another problem. Um, and also considering the friend side, um, should the same rules apply for, for products clearly destined to the friend side um, for products that are compared to products that will be destined to the Dutch side? Or is it, I can imagine you might say, that can become a loophole because then I can pretend like you're going to the French side but then bring it right back over. So perhaps that's why not. But is there some consideration for that? My ultimate fear is that the French side is looking at this. And I'm hearing a lot about them um, wanting to expand their port and all of this stuff. And if we continue to maybe become too uh, stringent with our customs and move too far away from the duty-free nature of our country. My only caution is that I don't want, uh, I want us to find a balance, basically, Mr. Chairman. That's, I just want to ensure that we're balancing the need to protect the economy together with the protect of the protecting the integrity of products in St. Martin. And the third thing I want to bring up, Mr. Chairman, because a lot is brought up about what this government has to do in terms of um, paying the police officers and where the money is coming. I would like to ask the minister a question. Would $5 million right now help a lot with paying what's outstanding to the police officers? I would like to ask if that would help. The reason I ask that, Mr. Chairman, is because earlier you heard everybody knows about the UTS sale. And then you'll have those that will say, yeah, the money wasn't destined for the police. Okay. I know that one minister did say it was originally destined to, put to the police, which was the Minister of Finance, who was acting Minister of Justice at the time, Perry Hailings, but he decided that instead we had to pay Telet. Okay? That was after the law had passed. However, Instead of the money, let's say, being completely destined to it or being put aside to a point where the minister is at, let's say, the finish line, and that money would have been there to be able to complete the payment, we don't have that money right now. So I would like to give the minister maybe a bit of another tip. As part of that sale, there were three entities that are still existing that have been put into a foundation that I would like the minister to please look into their current status because there's hope to still get actually some more funds out of the sale of UTS. These are the entities Data Planet NV, Antillian Television Company, and Curaflix. Data Planet NV, Mr. Chairman, is especially interesting because I was made to understand that they had since rebranded to uh, Blue Nap Americas and have actually grown since then. So the value of that entity that was taken out of the sale and put into a foundation has grown in value. And that entity is still subject to a sale, and St. Martin is still subject to a remuneration from it. So the Minister of Justice at the time was a shareholder representative, which is why I'm asking it here. Technically, there is no more shareholder representative because the shares are gone. But I would ask the minister and encourage the minister to get in contact with Flo, look within together with the Minister of Finance, and look to see what is still due from the share of UTS based on those remaining companies that have now gone up in value because you might be able to find some more funding to help pay the police officers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 
Thank you, MP Rolando Bryson and uh, Minister, you have some additional questions and you have some clarifications that were asked based on the procedure. You will now be excused and the Minister of ECYS, who is ready to come in, will come in immediately. And in the meantime, you can go in a little retreat, you and your staff, and prepare the answers for as much as possible and the clarifications. Is it the intention to return tonight? We will see how it plays out. If the Minister of Education doesn't take too much time, you can come back tonight and wrap it up. Yes? Go ahead. One, if you would permit me, Mr. Chairman, um, relatively speaking, when it comes to the clarifications, it's, it's one thing, but very important to me is to not leave here this evening with certain statements that has been made in connection with the retroactive payment and the likes of. And so um, I would like to be able to address that before leaving here. So I don't know if I would be permitted by the members of parliament to answer that now, because I really don't know how much time Minister ECYS is gonna take, considering it is 9 p.m. I don't know if the members of parliament will decide that they don't, but I really would not like to walk away with certain impressions that were left based on questions that were posed. Your watch is ahead of time, it's already nine. My watch has 8.51. That's not nine. <laughs> so if I, if I could just, you know, cover that aspect and the rest I don't mind. You can do it in three minutes? I can do that. Okay. I can proceed? Yes. So um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Specifically, let me speak about one. The function book is an approved function book that was signed by His Excellency in my person in December 2021. The Rex Fuzitsi is not something that goes in any year before 2019, because there was a year that was mentioned by MP Westcott, and, and that is not, it, it, it's from 2019. It's a draft that I came in and met that had even gone through the Council of Advice there were recommendations by the Council of Advice that had not been touched. We picked it up, we corrected and did everything according to what the Council of Advice indicated was necessary in connection with that draft Rex uh, and the Buzol King attached, okay? In doing so, we went through um, the necessary reviews and approval of same with the CCSU. In conjunction with the invitation of the NRP Bay Union, who I will reiterate is not a member of the CCSU. However, through my person's request to the CCSU and considering their valuable uh, um, uh, interest in this particular subject being a police union, I invited them to come in and have an opportunity. Um, forgive me that I can't speak on the exact name. Is it Y2? This is the one that uh, Stuart Johnson is the president. Yes, Stuart Johnson respectfully indicated, considering that he does not have a vast understanding of everything that is required for the police, he gives the NRP Bay the opportunity to have a say on that platform. Okay. We agreed on the submission of that draft Rexposizzi and the Bazaar King. MP Westcott asks, what exactly was sent to the governor? An Elbe Ham is what establishes the Rexposizzi. An Elbe establishes the uh, salary scales. And an Elbe enacts the approved function book. And that package is what was sent to his excellency. 
Why were we so confident that we could send that to His Excellency? Because there was a reservation of 2.2 million on the budget. And so our goal was to be able to pay out those monies and issue the necessary LBs. However, as I stated in my answers, the governor came back and says, nice that you have the function book ready, nice that you have the Rexpositsi ready, nice that you have the Bezoldeking. However, in accordance to the kingdom law, it is article which one? 20, I believe it is, or 14. I made it mention earlier. It is required by His Excellency that before he signs the El Beham, the entire calculation or debt that the country would have must be identified. And this is honestly something that we did not believe was going to be the case when we submitted. So what did we have to do? We had to get what we're doing done now, the calculations finalized. What does that mean? As I stated, today, and Chief John is sitting next to me here, as a department head that received the offer letters that are going to the employees, and we have given, Chief John, you can confirm, these letters to be able to give to the staff that says to them, this is your offered position, this is what your salary would be, and other information in that. Uh, MP Westcott also asked, um, what is the expectation of the staff? Well, of course, the staff expects to get paid. But how does this have to be done legally? And this is where, you see, when you make an advancement the way it was done in 2020, that in itself develops an exp uh, expectation that that is the way it has to be done, that you just credit an account. But I'm sure we all are aware that legally speaking, an LB must go with it. And that is the point where we are right now. An advancement being given is one thing, but as minister, my understanding in the guidance is going forward, it is a matter that the Elbe has to be done. Hence the reason I will reiterate, when I stood in front of the building, the, the, the government building, and I made my statement, I said I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do it the legal way, and I'm going to do it the correct way. Yes, I recognize that it is a long trajectory, but at the end of the day, what will be guaranteed to the Ministry of Justice employees is that they are secured thereafter. Yes? Good. So it is a case that with the offer letter, each employee has to write back to the minister and say, I accept. If I object and I want to appeal it, then you have to go through the appeals committee. One of the things we will not do is hold back anybody based on others saying, I am going to appeal my position. Anyone who comes forward and says, I accept my position, their LBA will be prepared so we can send that to the excellency once all of this is signed and I would like to do it immediately so that that individual employee will receive their payment. That is the goal. Another thing is, when we speak about retroactive payment, when we speak about retroactive payment, is it the belief that the entire Ministry of Justice is entitled to into retro retroactive? Because that's not the case. It is the police officers and some immigration officers and some members of Lancashire who are entitled to ret um, uh, retroactive payment. So lastly, what I would say, because I, I get the sentiment here that I'm supposed to stop, but I feel like, you know, the officers, everybody is keenly listening to everything here and I do not want to walk away with misconceptions. Um, it is a case where when we say who is going to receive these payment, it is those who have been uh, part of CAPSM, Lancashire, and the mobile or Hrens, those uh, immigration officers that are part of Hrensbawaking, okay? That are entitled that because once upon a time they were under CAPSM. Yes? So another question was what about those, and I think it's MP Gums that asked, what about those that have retired, that are no, no longer, once it is identified that they were a part of the organization within the relevant years, they get compensated and they are a part of the calculations. 
right? But at the end of the day, lastly, what I want to say, and I thank you, MP Bryson, for your mention about the ways that we can look for money, but please let us not give the impression like the funds are not there to compensate when the opportunity of the, the signed El Bay has been done. That is not the impression we should be giving the officers because I feel like that is what they would walk away. Oh, they don't have the money, and that's why they, that's not the reason. The reason is, at the end of the day, everybody in this room has been asking about legal basis to do that. Me, Anna Elaine Richardson, I'm going to do it the correct way. I've been saying that, and I get it. I get the frustration of it taking long, but I want to know that when I walk away from this seat, the last thing anybody will be able to say is that I did not do it the correct way. That's Minister, thank you, thank you too. very much. It was a long three minutes. Sorry. But it was worth it. I thank you for... I thank you for the answers and for the information provided, but you will be invited back for the completion of the total package of answers and clarifications. Meeting adjourned, and the next in will be the Minister of ECYS. <laughs> Meeting will be adjourned until 9.05.
It wasn't on. Good evening and welcome back. At this time, we reopen the Central Committee meeting of the budget and we are at the stage where our Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports is back in the room with us to answer to some clarifications and some additional questions he received earlier this afternoon. Minister, you have the floor. MLK, what is the cost of these repair? Where is the funding coming from? And which budget line? The cost of the reconstruction of the roof of the Dr. MLK is 1,990,490 guilders. The funding is coming from the insurance payout that the government of St. Martin received after Hurricane Irma. The repairs related to the roof, but there is also structural damage at MLK, <coughs> walls, tiles, windows. Was a study done? Yes. By whom was the study of the technical drawings done? This will be sent to Parliament tomorrow. Can we get a copy of the study? Minister mentioned technical drawings and damage assessment. Was this done based on the structural, on the structure of the school? Mr. Chairman, also this answer I would like to provide to Parliament tomorrow. Is minister, is minister, we don't have the persons with answers are not reachable. Is minister comfortable for students to return to school after the roof is done with the structural repairs to be done and the recent earthquakes? Yes. Minister is concerned about the funding of Prince William Alexander School. Did you ever thought why the school is in the condition that it is today? Did you ever met the contractor? Did you have a discussion with him? Yes, I have met many times with the contractor. One of the things that is possible to explain to the members of parliament is the following, that when I came to the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, the project was stopped for about three years. After discussions with the contractor and all the parties involved, I was able to get the project to continue up until where it is today, where the remaining generator rooms and was, was put on, and the roof is paved up to 70% of the roof. I was there, I kept my eye on the project. And then there was a period of time that the contractor did not work because there was an exchange back and forth about a lot of things that have happened over the years. Prices increase, material increase, the availability of different things. And as you would then notice, the capital expenditure budget of ECYS has an amount of, I believe, 1,350,000 guilders in order to finish this school. So when I said, in the meeting that concessions were made, cooperation was done in order for us to have a balanced budget. The importance of finishing this school, even phase one, is crucial to St. Martin. And we can only get the money to do the capital investments if we do have a balanced budget. So. I understand that we do have to give and take at times, but we do need to have a balanced budget, and it is important for us to do so in order to get the capital investment that is so needed. Um, detail the level of the St. Martin Vocational School and what level is it? The St. Martin Vocational Training School, SMVTS, is a secondary school that offers a general vocational program. The school also offers labor-oriented education, LOE, or Arbeidsgericht Onderwijs, AGO, 
The LOE slash ACHEO is a special education program geared towards meeting the needs of students who require an orthopedagogic and an orthodidactic educational approach. Where the orthopedagogic pedagogy means educating the right way and orthodidactic means understanding a child's general academic and cognitive level of competence. The program allows students to develop themselves and work within their communities. The main objective of this program are for students to achieve social independence and survival skills, personal development, and the ability to transfer into the job market. How long will it take for the study to be completed to determine the level? A final decision will be taken when a meeting of all stakeholders have taken place and when everyone is on the same page. What level are the teachers of the different high schools? Um, what, yeah, so what level are the teachers of the different high schools? Are they all primary school teachers? What level are the teachers at the Sundial School and Orania School? Mr. Chairman, allow me to be able to give this answer tomorrow also to Parliament. What is the status of the St. Martin Vocation Training School? Is it a high school? Um, as previously indicated, the St. Martin Vocational Training School is a secondary school. How many teachers have you recruited? How many special needs? How many in St. Martin Vocational Training School? If none, why not? This answer too, Mr. Chairman, will be forwarded to Parliament. Do the teachers of St. Martin Vocational Training School get any type of compensation for the teaching of special needs? Oh, and hold a minute, Minister. Yeah. MP. Chairman, I am, I am getting a bit confused with the Minister answering some and then want to forward some. And some how, how is he going to do it tomorrow? In writing, in person, how is it going to be done? And why are they to be coming tomorrow and not now? Because the Minister went to have all the time to answer the questions. Now he's back, and we're not getting the full answers. He couldn't get all the information to all the questions while they were gone, and therefore he promised those answers will be forthcoming tomorrow. In writing. Yeah, but I didn't ask for my questions in writing, Mr. Chairman. I didn't ask for them in writing. Well, I don't know what arrangements were there made is no, with the There were no arrangements. Before. Okay, then the minister will come back tomorrow. Thank you very much. I, I, that's why I would like to know how will these answers come because they seem to be straightforward answers to me. What kind of teachers are they? Mr. Chairman? You may proceed, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do, do the teachers of St. Martin Vocational Training School get any type of compensation for the teaching of special needs? Is there any compensation for them? There is no additional compensation other than the regular remuneration, which is according to the function book. Robots has been implemented in the Prince William Alexander School. What type of robots have been implemented? The Prince William Alexander School has received one dash and one dot robot, complete with curriculum. What I will do, Mr. Chairman, and I have tried to do that, was to bring a sample of each to the parliament so that the members of parliament can see what is one dash and one dot. What does STEM mean in terms of learning? There is no STEM room as it is a temporary space for management. The abbreviation STEM, S-T-E-M, stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Furthermore, there is also an uh, abbreviation STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, the Arts, and Mathematics, which is equally as important. What does the robot do? The robot, along with the curriculum, is designed to reinforce skills such as creativity, communication, problem solving, collaboration, and logical thinking. Did the teachers receive their full vacation pay for 2020? If they did, when did 
they receive it. The vacation allowance was paid to teachers in the public schools. At the same time, it was paid to civil servants. 50% paid in 2020, and the other 50% was paid in 2021. The ministry is unable to indicate whether teachers in all subsidized schools receive their full vacation allowance for 2020 as this falls under the responsibility of the school board. The amount of funding awarded to school boards for vacation allowance was paid by the government based on the number of students and an estimated number of teachers required per school level and school type. And this amount is included in the lump sum payment made to the relevant school boards. The ministry is unaware of the actual amount paid out to teachers in subsidized schools. Vaping. Is the minister aware of vaping? If he knows what is vaping, yes. <laughs> is, is there a public notice in terms of school children? No, there is none. Awareness similar to alcohol and cig cigarettes, what does the ministry intend to do? Vaping is sold in all grocery stores, but there is no public awareness. What is the penalty for selling vaping to students in a uniform? Minister, Mr. Chairman, I would like to inform the parliament and also the, of the following. After consideration and discussion with some of my colleagues, we have decided to do a multi-ministerial approach with this issue because it's not only an issue that deals with youth, but also with health and possibly also with economics. Do you think it is, it is necessary that children should be aware of the damaging effect of, of vaping? Yes. Are there any plans within the ministry to deal with this as a serious situation? Yes, but the approach will be via a multi-ministerial approach. The questions from the Honorable Member um, Gums. Public school ICT infrastructure. The schools will undergo upgrade to accommodate the technology. How will this upgrade happen? Is there capacity to do the upgrade within the ministry? Um, will they do it themselves or will it have to tender to external company and when will this be done? It depends, Mr. Chairman, on what we have to do in-house, otherwise we will tender it out. For instance, there are schools that have fiber. Upgrading is just a matter of communication with Telem, which we are constantly in communication with them. If there, are need, if there is need to run lines, we will do so, but in, in some of the schools, all of this is not necessary. Um, minister mentioned repeatedly that the devices are on the island. I don't think that I mentioned that repeatedly, and I said I am very careful to say where the devices are if I have not seen them. So, sports, 500,000, how is that supposed to cover the development of athletes that should have been the question that I presented. The policy should be accurate. It is confusing. The discrepancy in the amount of 325,000 should have been addressed beforehand. Mr. Chairman, the answer, the policy priorities are correct, but the amount listed are not as the amount have been reduced. Government has to set a sports plan regional governments set a plan and facilitates this with the sports organizations. Mr. Chairman, to, through you to the Honorable Member of Parliament, the action plan which was previously provided to Parliament outlines the objectives for sports. The key areas for development outlines were ethics, value and moral development, sports association, sports facilities, media, 
health through sports, women in sports, elderly and less able sports, sports and recreation, sport curriculum, sport teachers, sport tourism, employment and enterprise opportunities in sports, scholarship, households slash companies, expenditures, incentives for top athletes, top class sports of the key areas mentioned. We do yearly conferences to be able to support the organizational structures of the associations. We also recently conducted a preliminary information session regarding the safeguarding of our athletes. We regularly support organizations by highlighting through the media what they are doing. We currently subsidize a program for the elderly through the NSI. We are currently increasing accessibility to sports and recreation by developing public spaces. This you would see when um, they are completed. We will highlight this to you. We currently issue scholarships to athletes who request it. So a plan does exist for sports and this is what we have been working from over the last few years. Through this plan, we have been able to execute the above mentioned and more and it allows us to better facilitate the organizations in the development of their sports. With regards to the countries mentioned by the MP, Curacao through the Netherlands and Tilly structure had, her, had a head start as all the infrastructure for the development of athletes was based in Curacao. Countries like Jamaica as an independent countries receive funds from the International Olympic Committee to their National Olympic Committee. So it is the Olympic Committee and the relevant federations that develop athletes within that country. The limited budget for sports does not allow for the department to do much more than create a comprehensive plan for the island and facilitate sports organizations in their development of their sport. The following question, the Olympic Federation and NSI. The answer from the minister is everything the money allocated to NSI covers, but it does not answer the question. Is there any data available at the Department of Sports for yearly costs associated with providing support to individual associations? What does it cost to actually support them since it is the belief that they have to carry out the sporting events? Can that clarification be given? In 2022, with the issuance of 228,000, the cost that was requested to be covered through these subsidies were the execution of sport events where concern are as follows. Accommodations, transportations, travel, equipment, field rental, match officials, food, uniform, trophies and awards, purses and participation fees. Mr. Chairman, I come to the question of the Member of Parliament, Sarah Westcott-Williams. The image being portrayed as a realistic budget is wrong image. We have contractual agreements on a yearly basis and these amounts have been slashed to balance the budget. Is the minister aware of the following verdict by the court of first instance regarding the financing of education? And that is in Curacao. The court decided regarding a school board in Curacao. The MP reads the press release as issued by the court. Yes, the Honorable MP Westcott Williams, the ministry is aware of the verdict of the court of first instance of Curacao. The funding of education to primary, secondary, and advanced secondary education is based on a legal framework that outlines objective norms for funding. The funding of the University of St. Martin 
is based on the higher education funding policy, which is also based on objective norms. All boards funding funded for education are aware of the established norms, and it is not the intention of government to deviate from the norms without a legal basis to do such to the detriment of the quality of education. The cuts in NEPA and USM, the reduction in these schools was asked. Minister indicated that there is no cut in the budget slash subsidy. USM figures 221, 1.8 million, 2022, 2 million plus, and 2023, 1.7 million. So how can it be explained that the budget was not cut? What was the contractual agreement with USM? There is currently a memorandum of understanding in place with the University of St. Martin, which was established in 2019, pending ratification of the Higher Educational Ordinance. Until the establishment of the Higher Education Ordinance, the following points of the MOU remain valid. Restructure the board and management of USM, including any adjustments needed in the articles of incorporation of the USMF. Based on the findings coming out of the SOA Bay audit and the structural changes that may be needed to further al align USMF to the criteria set in the higher education policy. The USMF, USMF also agrees to give its full support to a more in-depth audit of its management and structure if the findings of the SOA Bay audit indicate a need for such. To submit to the Minister of Education, Culture, and Sports a subsidy request including the USMF's program and budget for for subsequent academic years by March 1st of the preceding year for which subsidy is being sought in accordance with Article 16 of the General Subsidy Ordinance until such time, until such a time is, in, until such a time as the regulations for the funding for higher education are established and indicated otherwise. So the government of St. Martin also has a memorandum of understanding in place with the University of St. Martin for the delivery of professional development program. And the university is currently being funded using a pilot funding model for higher education. As stated previously, all boards funded for education are aware of the establishment established norms and it is not the intention of the government to deviate from the norms without a legal basis to do such to the detriment of the quality of education. Question, what was the budget that USM submitted to government per item? In USMF, USMF's subsidy request letter of 2023, mention is made of an amount of 2.2 million is needed for 2023. The actual budget for 2023 was not included, only a profit and loss overview. Same for NEPA figures. 2021, 3.9 million. 2022, 3.7 million. And 2023, 3.3 million. What has the NEPA submitted for its budget? How much was that? NEPA has submitted a draft budget in which they have indicated that their budgeted expenses for 2022-2023 academic year to be 4.9 million. Question, when these cuts to balance the budget are taking place, did you look at the budgets? Have you looked at USM, NEPA, and other budgets that were reduced and figure out what the reduction would mean for the operation of these institutions. Students, teachers, operational costs, has that been looked at? 
The decision documents for 2023 have not yet been finalized. Therefore, the amounts indicated in the budget 2023 for both NEPA and USM do not reflect the actual amount to be awarded. The funding of education to primary, secondary, and advanced, second, advanced secondary education is based on a legal framework that outlines objective norms for funding. The funding of the University of St. Martin is based on the higher education funding policy, which is also based on objective norms. And all school boards funding for, funded for education are aware of the established norms, and it is not the intention of the government to deviate from the norms without a legal basis to do such to the detriment of the quality of education. In the event there is a need to amend the budget for the funding of education, this will be done later in 2023. Monument Fund. Monument Fund has been reduced, but the project will continue. Not sure if it is plural or not. Which are, the, which are these and how will they continue on the basis of the reduced budget? When I answered this question, the answer was pertaining to the project of establishing the fund will continue. Privatization of the debt of public education. On the table since 2017, minister indicated that it is primarily about financial independence. Are there any steps towards this research review consultancy to be undertaken in 2023? Is there an end, in, is there an end goal in sight? The public body, public authority, public entity, or public education, is there going to be a sort of in-between? Are we looking at financial independence so the public schools do not have to go through the bureaucracy of the ministry and the department to get things done. What is anticipated to be done? Any steps with all that is concerned? As mentioned before, Mr. Chairman, um, it is my vision from what I have seen so far um, even though the request is on the table from since 2017, that a more independent financial situation for the DPE is key. And what I will do is I will send subsequently the rest of the answer to Parliament. Question five, reference language. Whether the national language policy is it under the Ministry of ECYS? If yes or no, can the minister provide his thoughts on the motions to which I referred to that the minister said he is acquainted? What are your thoughts with to elevate English language which is currently on the same level as the Dutch language to elevate it to an English, to establish English as the first and mother tongue language for St. Martin. Gradual introduction of the use of the mother tongue as the first official language and a plan for civil service. Mr. Chairman, at this moment, I will indicate that I do have my opinion on this, but for now, I will like to have further um, discussions in order to be able to give an answer. I do have my, an my, my opinion on this, but I will have further discussions before giving an answer. Community schools, MP quotes, from minister's response in 2022 budget. The budget cut had a major impact on the program's initiatives. The current budget, 1.7 million, is not sufficient for a full expansion. 
Minister, can you give an overview of the status overall island-wide of the after-school programs, not only public schools, how much, where, and by whom? Are we offering the community school concept slash broad school concept? An island-wide indication is needed. Mr. Chairman, this answer too will be forwarded to Parliament tomorrow. Study financing has been reduced. The trend seems to indicate a reduction in requests for study financing. Can Minister provide some more insight into this trend? Are there less students coming out of secondary education? The number of students in the academic stream is not projected to increase. Does the statement slash conclusion not warranted for further review of study financing in general? With the introduction of more pre-university secondary education and advanced technical vocation schools such as CAPE, IP program, and approximately 60 to 80% of school graduates remain on the island longer. This has resulted in a decrease in study financing applications. Medical school. Is the department working on a policy reference medical school? Is it taken up? Will it be covered by the law on tertiary education? The draft law on higher education seeks to regulate higher education programs delivered on St. Martin, including medical schools. In anticipation of the ratification of the law, the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports has contracted a consultant to support the process of establishing a framework for accreditation of higher education programs. Following question, eight students being currently enrolled in the AUC, um, that the agreement with AUC to provide scholarship, which was made several years ago, is still ongoing. And can that be confirmed, and when has this been the case? Yes, AOC slash Government of St. Martin Scholarship Program is still in effect. Period poverty. VSR and ECYS working on this jointly together with Teen Times. If this is the case, MP wants to say thank you and wants to be apprised of whether and whatever concrete steps are taken in this regard. A proposal to this effect have been sent some time ago in order to undergo, understand what we have before us. Is it an issue and how can we address it? In a previous meeting in Parliament, I did indicate that a discussions with the school boards have given an oversight that the school boards generally did not have an issue. But we have decided to take a deeper look into the situation and the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, in collaboration with the Ministry of Public Health, Social Development, and Labor, is conducting research on period poverty in the schools in St. Martin. The Department of Education have distributed a digital questionnaire to public and subsidized school boards requesting that school staff, including school managers, academic teachers, physical education teachers, social workers, guidance counselors, and student care coordinators slash care providers complete the questionnaire. The goal of the questionnaire is to gain further insight into the extent to which period poverty is an issue in St. Martin schools. Data collection has begun and will continue throughout March um, with a service submission deadline of March 24th, 2023. School staff are strongly encouraged to complete the digital questionnaire prior to the deadline. Faping. You would have made a research into this. 
this was mentioned some time ago. You mentioned you contacted Turning Point. What did this contact yield? Where are we currently with the matter? You did receive, um, did you receive and look at the proposal sent, reference the difference of opinions we have to address the matter of vaping. This includes changes to the legislation or LBHAM. I have indicated which ones can be amended. Is minister ready to give feedback on the proposal that MP Westcott Williams submitted? Is the minister ready to provide feedback on these submitted? As I indicated before, the approach has changed that we will approach it from a multi-ministerial approach and we'll get back to Parliament on the matter. M questions from Member of Parliament Peterson. Regarding the pool at, Illich, at Raul Illich Sports Complex, did you read the front page of the Daily Herald today? The answer was no. The response given today does not match the article. It caters to 500 plus kids. There is an article that a concerned parent took it to the media. The chlorine in the water, minister said it was normal. Minister did not say it was normal. But it was eight times the recommended milligrams per liter according to the Daily Herald. The levels was 41 and had to be five. I did not say it was normal. I could not say so. So that's, that's the way it is. Um, since when exactly was the facility manager aware of the situation? The facility manager was made aware of the situation on March 8th. How regularly is the pool cleaned? What is the exact time frequency of the cleaning? The pool is maintained three or four times a week. Can we see a full lab test result? This can definitely be provided. Did it say it was common to have such a high level of chlorine? The lab results did not say that it was common to have high levels of chlorine. How exactly did the chlorine level in the pool reach so high and whose fault this is? Chlorine levels increased based on the regular treatment of the pool to combat the possibility of bacterial development. Was it a lack of supervision on the facility side? Was it lack of enforcement on government side? Was it faulty machinery that is not working and is additionally budget needed? Fault is not placed anywhere as we have not been faced with this issue before. As the situation was brought to our attention, we immediately reacted to, the, to investigate and rectify the situation. And moving forward, we will have implemented the necessary measures to ensure that this does not happen again. The questions of Member of Parliament will move. For the training of teachers to incorporate technology in education, is the only training plan for 2023 is remaining for digital boards? Is it then that there are no pedagogical training plan for 2023 as it relates to skills needed in the integration of technology in education? The training will not be only for how to use digital boards. The teachers will also receive training in the best practices for integrating technology into the classroom and the introduction to hybrid learning where students spend at least half of their time learning online and the rest of their time learning in physical classroom. Can the minister clarify if any 360 evaluation or any sort of evaluation systems are done in public education. The 360 evaluation is still being used 
in DPE, but there is need for a more teacher-focused tool, which is currently being researched. In 2014, there was to be evaluation on the FBE, but not yet taken place can not yet taken place to date. Can the minister explain why? The process towards the evaluation of FBE was started in 2022. A terms of reference was drafted and advertised. However, there were not sufficient proposals presented to finalize the bidding process as yet. Can the minister clarify that in 2022, the ministry was researching a curriculum for the school type for the vocational training school? Yes. Was this concern since 2020? Has the ministry narrowed down the school type to assign to the vocational training school? The school type, yes. I can say that we have narrowed down, but as I indicated, not before everybody is on the same line, will this be made mention. The following questions are the questions for MP Duncan. Minister mentioned the creation of a school board for the public schools and that discussions are ongoing. I do not recall mentioning a school board. Um, this is disturbing to the MP. She thought they were further in the process. They are neglected. Is there absolutely no personal proposal on the table as for the creation of a school board? MP thought the ministry was further along. No advice written. Was stage, uh, what stage are we in actually? DPE. So minister did address this question earlier on and um, the answer is the same. We are busy discussing the issue and when we reach to a point, this will be made mention. FBE evaluation, the most standardized test is the FBE exam, which needs to be reviewed, evaluated and reformed. Seems not to have any priority. What is happening with the exam? I mentioned uh, just a while ago that a process was started and that it will continue. During EPCO, discussions on study financing and repairing, repaying duo, MP is receiving more and more complaints about the way the Department of Study Financing it handles payments of local study loans. Yes, the law is there but needs to be updated, but MP would like to see a policy procedure or, ex or what exactly is the policy? How does the debt let, let the student know about repayment and how this will take place? MP would like some more information on that. I know, Mr. Chairman, the answer has been coming in, but I mean, the collection of study loans is handled by the receiver's office and the finance department. The ministry of ECYS only establishes the study debt. The increase in complaints may be related to increased collection efforts by the Ministry of Finance to collect outstanding payments from students. Since 2019, all study financing recipients can track and monitor their payments via study financing portal. A debt calculator feature was also introduced to enable recipients to calculate their total study debt anytime. Information is also available on the study financing website explaining repayment of study loans and how to request a reduction in the monthly payment. A total study debt is also, also always broken down into monthly payments with a maximum term of 30 years. 
depending on the total debt. Mr. Chairman, I now come to the questions of the Member of Parliament, De Weaver. Subsidies for the schools is based on the number of students. It is a two-way street. We need to work on the communication. We are working on clean up a budget, but no communication to recipient. There is ongoing communication with school boards regarding matters related to their subsidy. School boards were informed of the tentative amount of their subsidy for the 2022-2023 academic year in 2022. Therefore, all school boards are aware as to the expected height of their subsidy up until July 2023. School boards recently submitted their subsidy requests for 2023-2024 academic year by February 1st, 2023. These requests have been reviewed and tentative subsidy amounts will be discussed with the boards during the course of the upcoming months. And then Mr. Chairman, the questions of Member of Parliament, MP Bryson. We obviously have a balanced budget. That was one of the goals. The other goal was to get more out of capital expenditure. We did not have investments since 2017. How have you built up and adjusted and put the plans in place for these capital investments as CFT has been telling us over the years? Second, it states, for the capital investment expense to be included in the draft budget 2023, the projects had to be extensively substantiated with approved budget and architectural drawings. The substantiation also included the effects of the investment on future budgets. Whatever the investment is, an ongoing project, the priority of the project and the execution of the project is substantiated. If the capital expenditure are executable despite the operational challenges, would education be better served with this budget or worse? Mr. Chairman, it is indeed important for us to understand if we look at the capital expenditure of education, I think it is around 7 million guilders. This, is, this money, as I will explain later on in this budget debate, is more than needed to get certain things done which have not been done for years. Then the last comments. Um, want to know from Minister if the projects are executable for the MP. Um, the CAPEX is key. That will make the difference. MP does share the concern of the budget not being realistic. Good to hear from Minister that Minister tends to achieve them and when. I can remember when we were busy with the amended budget of 2022. And we were promised that, you know, we would get um, capital expenditure if we were able to balance. We were not in time for this. I think we are in time now. And with the balanced budget, I do believe that we can get the capex that we so badly needed. I thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Minister Samuel. Before we go over to several speakers who have already signed in, we will take a <coughs> brief adjournment of three minutes, meeting adjourned for three minutes.
Good evening and welcome back. In the meanwhile, it's 10.04 and we are going immediately over to questions and clarifications or clarification. No. Go on, continue. No. I'm not doing, no. yes. No. Go on, continue. No. I'm not doing, no. yes. No. So is that is that understood? That just that the Minister of Justice sends the rest of are her questions in writing. Are there any objections to that proposal? <coughs> No objections. Khrifir will inform the minister accordingly, and we will go over to the following members of parliament, MP Rayon Peterson, then followed by MP Christoph Emmanuel. MP Rayon Peterson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just that one of my questions was uh, missed in the minister's answers. Um, I asked if we could receive the lab results that he was speaking of. And that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. And should it be provided in writing or? To come back. Okay. We thank you, MP Rian Peterson, MP Christoph Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good night to everyone. Mr. Chairman, just for clarity's sake, the minister said he will return tomorrow to answer some of the questions that he did not answer based on what I asked. So that is, okay. So Mr. Chairman, those, those, those questions, is going to be in a setting similar to this that yes. we are going to have tomorrow. But then if that is the case, then I can leave the majority of the questions I have now for him tomorrow, ask them now, and then he can also As answer them. So he can incorporate good, them tomorrow. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. For for just for clarity, Mr. Chairman, I would like the minister to clarify because he made mention when I asked the question concerning the status of the St. Martin Vocational Training School. When I ask at what level is it, because Mr. Chairman, I would want to believe that in this country, when you look at the educational, the educational levels in terms of school, we have primary school, high school, and then we have tertiary education. I stand to be corrected if that is the pattern that it goes in. The minister make mention, Mr. Chairman, that the vocational school is a secondary school. If it is a secondary school, Mr. Chairman, that means the teachers are to be paid on a secondary level. Mr. Chairman, I would like the minister to please clarify. Is he saying definitively that the St. Martin Vocational Training School is a secondary school? That's for clarification because he did say that. Now, second to that, Mr. Chairman, and these that he can answer tomorrow. When it comes to the summer program of the DPE 2022, have the, have the teachers, has the teachers received their full payment? If yes, when? Um, that's not how the format works. If no, when will this be done? Also, can the minister indicate when or if the salary increments will be paid to all public school employees? How much is the increments? And is there any budget for it if the minister is saying that the increments will be paid? Can the minister, Mr. Chairman, indicate in the budget now where it is that yes, increments will be paid, Mr. Chairman. Also, I would like to know, can the minister indicate how much is the increment? He's smiling because he knows why the question is being asked. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to repeat this question again concerning the St. Martin Vocational Training School. The minister said it's a secondary school. Mr. Chairman, through you, 
I would want to believe, and all of us would want to believe, when he says a secondary school, he means it's a high school. I would like the minister to clarify if that is what he meant. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, MP Christoph Emmanuel. And the next speaker on the speaker's list for this evening, MP Solange Duncan, Jr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to the minister, the minister did explain uh, that students can uh, look at and follow the, the debt that they have occurred, um, accrued um, via the study financing portal. However, my question was, is there a policy at Mekis and or, or finance that further outlines Article 21 of the Law on Study Financing. Because again, there are issues in the way in which, according to complaints that I have heard, the way in which the, the debt needs to be repaid and is handled. And so I would like to know, is there, is there not a policy that further out, outlines how Article 21 should be executed, whether at Mekis or um, Finance? There is a portal the students can see their debts. If it is also possible, then can we receive a sample contract? Um, how do the students agree to the conditions set in their study financing? Can we possibly see a sample contract that uh, government and the students um, have um, in order to determine how their study financing not only will be uh, obtained, but then be paid back as well? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Solange Duncan. And uh, we move over to our next speaker, MP Orlando Bryson. MP, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just have one question for the minister, and I would like actually to get this answer in writing. I would like the minister to please Give me a synopsis in writing as to what the situation is regarding the changes of articles to the NEPA that have been taking place over the last few years. I would like to know what those changes were, if you can give us a summary, whether the government was informed at any point of those changes, and what corrective action, if any, does the government plan to take regarding the changes to the articles? Are you, are the, is the Ministry of Education think they're good? Do they want to keep them, et cetera? That is all. Thank you, MP Bryson. And on that note, we have exhausted the speaker's list and uh, we will adjourn the meeting until tomorrow when we will continue only with this minister. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock meeting will continue tomorrow at 11 o'clock and the only minister scheduled is the minister of ECYS. Meeting adjourned until tomorrow. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>